150 years ago, the world came to an end. A huge explosion befell upon the world and every city was destroyed and reduced to ruins. After the catastrophe, all living creatures underwent an unknown mutation and they became monsters known as demonic beasts, who now rule the new world. The humans who once ruled the world are mere ants in front of these beasts. A gigantic two-horned beast loomed over the tall buildings, sending the humans standing under those buildings into a panic, causing them to begin running. As the people ran, they bumped into a little young girl with short orange hair, her bag full of canned foods. Consequently, she fell and her canned food scattered around. Without a moment's hesitation, a middle-aged man grabbed her shirt, picked her up, and carried her while running. Even though the girl tried to put up a fight, the man scolded her, telling her that her life was more important than canned food. Although she protested that she hadn't eaten anything for two days, the man told her to bear with it as supplies will arrive soon. Together, they were rushing towards their base, which can provide them safety. In order to resist the demonic beasts and live on, the survivors built base towns one by one. These strongholds contain weapons that were left behind before the catastrophe and can defend against the demonic beasts to a certain extent. A female was climbing up the stairs in a rush, the vice captain of the base, and was climbing up their tower to check on the situation. With binoculars in her hand, she looked out at the base and questioned the choices of the people to go out as they were attracting demonic beasts to the base. She asked where the captain was but before the guard could answer her question, he saw the captain out there running with a little girl, which made her furious and immediately questioned why he was there. The guard told her that there was no other way as their supplies were running out. The demonic beast had been around for a few months, so if they didn't go and search for food, they would all starve to death. To ensure the survival of the base town, it was crucial to have a steady circulation of supplies between base towns despite the difficulty in acquiring them. However, the vice captain's frustration grew when she asked the guards if the cannon was ready, and was informed that while the cannon was locked to the target, ammunition was lacking. The guards suggested firing the cannon, but the vice captain firmly declined, fearing that it could provoke the demonic beast and put the base town in danger. Desperate for supplies, the vice captain asked when they could expect the arrival of the much needed supplies. Thankfully, the guard checked the guild's schedule and assured her that the supplies would arrive that day. Meanwhile, a powerful escort carrying a bag much larger than himself was leaping across the rooftops, delivering essential supplies to various base towns. Possessing extraordinary strength, this was a risky and dangerous task that only escorts dared to undertake. The captain and a young girl were on the run when they suddenly encountered a huge exploding light, and a stranger standing in front of them. The stranger turned out to be the escort with the delivery, who greeted them despite the rubble falling around them. The captain was relieved to receive the supplies and excited to finally fight the demonic beast that was pursuing them. However, the escorts rummaging through his bag caused the captain's panic to rise, especially when he produced a power-enhanced lighter that was windproof. Despite the captain's warning, the escort continued to search and found a multifunctional pocket knife, which he touted as very sharp. As the beast was now a few steps away from them, the captain and the little girl attempted to carry the escort's bag to run away, but they couldn't move it at all. Consequently, the captain, enraged, grabbed the escort's collar and called him insane as he asked them to sign the proof of delivery. Meanwhile, the little girl looked up with her mouth open due to shock. Suddenly, the beast reached out its hands to attack them, catching the escort's attention, as well as the captain whose eyes were bulging out and snot dripping out. Believing they were dead, the captain thought it was the end but the escort called out to it and switched to a punching stance. Remarkably, light emitted from the escort's hand, and parts of the beast's body disintegrated in the light that shrouded it. While releasing his punch, the escort told it not to disturb their delivery. The vice captain was surprised and raised her hand to signal the guard to stop firing. However, the guard, also shocked, replied that they did not fire the cannon. Similarly, the little girl and the captain were surprised and speechless. As if he just remembered something, the escort exclaimed, which startled the little girl and the captain who fell to the ground. Subsequently, the escort knelt and held out a cylinder to the captain, who was now sitting, asking him if the item was his delivery. The captain, still in shock, confirmed that the item was the universal energy ammunition the cannon of their base town needed. The escort smiled and pointed at a piece of paper he was carrying, asking the captain to sign it as proof of delivery and reminding him to give a good review if they were satisfied with the service. Once the escort gathered the papers, he said that his job was done and thanked the captain for using their service, but the captain could not utter a single word. Consequently, as the escort was walking away, the little girl asked who he was. Blue Rengia looked back and introduced himself as an escort, expressing his eagerness to serve them again. As the sun was rising from the mountains, multiple corpses lying across the forest were uncovered by the sunlight. 
Among those corpses was a young lady wearing a violet dress. Suddenly, a demonic beast approached her and picked her off the ground with its hand, while picking up another man with its feet. Lu Rengia appeared behind the beast and expressed his surprise at encountering a demonic beast. However, the demonic beast sneered at him, and he recognized the symbol on its neck. The lady the beast was holding coughed as she regained consciousness, which startled Lu Rengia. When she asked him if he was an escort, he introduced himself as a black iron level escort and told her to hang in there as he was going to save her. However, upon hearing that he was a black iron level, she told him to run instead of trying to rescue her. The beast was about to put her in its mouth, but she was still worrying about him, telling him not to worry about her and just run. Suddenly, Lu Rengia was at the beast's arms and swiftly cut its arms. As the beast was screaming in pain behind Lu Rengia, he walked away from it, carrying the girl in his arms. As he kneeled and placed the lady on the ground, telling her not to worry, the enraged beast behind was now pouncing towards them. In response, a lightning-like aura enveloped his body, and his eyes sparked lightning along with it. When the beast's fingers managed to reach him, a huge flash of light followed by an explosion occurred. Rubble was falling everywhere, and Lu Rengia was now standing, saying that he was the strongest black iron level escort. After telling the lady that he would take her to get treatment right away, she stopped him, saying that she has a little sister who was running deep into the forest, holding a box close to her chest, as she was being chased by demonic beasts. The lady asked Lu Rengia to save her as she was the last hope of their village. As the sister was running in the forest, breathing heavily with exhaustion, she thought that she was now safe. However, to her disappointment, she heard a loud noise coming from behind and realized that the beast had already caught up with her. She cursed and panicked as she was running while looking back at the beast, thinking about what she should do. It was then that she did not notice Lu Rengia had appeared in front of her, surprising her. On the other hand, Lu Rengia was calmly apologizing for disturbing her and asked if she was Liu Xiangxiang. Liu Xiangxiang tried to stop on her tracks, but she lost her balance instead and fell towards Lu Rengia, resulting in them tumbling down the road. Now, Lu Rengia was lying on the ground with Liu Xiangxiang sitting on top of him, his face squished in between her legs. Upon realization, Liu Xiangxiang was extremely embarrassed and grabbed the box she was carrying earlier and smashed it into Lu Rengia's face. They were now standing, and she asked him who he was with a very red face. With the box still sticking to his face, he introduced himself as Lu Rengia, an escort from the Tianfu base, which immediately relieved her when she heard that he was an escort. As she was about to tell him about the demonic beast following behind her, a whole uprooted tree came flying towards their direction. Smoke and a flash of light emerged, and the tree was torn to pieces. Lu Rengia was now carrying Liu Xiangxiang in his left hand and the box in his left hand while he hoped away from where the tree was thrown. They could now see and were facing the demonic beast looming over them, and Liu Rengia now understood what Liu Xiangxiang was trying to say earlier. Liu Xiangxiang was now filled with horror as she asked what they would do but Lu Rengia simply laughed and told her not to worry. Due to fear, she hugged him so tight that his face was squished in between her bosoms. He was trying to comfort her, but he was not able to finish his sentence when a flash of light coming from behind them caught his attention. Out of nowhere, blood spurted out of the beast's head, and it screamed in pain. Liu Xiangxing was now looking back like Lu Rengia was, and they saw a man riding a motorcycle with a sidecar. He was holding a gun with a light flashing at the tip of it and was pointing it towards the beast. As the beast was screaming in pain, it charged towards Lu Rengia and Liu Xiangxiang. Liu Xiangxiang was scared, while Lu Rengia was still calm and wondered why the beast was angry at them. The man holding the gun yelled at them to stay back as he approached the beast at high speed in his motorcycle combination. He jumped out of his motorcycle combination and towards the beast as he fired multiple shots midair. He also reloaded his gun midair and shot it one more time. The beast's head exploded as the man turned his back, hopped away from it and landed on the ground perfectly. The man was lazily sitting at his motorcycle combination while he asked if Lu Rengia and Liu Xiangxiang were injured anywhere. While sparkling, he said that she was a lovely young lady as delicate as a flower, and that if she were to get a speck of dust on herself, he wouldn't be able to sleep at night. She blushed when she heard his flowery words and confirmed that she was not hurt. With her eyes twinkling, she asked him if he was also an escort and complimented his cool moves. She was buttering him up with compliments and he was bragging about them that Lu Rengia was annoyed and told them he could also kill the beast. This piqued the man's interest, and he introduced himself as Nape, a white silver level escort. He was about to ask Lu Rengia but was not able to finish his sentence as Lu Rengia immediately answered that he's also an escort and introduced himself while proudly showing his badge. Nape scoffed and asked if what he was holding was a black iron level badge. Liu Xiangxing got curious and asked what the black iron level meant. With a mocking smile, Nape told her that there are six levels of escorts, black iron, bronze, white silver, gold, platinum, and diamond, and those levels also correspond to the beast they can defeat. 
He closed his eyes and was about to give a lecture about how Lurengia would not be able to defeat the beast, and they would have been in trouble if he hadn't arrived. But he was not able to finish his sentence. Lurengia just walked away telling Nape to take the corpse of the beast and claim his reward while carrying the box and dragging Liu Xiangxang with him. She told Lurengia to wait a moment and asked how he knew her name. He stopped in his tracks and gave her a wooden ornament. She immediately recognized it as her sister's and asked him why it was with him, and he told her that her sister entrusted him to protect her while she delivered a batch of emergency medicinal supplies back to the village. She was about to ask him about the condition of her sister, but she was not able to finish her sentence as Liu Renjia cut her off and apologized. Liu Xiangxing knelt on the ground sobbing, while Nape comforted her and offered his condolences. Liu Renjia looked at them, wondering if they were misunderstanding something. He apologized for being late and explained that he had taken Liu Xiangxing's sister to the nearby escort camp for treatment. However, he decided not to clarify the misunderstanding as he was not sure if her sister was actually alive. Liu Renjia said that he had been entrusted with protecting Liu Xiangxang while she delivered and that he had already received his remuneration, holding out an item in his hands. The item caught Nape's attention, and he seemed to recognize it. When all living creatures became demonic beasts due to an unknown mutation after the catastrophe, humanity developed a method to obtain extraordinary power to fight against the powerful beasts. That was what Liu Renjia was holding, the genetic evolution fluid, and he was surprised that Nape knew about the fluid too. Liu Xiangxing was still crying as she told them that it was her sister's dowry. Nape suddenly had this suspicious look while he stared at her. He picked her up from the ground and wrapped his coat around her. He then began cheering her up and told her that she should do her best to fulfill her sister's last wish, which was to deliver the supplies back to the town. Liu Renjia commended his speech and told Liu Xiangxang that they should depart, but Nape stopped them. He then proceeded to warn Liu Xiangxang that she must be careful because the demonic beasts around the forest were not weak. Liu Renjia cut Nape off and told him that he was being enigmatic and to get to the point of what he was trying to say. With a sinister look, Nape said that he was just worried about Liu Xiangxang's safety who had just lost her sister and was in such a dangerous place. He then smiled towards Liu Xiangxiang and offered his services to escort her, and she agreed but questioned if she could trust him. Nape guaranteed his services and asked for the genetic evolution fluid as his remuneration. While wiping her tears away, she told them that it was the only one in their town. Nape then convinced her to make Lu Rengia withdraw from the task and take the genetic evolution fluid back so she could give it to him. He argued that she would be much safer with him as an escort. Lu Rengia smirked as he realized that Nape was after the genetic evolution fluid, which did not surprise him, as it not only allowed ordinary people to awaken extraordinary powers, but it was also key to advancement for the awakened. He then taunted Nape and asked what would happen if he said no, but Nape denied that he was doing the escort mission just for the genetic evolution fluid. Liu Xiangxing was startled as Nape pointed his gun at Lu Rengia, and with a disgusting look on his face, he told him that he didn't know how he tricked her sister but as her escort, he wouldn't allow her belongings to fall into the hands of an outsider. Lu Rengia suddenly vanished from where he was standing and appeared behind Nape, who was now terrified as he told him that he doesn't like it when someone points a gun at him. Nape was puzzled by Lu Rengia's sudden appearance behind him. As he turned around, he saw Lu Rengia handing the genetic evolution fluid to Liu Xiangxiang. Liu Renjia explained that the fluid originally belonged to Liu Xiangxiang's sister, so she should decide who she wants as her escort. Liu Xiangxiang thought about it and decided that it was more worth it to hire a higher level and more handsome escort, even though the remuneration was the same. Seeing Liu Renjia dejected, she tried to comfort him, telling him that she was still deeply grateful for coming and rescuing her. Nape praised her for being sensible while Liu Renjia did not put up a fight and told them to move along. As the two rode away on Nape's motorcycle combination, Lu Rengia was relieved that he was finally able to send them away. Lu Rengia then headed towards the beast's corpse to examine it, and something caught his attention that alarmed him. He let out a sigh and said that it seemed he had to follow them as he saw that the beast had the same symbol as the first beast he encountered earlier. The narrator then explains that 150 years ago, refuge bunkers were prepared for elites from various countries. After the catastrophe, they established the five beacons of light known as dragon, fish, snake, ox and bear with their own bunkers as the core to retain civilization. An old man wearing a military uniform told Lu Rengia that he had to go to the fish-based jurisdiction, and he must not reveal his identity. Lu Rengia was asked if he figured out a way to hide it. He told the old man not to worry as he had it covered while wearing a flower costume, which pissed the old man. The old man threw a badge at Lu Rengia's face and told him to carry the escort's insignia with him. The old man explained that people with that kind of insignia like to attack escorts, so they should wait for them to fall for the bait. 
Meanwhile, Liu Xiangxiang was traveling with Nape on his motorcycle combination, mourning her sister. Nape comforted her by bragging about his ride being called Rolls Royce, and she cheered up saying it was cool and asked if Liu Rengia would have won too. Nape was offended by the question as Black Iron is the lowest level of escorts, so they could not afford a vehicle, but Liu Xiangxiang added that Liu Rengia flew behind him in an instant, which was awesome. Nape was speechless and became sweaty as he recalled the incident. Suddenly, he looked at the genetic evolution fluid in his hand with an evil grin. Before he could finish his thoughts, Lu Rengia appeared at the side of the road warning him that he would crash the bike if he didn't look at the road, which startled him. His vehicle swerved on the road and came to an abrupt stop, and he nervously asked Lu Rengia why he was there. Lu Rengia nonchalantly replied that his bike was so noisy, so he was able to find them, but he protested that it was not a matter of finding. While they were talking, something caught Lu Rengia's attention, and he said that they had another guest. A huge monkey was hanging from the building in front of them, with gleaming red eyes, and it uttered the word food. After the catastrophe, the new world was dominated by demonic beasts, and the escort union divided them into six classes. These classes were normal, great, super, ultra, legendary, and god. According to legend, the strongest demonic beast, a god-class creature, hibernated deep in the demon mountain all year round possessing the power to destroy everything in its path. Humans facing demonic beasts were like ants in their eyes. At this moment, the huge monkey in front of them leaped from the building it was hanging from. It landed on the ground in front of them and again uttered the word food which startled Liu Xiangxiang. Liu Renjia sniffed something from her and asked if they smelled anything strange. But Liu Xiangxiang retorted that it was not the time to talk about that. Nape reassured them that they could relax as the demonic beast they were facing was just an Amei monkey that relied on begging and robbing for food before the catastrophe. He pulled out his gun and readjusted his glasses, stating that it was just a super-class demonic beast that lives in groups, so it was nothing for a white silver escort like him. Nape then commanded the monkey to go away, acting cool, while Lu Rengia teased him, and Liu Xiangxiang cheered him on. The monkey threw a tantrum and was about to attack them, but with one hand, Nape confidently pointed his gun at it, calling it an ignorant fool. As the monkey leaped towards him, he shot its shoulder while it was midair and maneuvered his motorcycle to dodge the coming attack. The monkey was in pain, but it looked like there was not that much damage to it, which worried Liu Xiangxiang. Still, Nape was still confident and told her to be patient. Suddenly, the bullets lodged in the monkey's body exploded and Nape was proud of what he had done, stating that a black iron level could not achieve what he just did, while Liu Xiangxiang praised him for it. Liu Rengia looked up, ignored Nape's deprecation, and asked him if he remembered what he said about this demonic beast living in groups. He was acting nonchalantly while he waved his hand to point out the group of monkeys at the top of the buildings, looking down on them. Moments later, a group of monkeys were chasing Sinan's speeding motorcycle, jumping from the top of buildings to another. Lu Rengia criticized Sinan's bike for being slow and noisy, questioning its capability. Sinan lost his temper and told him to shut up, saying that it would be faster if he would get off. As Sinan shot the beast chasing them while driving, his agitation grew. When Sinan killed another monkey, a monkey at the top of a building roared, and more monkeys appeared seeking revenge. Lu Rengia explained that the more gregarious beasts one kills, the more they appear, creating a beast wave. This information made Liu Xiangxiang and Sinan equally worried. Sinan shot the beasts aggressively, telling Lu Rengia that they would be waiting for their deaths if he didn't shoot. He threatened to throw Lu Rengia off the bike to see what he could do. In response, Lu Rengia stood up, carried Liu Xiangxiang, and with a smile on his face said that he had some idea. Sinan was taken by surprise, and while he asked what Lu Rengia was doing, Lu Rengia immediately jumped off the bike and punched the ground creating a smoke screen for them. Sinan was now alone on his bike, surrounded by smoke created by dust and rubble, which dropped his visibility. As monkeys started emerging from the smoke, Sinan turned pale with panic and quickly ran away from the monkeys while cursing Lu Rengia who tricked him. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia and Liu Xiangxiang were hiding at the foot of a building, observing the chasing monkeys from the sidelines. Lu Rengia was laughing and told Liu Xiangxiang, who was worried for Sinan, that they would hide there for now while Sinan lured the demonic beasts away. At this moment, Sinan continued to curse Lu Rengia while doing his best to run away, but the monkeys were closing in on his bike. Sinan found himself surrounded by monkeys seeking revenge, and one of them even smashed the ground as he got closer to getting caught. But he managed to dodge by maneuvering his bike to traverse at the wall of the building. To make things worse, Sinan shot one of the monkeys and ran away, threatening to kill them all if a beast wave occurs. He was not worried about the monkeys catching up to him, but he was worried about the expense of his bullets. Sinan was thinking of making Lu Rengia pay once he escaped from the monkeys when he noticed a silhouette of a beast standing atop the building in front of him. 
The beast raised a gigantic stone pillar which made Sinan anxiously speechless, and he was caught off guard when the beast threw the pillar towards him. Meanwhile, Lu Renjie was peacefully resting while drinking his hot water, and Liu Xiangxian criticized him for it. He offered her a drink of his hot water, but she refused and called him heartless instead. Suddenly, a huge rumbling sound caught their attention, and Liu Xiangxian became worried about Mr. Sinan. With a smiling face, Lu Renjia offered to take her first to the village and then come back as a special service to bury Sinan's corpse. She reluctantly refused, but then immediately switched to a firm tone of refusing when she remembered that the important supplies were with Mr. Sinan, and she could not return to the village without them. Lu Renjia was confused as he could see her box next to her, but she told him that the box only contained daily supplies, and the most important medical supply was the flavonoids used for pregnant women during childbirth. She had handed those to Mr. Sinan for safekeeping. She panicked as the babies in their village that were about to be born would be in danger without the flavonoids, but Lu Renjia smiled and told her not to worry because he was just messing with her. He said that monkeys can't do anything to a white-level escort unless a stronger demonic beast appears. As for Sinan, he was now kneeling on the ground, his bike overturned, and the silhouette of the demonic beast was now standing in front of him. Sinan was in trouble as the silhouette of the demonic beast started approaching him, and soon he found himself surrounded by monkey beasts. In front of him stood a two-horned beast with two monkey beasts by its side. He wondered if this beast was the leader of the group of monkeys when the beast started talking. He was pleased that it found a white silver level escort and laughed with a sinister look on its face. Sinan felt a chill run down his spine as he sensed an oppression that led him to believe that he was facing a high-class demonic beast. He knew that he must find a chance to escape. However, before he could finish his sentence and do anything, the beast pushed him to the side with the back of its hand, and he collided with the wall. Meanwhile, Peach Blossom Village was a village dominated by women. They lacked protection, so each generation, the most beautiful girl in the village would be chosen to marry a strong awakened man to receive protection. Liu Xiangxing was explaining to Liu Renjia that the newborns of each generation were the future of their village, so that's why the flavonoids were important. Liu Renjia had a doubtful look on his face, and he asked where the strong who protect the village were and why Liu Xiangxing and her sister were tasked to deliver the supplies when someone else would have been a better choice. Liu Xiangxing blushed and said that she had Mr. Sinan to protect her. Liu Renjia realized what the enumeration, the dowry meant and they left the village in search of a blind date. He criticized her for choosing Sinan, but she defended her choice, saying that he was a white silver level escort, handsome, and skillful. Their conversation died when Liu Renjia suddenly turned silent, sensing that something was wrong. Liu Xiangxing questioned him about what was wrong and what he was doing, but he said that there was no time to explain, and she should just follow him. They arrived at the scene where Sinan's bike was overturned. As Liu Xiangxing and Liu Renjia approached the scene, they saw a huge monkey beast lying lifeless on the ground with a splatter of blood beside it. While Liu Renjia was relaxed and recognized that Sinan had killed quite a lot of monkeys, this scene alarmed Liu Xiangxiang. She wondered where Sinan was, and when Liu Renjia replied that it was not a good omen, her face was filled with horror. Liu Xiangxiang thought about the flavonoids and the babies of their village, and her distress was apparent as she knelt to the ground and didn't know what to do. The village had saved up for a long time to buy those medical supplies, and Mr. Sinan was also gone. Liu Renjia presumed that a high-class demonic beast must have appeared, but he did not expect Sinan to be so useless that he was not able to hold on for more than a few seconds. Liu Xiangxiang rummaged through Sinan's bike in the hopes that the flavonoids might be there, but to her dismay, Sinan kept it on him. She sobbed when she did not find it in the bike. Liu Renjia told her to get up and hurry so they could catch up to the beast and get back the medical supplies. However, he was cut off mid-sentence when he noticed a trail of blood on the other side of the road. Liu Xiangxing was puzzled when Liu Renjia told her that they were going to catch up to them because Sinan was a white silver escort, and he was not able to deal with them. With his back towards her and a game face on, Liu Renjia cut her off as he already predicted that she was worried that he was only a black iron escort. He reassured her that he was the strongest black iron escort and they needed to act fast to retrieve the medical supplies before it was too late. In an abandoned warehouse, Sinan woke up and found himself hung upside down from the building's ceiling. Below him were disfigured bodies of humans fused into demonic beasts' bodies and the two horned beasts seemed to be the one experimenting on them. It was disappointed that another one of his experiments died. It threw its subject away calling it trash and turned to check on Sinan. Sinan screeched with horror as the face of the beast came up close with his face while asking him if he was awake. Sinan squirmed vigorously, trying to escape from being tied up while he was negotiating with the beast to let him go in exchange for supplies, money, or food but the beast just stood there staring at him. He pleaded that he didn't want to end up like its experimental subjects, but the beast told him that those are failures, he, as a white silver escort must stay alive. 
He asked the beast if it was planning to let him go but it said that it prepared another experiment for him. Right on cue, two monkeys wearing false lashes, makeup, and a flower on their end came in and the beast told the confused Sinan that he was going to bear a child with them. A few meters away from the warehouse, Lu Renjia and Liu Xiangxiang were scouting the area when they heard Sinan scream for help. Liu Xiangxiang was worried about what they were doing to him while looking through the binoculars, while Lu Renjia was calmly sipping on his hot water again while pointing out how funny the monkey's false eyelashes were. Liu Xiangxiang asked Lu Renjia if the plan was to find an opportunity to sneak in, but she was not able to finish talking as he interrupted her with his question. He asked her with a very serious face, asking if she had ever seen the insignia on the beast's back before. She said she hadn't and asked him why. She probed further but he did not respond and changed the subject by directing her attention to the monkeys in the ruins. He said that the ruins are fully occupied by demonic beasts, but there was no news in the union about it. Thus he concluded that the monkey king could control that group of demonic beasts really well. He found himself in a troublesome situation because he'll have to get past the group of monkeys before they could fight the monkey king. But if they were to kill it, the demonic beasts under its control would run rampant and the villages nearby would be in danger. And to top it all up, his ability has a time limit. Liu Renjia noticed that Liu Xiangxiang started to worry about Mr. Sinan and the medical supplies again. So he told her not to worry as the monkey king was no big deal, it was just troublesome if they attacked one by one. While finishing his sentence, Liu Renjia noticed something and he leaned in towards Liu Xiangxiang and sniffed her, telling her that she smells good with a funny look on his face. Moments later, Liu Xiangxiang found herself tied up and was hanging from the jib of a tower crane. She was mad and was demanding Lu Rengia to put her down, but he said that the demonic beast should gather so that it wouldn't be hard for him to deal with them. She protested and questioned what the point of her being tied up was, and he told her that she'll have to be bait for a while so he could wipe them all out in one go. Outside the warehouse, Sinan's shirt was now completely torn, and he was still helplessly screaming to get the demonic beasts away from him. Suddenly, the two monkeys stopped what they were doing, and this baffled Sinan. He was wondering what was going on when the monkeys started running away from him, and towards a certain direction. The Monkey King's eyes widened as he recognized the scent that was attracting the monkeys. A horde of monkeys came charging and were now climbing the building Liu Xiangxiang was hanging from. She was puzzled and asked Liu Renjia why there were suddenly so many demonic beasts, but he indifferently told her to stop faking as he knew that she was aware of the reason why. She was still strongly in denial, but as he lifted a detached crane mast and threw it towards the demonic beasts below them, he told her that she was a chosen awakener, and her awakened ability was related to smell. His words caught her off guard, and she was not able to say anything, she was only able to stare at him with a questioning look on her face. He was smiling and pointing to his nose adorably, as he explained that she still couldn't control her ability well, and even though only a slight trace of her scent was leaked, it was enough for him and the monkeys to smell it and now they are coming after her scent. A chosen awakena are those who are born with supernatural abilities, they possess power far beyond that of an ordinary awakena, but their powers are uncontrollable, so the union hunts them once they are discovered. Liu Xiangxiang did not move or say anything when Liu Renjia told her that if she didn't want her secret to be exposed, she should just obediently hang there for a while. Something caught Liu Renjia's attention, the monkey king appeared below them, along with the other demonic beasts, and it looked delighted to have found a chosen awakena. The monkey king hideously laughed as it found the situation marvelous and said that she was so much better than the white silver escort. Liu Renjia stepped towards the edge of the building as he agreed with the monkey king. He threw his jacket in the air. His hair and arms started blazing with fire, his eyes turned bright red, as he expressed his satisfaction that the Monkey King had finally arrived. The Monkey King was taken aback by his aura and asked him who he was, while Liu Xiangxiang was also surprised and questioned him if he really was a Black Iron Escort. He gave her a smile and confirmed that he definitely was, and jumped off the building, lunging towards the Monkey King below. At the Peach Blossom Village, her big sister was giving little Liu Xiangxiang a warning that she must not reveal her identity because the Federation will hunt her, imprison her as an experiment subject, and maybe even kill her. Liu Xiangxiang asked her sister what she would do if someone accidentally found out, and her sister told her that she must kill the person before they reveal her secret. Smokes and explosions were everywhere as Liu Renjia was single-handedly fighting with the entire horde of demonic beasts down below. Multiple monkeys swarmed on top of him, but he deflected all of them effortlessly. Liu Xiangxiang thought of the warning her sister gave her, and she immediately realized that it was impossible as he was way too strong. The Monkey King was taken aback by Liu Renjia's overwhelming strength and asked him if he was an enhancement type awakena. Liu Renjia raised his hands into the air, and he summoned a claw-looking aura that shredded the bodies of the monkeys mobbing towards him. Chopped monkey body parts were flying around. He faced the Monkey King and answered that it was half right. 
The Monkey King was surprised, and its expression turned to delight when it realized that Lurengia could be a dual awakener. It was pleased and laughed as its day was full of surprises and told Lurengia that it never encountered such physique, so it would make sure to cherish him as his experimental subject. It looked down on Lurengia and asked him if he thought he could fight him just because he killed a group of little monkeys. The Monkey King decided that Lurengia was impressive, so he was worthy to witness his true strength. It started bulging up and waves of aura swept through the surroundings creating a gust of wind. The wind reached Liu Ziangsheng who was still hanging at the top of the building. She was overwhelmed and wondered if such was the strength of a super-class demonic beast. The Monkey King heard her, his face distorted into a smile saying that he's much stronger than any ordinary super-class demonic beast. Lu Rengia tried to interrupt it to ask a question, but it kept babbling, asking him to join them as the experiment would make him stronger. Before it could finish its speech, Lu Rengia punched it so hard that it flew towards the top of another building, while asking why it wasn't done talking and told it that it spoke so much that it was annoying. Meanwhile, Sinan was standing in front of the warehouse where he had been left earlier, his arms were crossed, and it seemed like he was deep in thought. When he realized that he was just standing there, he suddenly sprinted and said he should hurry up and escape. He was only able to take a few steps when he noticed the silhouette of the Monkey King approaching him, but to his surprise, it crashed into the ground with great impact that he was blown away by it. Lu Rengia arrived right after the crash and the startled Sinan was standing behind him while he was interrogating the Monkey King, asking it what the water bear was and its objective. The Monkey King tried to play dumb, pretending not to know what he meant, so Lu Rengia glared at it telling it to stop pretending as he knows that the insignia on its back was a water bear. Lu Rengia was surprised when it confessed that it was once an escort, it said that it suddenly woke up in an experiment glass with its memory gone, and when it followed its body's intuition, it found the group of demonic beasts where its body was the leader of. It attempted to return to the human village, but no one was willing to come near nor interact with it so he was very lonely. As Sinan heard the Monkey King's story, he realized the purpose of its experiments. It did not have any one of its kind, so it was creating them. With a sinister look on its face, the Monkey King told them that his experiment would be a success this time with the three of them, but Lu Rengia sarcastically retorted that it was a good idea to stitch them. Lu Rengia bargained with the Monkey King to answer his last question in exchange for Sinan. It doubted his sincerity but proceeded to criticize the offer and called Sinan the weakest option. Both were ignoring the protesting Sinan behind them. Lu Rengia asked it if it remembered where it woke up. It proudly answered that he did. He even went back once, and as it started to describe the location, saying it was in the west, but its body suddenly started swelling up so much, to the point that its body imploded. Blood splattered everywhere, including Lu Rengia's clothes, which surprised him. Lu Rengia was disappointed while looking at the pool of blood left in the area, with Sinan behind him, asking if he was seriously going to give him to the beast. At the Peach Blossom Village, Liu Ziangsang was warmly welcomed by the residents, asking why she was alone and if she encountered any danger. She mentioned that she encountered danger but was able to bring the supplies back thanks to the help of an elite. As they heard the word elite, all their attention went towards the now shabby-looking Sinan. They crowded around him and praised his physique, as he proudly introduced himself as Sin and Pei, a white silver level escort. But Liu Ziangxing, who was watching from the sidelines, felt like the residents were describing an animal with their praises. Liu Ziangxing recalled the time when she parted ways with Liu Rengia, where he said that she could rest assured now that that they knew each other's little secrets. Her face was filled with dread when she recalled the remainder of the memory where her sister was warning her. She asked what she would do if she couldn't kill the person who knows her identity and her sister responded that there would be no other choice but to marry him. At the same time, Lu Rengia sneezed and thought if the old man was scolding behind his back. He was now traveling towards the west to look for clues, while complaining because the west was so big, he was also complaining about the insignia that he has and questioned why the old man couldn't prepare a higher level one for him. Mankind has been reduced from the apex predator to the lowest level, and during the beginning of the apocalypse, mankind relied on leftover food found in the wilderness to survive until mankind gathered together and built base towns. Towns with different functions play their roles as respective organs while the blood circulating through them is the circulation and operation of supplies which escorts are in charge of. A group of escorts was traveling across the city ruins, and one of them was complaining to their boss that he couldn't work anymore due to hunger and suggested that they should find something to eat. 
The boss turned to ask the sixth brother if they still had anything left to eat. He responded that they were already out of dry food and medicine as Liang, the one in charge of those supplies, was killed when they crossed the river. The boss sighed in surrender and told them to spread out and find something to eat. They all exclaimed in agreement, and the boss cautioned them to be quiet and not alert any demonic beasts. The boss stood guard and was worried about this escorted journey that took them a week, and twelve of his brothers were sacrificed for it. He thought that he had to reward the survivors when they got back. One of them returned holding a cockroach the size of his torso. Although no one knew what it was, everyone looked at it with disgust and questioned if they could really eat it. The guy holding the cockroach grabbed one of its legs and said that it was a cockroach, the world's most tenacious creature. Everyone gathered around him as he started munching on it. He said that he heard that it tasted like chicken, very crunchy. They eagerly asked him if it really tasted like chicken and the realization suddenly hit him. He doesn't know what chicken tastes like, and the boss realized that it must have been old Liu who taught him all that information. The guy confirmed that old Liu did, and the atmosphere turned gloomy as they remembered their old leader that died years ago, so the guy proposed that they should not talk about it anymore. He added that he was also told that the cockroaches live in groups so if they look around, there should be enough for all of them. At that moment, a swarm of cockroaches appeared behind the guy and the rest of the group was startled. He tried to warn the guy, who was their second brother, but it was too late. The cockroaches flocked towards him and munched on him until only his bones remained. As the rest of the group was fending off the cockroaches, the boss tried to hold the cockroaches back so his other brothers could retreat with the parcels they were carrying. The sixth brother called out to the boss and when he looked back, he saw a gigantic cockroach leg pierce through his chest. The sixth brother was dragged away by the legs in his chest and he yelled, telling his boss to run and not to worry about him. The boss was startled when a gigantic cockroach emerged from the direction where the sixth brother was dragged, and the sixth brother could still be seen dangling from one of its legs. On the outskirts of the city, Lu Rengia suddenly stepped on a huge cockroach, the one as big as a human's torso. He looked down and was awestruck at how big it was. The leader faced the gigantic cockroach and told his brothers to run as he held the beast's back. The leader did not last that long as the gigantic cockroach immediately impaled his back with its legs, piercing through the chest. Only two of the escorts remained and they were killing off the smaller beasts with their guns but the beasts just kept on increasing. The black-haired guy told the blonde to take the parcels and go. The blonde tried to protest, and he was about to cry when the black-haired guy ran out of bullets. The blonde did not know what to do but the black-haired guy seemed to have made his resolve. He apologized to the blonde guy that he had to encounter this problem on his first escort mission. Then he reminded him and made him understand that the duty of an escort was to deliver the parcels at all cost, all the while holding a grenade in his hand. The blonde tried to hold back his tears as he confirmed that he understood. The black-haired guy told the blonde that if he understood then he have to go, as the gigantic cockroach started peeking from the tall building in front of them. The black-haired guy tried to get the attention of the beasts by spreading his arms, revealing the inside of his cloak that was full of explosives. The black-haired guy, which was the third brother, exploded, but the gigantic cockroach remained unharmed. The blonde closed his eyes and cursed as he was running away from the beast when he came across Lu Rengia. The blonde was shocked that someone was there and immediately asked Lu Rengia if he was an escort, to which Lu Rengia proudly confirmed, adding that he's the strongest black iron level escort. The blonde was glad and immediately asked for Lu Renji's help as he handed him the parcel. He introduced himself as Yao Ming, an escort from the Yuding Escort Agency, and formally asked Lu Rengia to help him complete the escort mission. But Lu Rengia was not listening to him as something caught his attention. Yao Ming continued to explain the situation to Lu Rengia, that there were 32 escorts in their agency and he's the only one left, and because he's injured and no longer have the energy to run, he'll hold off the demonic beasts that were catching up to him so Lu Rengia should hurry up and leave and send the parcel to the town ahead. Lu Rengia have his back turned to Youngman, his hair started blazing red as he told Youngman to wait a moment. He placed his huge bag to the ground and switched to a punching position and demolished the beast in the blink of an eye. Young Ming's eyes widened while Lu Rengia immediately turned his attention back to him and apologized for not listening, his hair now turning back to its normal color. Lu Rengia showed his appreciation towards escorts like Young Ming's group. But Young Ming did not hear it and asked what he was saying just now so he just waved it off as nothing. As they stood in front of Young Ming's comrades' makeshift graves, Young Ming thanked him and invited him to go together to report to the union and for the remuneration. Lu Rengia refused and told Young Ming that he didn't need it. But he timidly asked Young Ming to show him the way as he had been wandering aimlessly for days, while showing the map in his hands. Later, news was spreading that the platinum-level Crimson Shura God of the Dragon City's tinder bases has mysteriously disappeared. The Union hasn't received any reports about him for almost a year. People were gathering in front of a missing poster of a man with blazing crimson wings as they speculate on what could have happened to someone who can destroy the entire Tianfu base in one blow. 
Lu Rengia was standing behind those people when someone pushed him and told him to get out of the way and step aside. A man in a suit recognized Lu Rengia and called him the strongest Black Iron level escort, with emphasis on the strongest and asked him if he wanted to duke it out with the Crimson Shura as he was very concerned about the news. Lu Rengia sighed and told them that it was hard to say if he could beat the Crimson Shura, but a tie should be possible. He then told them to have fun chatting and bid farewell, saying that he's going for his next mission. The people in the building started mocking him, calling him trash, and saying that he should watch his back. He simply smiled while taking a sip at his hot water and told them that it was such a pity that they mock him for being insane while he mocks them for not being able to see the Crimson Shira's true intentions and he told them that they should take this opportunity to write a letter of duel and win without fighting. The people started laughing and called him shameless but he paid them no mind this time as he examined the announcement board. He recalled Youngaming's instruction that the place he was looking for was at the east side for the Tanfu base, near a town called Jangwa, thus he needed to find a mission to the east to avoid alerting the enemy. He was staring into space when an announcement about hiring Black Iron escorts for a mission towards the east side of the base. It caught Lu Rengia's attention as it was the mission he was just talking about. The lady up on the podium stated that the mission was to escort Miss Yurong to Jangwa Town but there was a special requirement for this mission. She pulled the curtain that was covering the item beside her, revealing a sweating, voluptuous and beautiful lady inside a cylindrical cabin. The announcer said that aside from Miss Yu Rong, they must also escort the cabin she's in as Miss Yu Rong cannot leave it due to some special reasons. The men in the crowd went haywire as they stared at Miss Yu Rong's plump chest, and everyone was eager to volunteer. Miss Yu Rong thanked everyone for their interest, but she reminded them that there was no road to walk on and there are all sorts of terrains towards Jiangwa Town, so she was looking for an escort who could carry her along with the cabin throughout the entire journey. The eagerness of the men in the crowd died down as they realized the arduous task needed to be done for this mission. Lu Rengia suddenly appeared on stage and pressed his face to the cabin, saying that they don't need so many people as he can do the mission on his own. This frightened Miss Yu Rong who thought that he was a ghost. The announcer reprimanded Lu Rengia and told him that he shouldn't come on stage without permission. The crowd were also mad at him, and they started throwing things at him. One of the escorts criticized him for saying that he could carry the cabin by himself, but the bald escort thought that his idea to keep the girl all to himself was genius. He flexed his muscles and loudly announced that he was a strength type awakener so he was the only one who could complete the escort mission. He came up on stage and tied a rope to the cabin while telling Lu Rengia to step aside. He was able to lift the cabin a few inches on the ground and the crowd cheered. But he was clearly struggling to breathe and the veins on his head were popping out. He was sweating profusely as he told Miss Yu Rong that he was alright, and he'd be sure to take her to her destination no matter how many months it would take. Miss Yu Rong told him to wait a moment and asked if it would really need that long to travel, and she also clarified that she did not say that she was only hiring one escort. Lu Rengia who was standing behind the bald escort, was grinning devilishly as he seemed to have moved his hand rapidly that no one was able to notice. The bald escort suddenly dropped to the ground saying that he twisted his waist and the crowd told him that's what he got for acting cool. When the bald escort claimed that something definitely hit his waist, Lu Rengia looked away and whistled like he knows nothing about what just happened. Miss Yurong was showing concern for the bald escort, asking him if he was alright. Lu Rengia took the opportunity to proudly declare that he was the strongest Black Iron level escort so she should be rest assured and leave it to him. The announcer stepped in and expressed her doubt on his capabilities as the strength type escort was not able to carry the cabin. The crowd agreed with her and demanded for him to stop acting all high and mighty and get down. Some even bet to eat the can on the spot if he could lift the cabin as he was skinny as the clothes rail. Lu Rengia smiled and proposed a bet to Miss Yu Rong, saying that if he could carry her to the main entrance, she would assign him as the mission's escort. Miss Yu Rong looked like she was having qualms about it but she agreed. Lu Rengia smiled as the deal was agreed upon. He then told everyone to move aside as it was time for delivery while he keeled the cylinder cabin to its side and rolled it towards the main entrance. Everyone panicked and ran away towards the entrance to make way, while poor Miss Yu Rong was disoriented as she rolled along with her cabin. The cabin stopped rolling at the main entrance and Miss Yu Rong immediately asked if the living cabin had not broken as soon as she got up. Lu Rengia sat on top of the cabin and told her not to worry as it was still in good condition and proceed to brag that he is able to carry her to the main entrance with a grin on his face. But Miss Yu Rong was enraged with what he had done, as well as the crowd who almost got crushed. Lu Rengia laughed awkwardly as he realized that he had aroused public outrage and Miss Yu Rong was threatening him that the crowd would be settling things with him now. Lu Rengia paid the threats no mind and started to wrap a rope around Miss Yu Rong's cabin which caused her to frantically ask him to stop what he was doing, but he did not stop 
and he simply reminded her of their bet. The crowd stopped on their tracks, and they were astonished when they saw Lu Rengia effortlessly carry the cabin with only one hand, like it was his backpack. With a satisfied look on his face, he turned towards Miss Liu Rong and told her that they were going. Miss Liu Rong blushed, she couldn't say a word and she looked like she still could not believe what was happening. A while later, in an unknown valley, a flock of vile birds herded to Miss Liu and she frightfully told them not to come near her. She desperately asked Liu Rengia to do something instead of just walking. However, he simply told her not to worry because it was just two birds. Miss Lu retorted it was easy for him to say such but she found them annoying and pleaded with him to get rid of them. Lu Rengia thought of it and proposed that he do her wish but she needed to answer a question first. Without waiting for a reply, he asked her what was the purpose of her visit to Jiangwe Town. Miss Lu's eyes darted to the side as she wondered why he asked her such a question. He would receive the remuneration once he escorted her safely and based on the rules and regulations of the union. He was not allowed to ask the question. Lu Rengia was fine with it but voiced his intention to roll her down the road to arrive at the town faster. Flustered, Miss Lu threatened Lu Rengia that she complained to the union to which he innocently replied he would not dare threaten her. Without hesitation, he lifted up Miss Lu, saying he simply wanted to increase the efficiency of the journey so she fell into a panic and told him to stop and said he would go there to see a doctor for treatment. Lu Rengia looked at her, clarifying what was the treatment for. Miss Lu revealed there was a doctor who lived in seclusion in Jiangwe Town. It is said that he had excellent medical skill and was good at treating intractable diseases so if her disease interested him, she might receive free medical treatment. Her answer piqued Lu Rengia's attention. A while ago, he had a conversation with Sinan about an escort who failed during awakening so he went to a doctor in seclusion for free treatment but went missing in the end. Lu Rengia fell deep into his thoughts but did not remember hearing of such a person who conducted research on awakened abilities. Sinan snorted and was about to say it was normal because he was a mere black iron level. However, remembering how Lu Rengia disposed of the monstrosities, he changed his words and replied it was normal if he had never heard of a minor character since he was an iron blood war god. At this moment, Lu Rengia thought of the free doctor Miss Lu wanted to visit, and was instantly shocked. Suddenly, a giant bird screeched and Miss Lu questioned why Lu Rengia was still staring blankly ahead. The bird was about to claw over at Miss Lu but Lu Rengia was quick to stop its advance. He firmly held the bird's claw, causing it to tremble all over. The next second, he smashed into the ground, calling it a bastard. Lu Rengia asked if Miss Lu was alright when a crack in the glass suddenly popped. Lu Rengia was surprised and when he looked at Miss Lu, she told him to run as smoke slowly emitted through her head. Looking at the small fire on her chest, he asked her if she was alright. Lu Rengia looked at her pitiful appearance and questioned why did she get a low-quality cabin that broke easily after he placed it down. Miss Lu clenched her teeth as she urged him to go and forget about her. Lu Rengia fell silent but the cabin thoroughly collapsed and Miss Lu's power started to erupt from her body. She could not control it anymore so she told Lu Rengia to run and the further it was the better. However, water suddenly poured down on her head. Lu Rengia asked if water was enough as he wondered if this was her awakened ability. However, Miss Lu erupted and questioned him why he did not run. She cursed regretfully as it was already too late. Lu Rengia looked at her as she burst into flames, burning everything around. As her uncontrollable power exploded, she roared in guilt. She did it again. She had already told him to quickly run but she was still unable to save him. If this continues, the entire mountain will be set on fire and the villagers nearby will be implicated so she decides to find a way to control her powers. Suddenly, Lu Rengia replied her fire was impressive, and he agreed that they should find a way. She was shocked to see him without a single burn. He asserted he was the strongest black iron level escort, and admitted he was frightened nonetheless, so she asked if he could think of any ideas. He thought about it and mentioned she could perhaps try something. He snapped his finger and summoned his blood armor. He approached her, but she yelled not to touch her. However, he easily carried her and reasoned they could not get to where they were going if he did not touch her so she wondered if he would not get burned. He simply told her to hang on tightly as he burst through the forest with lightning speed. In a flash, they arrived before a lake which made Miss Lu confused. Without hesitation, Lu Rengia violently threw her into the lake so she could only scream as she fell into the water with a plop. He patiently looked at the water's surface when it gradually rumbled from where she fell. Suddenly, a loud explosion occurred, sending a fish into his face as he concluded it was effective. However, the whole lake started boiling although she just soaked in it for a while. Moments later, the lake continued to boil as Lu Rengia asked her if she was okay now. With an abashed expression, she answered she was alright. She explained that when her body comes in contact with the external environment, her skin's temperature will keep rising 
Once the temperature reaches a critical point, her body will burn. The longer the time, the higher the body temperature becomes, and the harder it is to extinguish the fire. Lu Renji replied that the strength of the flame is at least gold level which is a pretty good ability. Miss Lu soaked herself in the water but suddenly remembered the past. She once lived in a village in the far west, and it was attacked by demonic beasts all year round. The beasts fed on their food and assaulted the villagers. At first, the villagers could still rely on the weapons from before the catastrophe to defend against the beasts. However, the beasts became gradually became stronger until they were no match, and consequently, the village chief chanced upon a magical medicine, declaring that it could help everyone to awaken ordinary powers. Nevertheless, no one could withstand the medicine and the beasts could not be held back anymore. They were running out of time, and there was only one last bowl so the chief told the man it was his turn. The man called Er Kang lamented that the chief must be joking as there were so many people who died from drinking it and he had a family to take care of so he declined the chief's orders. At this moment, everyone pointed at Miss Lu as she was an orphan and since the village had raised her, they urged her to repay their kindness. She was hesitant, but the villagers mentioned her parents being killed by the beasts and she should avenge them, so she eventually decided to drink it. She drank the medicine and afterward, gradually erupted in flames which made the villagers surprised as she did not collapse and they wondered if it was a success. The chief rebuked everyone for being busybody and hurried them to go as the beast was now approaching. At this moment, Miss Lu's body started to blaze with flame. She was left alone to face the beast, and everyone placed their hopes upon her. Miss Lu profusely sweated as she thought of their actions. Her control of herself started to lose. The beast moved toward her as the villagers peeked at the door, ready to witness the birth of their savior. However, a pillar of flame burst forth through the sky and it incinerated everything around it, sending the beast and humans alike to hell. A while later, Miss Lu walked out amidst the flames. She found her fellow villagers had been burned to a crisp. At that moment, she was thoroughly overpowered. Presently, she stated how Lu Rengia thought of her ability as a pretty good one. However, she wished she had never drunk that soup as she would not possess such a horrible ability. She further added that someone like Lu Rengia would not understand how she felt. Lu Rengia sighed and replied maybe she was right. He advised her not to overthink as it was all fate at the end which left her out of words. Moments later, Miss Lu questioned if he really was only a black iron level escort as her flame can even burn an SSR class demonic beast to ashes but he did not even have a single scratch. Lu Rengia confirmed without hesitation, he was the strongest black iron level escort. Miss Lu stared at him and revealed he was as strong as the person who put her into the living cabin, and that person's arms were covered with scales. Lu Rengia turned serious as he hurriedly grabbed Miss Lu closer and he asked her the person's appearance and it was the one who told her to go to Jangwa town. Miss Lu's eyes widened in shock and described that the person was wearing a gas mask and she could not see his face. The person grabbed her neck, causing her to lose consciousness from the chilly air, as he told her she was sick and advised her to see the doctor in Jangwa town for help. Miss Lu frightfully asked Lu Rengia if he knew the person as well, however, his eyes were focused on her chest. She also looked down and was immediately shamed. Fire blazed all over her and another massive explosion erupted. Miss Lu hurriedly swam into the lake and accused him of being a pervert as his hair burned to a crisp, but he reasoned he was innocently deep in thought. She hurriedly brought back the topic and revealed that the person also carried her to the town base and left her some money to hire an escort. Lu Rengia asked if there were any weird-looking symbols on the man but she did not notice anything. Lu Rengia thought for a moment and decided to set out to meet the doctor. However, she brought up the problem that without the living cabin, she could not get out of the water. It was then that Lu Rengia thought of an idea. Moments later, Lu Rengia could be seen carrying a huge water jar with Miss Lu inside and her face in disbelief. She complained about what she was put in but he retorted she should be grateful that he found something after going so far. However, Miss Lu was unconvinced and asked if he was trying to get revenge to which he replied she should just bear with so she declared she would definitely file a complaint about him to the union. Meanwhile, a doctor seemed to be delighted with the fine and warm day. Soon, his new patient should be arriving. Later, Lu Rengia arrived at a barren place where they did not even find a demonic beast. He found it strange that there were no traces of movement which was too abnormal. Miss Lu wondered if the place they arrived at was the right one as she wondered if the doctor was there. He assured her it was right but if they had to walk around the ruins to find the place would be a little difficult. However, they suddenly notice a building so eye-catching. Later, they arrived at the building and Lu Rengia knocked on its door. Miss Lu wondered if anyone was there when a group of people suddenly burst out of the door as they asked if someone wanted to see the doctor. They frantically welcomed him as they invited him to come in. 
They pulled him inside to arrange a body checkup first before the surgery. They also inquired about what kind of room he liked and suggest they could live together if he wanted. Right then, the doctor came and reprimanded the group for being noisy in the hospital. As everyone bowed their heads to apologize, the doctor noticed Lu Renji. He realized he was the reason for the liveliness and welcomed him. He introduced himself as Kai-like as he asked how could he help. Lu Renji revealed he was just an escort, pulling the rope tied in the water jar. After putting it down, Miss Lu emerged from the water and greeted everyone. Kai-like stared at her as he asked what the problem was and why she was inside a water jar. Pulling her hand out of the water, she urged the doctor to take a look. The next second, her hand blazed into flames. This interested Kai-like and recognized it as a transformation-type ability. He now realized she was soaked in the water because she could not control the ability at her own will. Kai-like muttered it seemed to be the after-effect of an incomplete awakening caused by an impure medicine. Miss Lu gasped and was impressed by the doctor's words. Kai-like then beckoned at one of his men as he decided to go in and talk over the details. Right then, the man's muscle veins bulged as he lifted the water jar. Entering the hospital, Kai-like remembered Lu Rengia, and with a sinister smile, he asked if he wanted to do a body checkup as well. Lu Rengia declined and replied he was perfectly fine but the man behind him revealed a terrifying aura. Suddenly, sharp claws emerged from the man's hand as he roared at Lu Rengia that he should not go against the doctor's decision. The man brandished his claws with a hideous smile, but Lu Rengia effortlessly evaded it. Afterward, he smashed the water jar's lid into the man's head, shattering it to pieces. The man screamed as he held his head and frantically asked what was wrong. Lu Rengia pouted and questioned why the man stole his line. At the same time, the doctor hurriedly came back and inquired about what was going on. He approached the man and ordered him to leave as he was being rude to the guests. After the man left in dejection, the doctor apologized and asked if Lu Rengia was hurt. Lu Rengia replied that just because he refused to do a body checkup, they wanted to rip his body apart. The doctor sweated and denied the words since there was a cause he wanted him to stay. He reasoned that the patients have some mental disorders and they do things impulsively and unrhythmically so he was afraid of putting Miss Lu in their care. Lu Rengia asked the doctor what he was trying to say. The doctor answered that Miss Lu would also need to be escorted after she was treated, and it was not easy to find an escort in the village and further added that he would not find any local products. He invited Lu Rengia to come in for a while for a cup of tea while waiting for the operation to be completed instead of wasting time strolling around. Sitting lazily on the chair, Lu Rengia wondered why he ended up here when only wanted to avoid them and sneak in. He finds the doctor very suspicious, but he cannot see his true colors, so he decides to seek a chance to look around the place later. As he smelled the tea, he noticed something wrong with it so he poured it back into the pot. Throwing away his cup, he declared the hospital definitely was unusual. As he walked along the hallway, he proceeded to find Miss Lu first as he could not let the doctor treat whatever illness she had. Suddenly, she saw Miss Lu's figure, and she called out to her, asking why her body was not burning anymore and if her illness was really cured. Miss Lu replied affirmatively, saying she was fully cured. Afterward, she turned to him, and with a blushed expression, she thanked him for escorting her and saving her life. As she went closer, she told him that his kindness should be repaid and she had already thought about it for a while. Revealing her chest, she offered her delicate body in return. Lu Rengia's face warped into frustration as his hand buzzed with lightning. Without hesitation, he punched his face, yelling to snap out of it. Consequently, everything before him shattered like glass as he cursed the doctor. He was cautious this whole time but he was still fooled by an illusion. Suddenly, mechanical arms emerged ahead of him, and their hideous cannon-like mouths targeted him. Lu Rengia remarked that the products he had come for were not from the local area. However, he found himself surrounded by demonic beasts and human skulls standing in a room filled with water. In the meantime, one of the patients with spiky hair asked another patient with a bowl cut if they really had to release all the demonic beasts just for an escort. The one with the bowl cut appeared uneasy but responded that they had to release it as well. Upon hearing this, the patient with spiky hair was surprised and began to sweat profusely as he tried to confirm if he had heard correctly. The one with the bowl cut continued to explain that they had to do this because the doctor couldn't determine the strength of that particular guy. Although the patient with spiky hair was reluctant, he released the beast anyway while warning it not to come looking for him if it wasn't full enough. The bowl cut guy became even more nervous and told him to shut up and just do what the doctor says. Suddenly, the door behind Lu Rengia opened, revealing the silhouette of a gigantic beast with glaring red eyes. Meanwhile, at the doctor's laboratory, Miss Yurong lay on the operating table, attached to a plethora of medical cables. She asked the doctor why she wasn't burning, and the doctor, 
who had his back towards her and was preparing something, told her that he had injected a body temperature inhibitor to temporarily control her body temperature. While the doctor continued with his preparations, Miss Yu Rong asked him where her escort was and if he was coming. The doctor replied that Lu Renjia had another mission, so he left first. Miss Yu Rong was puzzled because she hadn't received confirmation of the completion of the escort mission yet. The doctor told her that maybe he would come back later after he finished his other mission. Turning towards her, he asked what kind of treatment she wanted. Closing her eyes, Miss Yu Rong reminisced about the bodies she had scorched. She told the doctor that, if possible, she would like to return to the way she was before her ability awakened. With a sinister smile on his face, the doctor assured her that anything she wanted was possible. To ease her worries, he told her that everything would be better when she woke up. However, he then cuffed her to the medical bed, startling Miss Yu Rong. The doctor explained that it was to prevent her from moving too much due to pain and causing a mess in his laboratory. He gave her a friendly smile and reassured her that everything would be alright. Despite this, Miss Yu Rong felt uneasy and asked the doctor to wait for her escort to return before proceeding with the operation. However, the doctor refused and told her that it was alright. He then made a disturbing comment, saying that she could join him in hell once the treatment was over. He pressed a button and gave her a menacing smile that distorted his face. Miss Yu Rong screamed and writhed in pain as electricity coursed through her body. A white liquid began filling up a tube, and the doctor laughed hysterically, pleased with the results. He claimed that it was the key to the new world. All the while, Miss Yu Rong started to burn up behind him. Her mind started to drift towards her painful past. The village ostracized her for causing the death of her parents and forbid their children to play with her when she was still a child. When she grew up, wives attacked her and called her a loose woman for seducing their husbands. Lastly, the village pushed her to drink the medicine and had the audacity to call her their last hope. She was losing consciousness as she questioned the misfortunes that happened to her when she did not do anything at all. The doctor was still celebrating his results and was happy that the documents provided by his master were real when the spiky-haired patient interrupted him. Amidst all this, Miss Yu Rong clenched her hands onto Lu Renjia's coat, asking for someone. The doctor reprimanded the spiky-haired patient for entering into his laboratory when he was told not to. But the patient was in a panic pointing into the wall and mentioning the escort which annoyed the doctor and told him to stop dilly-dallying. Cracks were created into the wall the patient was pointing to and Lu Rengia burst out of it, with the demonic beast still wrapped in his body, telling them to get lost. And at that same time, Miss Yu Rong asked to be saved. One of the worm-like demonic beasts lunged towards Lu Rengia, but he effortlessly caught it with one hand and ripped it apart, his expression remaining grim. After casually dropping the beast's body on the ground, the doctor and the spiky-haired patient were intimidated. The doctor hurriedly scolded the patient for not attacking Lu Rengia, and ordered him to do so while the patient complied, removing his shirt. As spiky bones sprouted from his forehead, neck, shoulders, down to his back and arms, the patient proudly presented his complete form and declared it to be a perfect combination of attack and defense. However, a huge hand suddenly burst out from the ground and grabbed him, causing him to cough up blood. Dumbfounded by this scenario, Lu Rengia questioned them if they had raised the beast themselves. However, his shock turned to speechlessness as the beast munched off the head of the spiky-haired patient. He advised them to choose a well-tempered pet next time. The doctor was relieved to realize that Lu Rengia was extraordinary and had made the decision to release the beast earlier when two other patients arrived at the laboratory. As the beast lunged towards Lu Rengia with its mouth wide open and tongue hanging out, the doctor was thinking out loud on how they would lock the beast up after it killed Lu Rengia. With swift movements, Lu Rengia dodged the beast's attack, used its arm as support to gain momentum, and kicked its head out of its body, swiftly killing the beast. The doctor and the two other patients were astonished as the lifeless head of the beast landed in front of them, their faces showing their awareness of how deep in trouble they were. After landing on the ground and seeing the unconscious Miss Yu Rong, Lu Rengia glared at them and reminded them of the consequences of touching an escort's parcel. His eyes and hair were now blazing red. The doctor was sweating and questioning Lu Rengia for calling her his parcel when she was clearly a gift from his master. Terrified, the doctor quickly pushed his patients towards Lu Rengia and ordered them to stop him, but they were reluctant and tried to protest. The doctor used his ability to make the two of them follow his orders. As the two patients attacked him, Lu Rengia quickly realized that the doctor was a conceptual type ability user. He finished the fight with a punch to each patient. The doctor hurriedly left the laboratory, 
calling his patients a bunch of trash, picking up his coat and covering Miss Yurong's body with it. Lu Renjia checked on her and was relieved to find that she was fine and still breathing, glaring at the doctor, who dared to harm his employer. He warned him not to think of running away. However, the doctor, who had his back turned towards Lu Renjia, laughed as he held a syringe, saying that his experiment had already been completed. The doctor impaled himself with the syringe he was holding and told Lu Renjia that he would now be the material. The doctor stood in front of Lu Renjia, holding a syringe to his neck, laughing menacingly, blood and a smoke-like substance oozed out of the wound. Suddenly, Lu Renjia seemed to perceive something, and an explosion occurred. The laboratory was now in flames. Luckily, Lu Renjia was quick-witted and managed to snatch Miss Yurong from the operation table. He protected her from the explosion and was now carrying her in his arms. When Lu Renjia looked at the doctor again, he was surprised by the doctor's current state. The doctor's whole body was ablaze as he claimed he could duplicate Miss Yurong's ability. He explained that the chance of awakening the same ability by chance was no less than a miracle. Therefore, he proposed duplicating abilities by transplanting awakened genes, but the organization rejected his genius idea. The doctor was furious because everyone looked down on him, claiming it was impossible since someone had done similar experiments before. Only the master trusts him, and he was ecstatic that he had finally succeeded. From now on, no one would dare look down on him. Lu Renjia looked disgusted by the doctor's shallow purpose. However, as he asked about the organization's true purpose, his expression changed to one of curiosity. He wondered why Miss Yurong was not burning, and the doctor told him that she had been injected with the secret formula of their organization, a body temperature inhibitor. Lu Renjia thought it sounded like a good thing and carefully placed Miss Yurong's unconscious body on the ground. The flame burned intensely as the doctor became enraged by Lu Renjia's words. He was surprised when he noticed his garment burning and mockingly asked how a person like him could understand their nobility. Lu Renjia nonchalantly told the doctor that he might like to join their organization after listening to what their purpose was. Therefore, the doctor should just say it. However, the doctor yet again mocked him and told him that he was only worthy of being an experimental subject, and that would be his contribution to the organization. The doctor was startled when a part of the demonic beast that Lu Renjia had ripped out earlier was sucked into his body. He did not know what was going on. It wasn't until he saw his body start to melt and absorb all the carcass around him that he realized something was wrong. Hysterically, he questioned how his theory and the master's information could be wrong. With his arms crossed and a bored face, Lu Renjia told the doctor that he must now understand why other people told him it was not doable. Despite his new hideous form, the doctor was still in denial that his idea was not doable. He believed that what he was experiencing was just a small accident, and that he could modify the formula or the material. Lu Renjia cut him off and told him honestly that his current state looked very familiar. The doctor was distressed, still refusing to believe the idea and told Lu Renjia that he was talking nonsense. However, the words came directly from himself, admitting that he was the experimental subject. As the doctor was tormented by the thought and kept asking himself how that could be, Lu Renjia tried to comfort him with open arms. He told him that he might have a way to cure him, as long as he changed his mind and told him the water bear's purpose. The doctor's expression quickly changed into a sinister one while saying that he indeed changed his mind and decided not to let Lu Renjia become his experimental material. He then launched a sneak attack towards Lu Renjia and told him to go to hell. A blazing pillar of fire emerged. The doctor laughed menacingly and said he would burn Lu Renjia until there was nothing left, not even ashes. With his eyeballs now on fire, he told Lu Renjia that he was not worthy of being an experimental material for thinking of provoking the relationship between him and that master. Lu Renjia's eyes gleamed from within the blazing pillar, and he called the doctor a bastard, which startled him. Sharp golden claws that looked like a dragon emerged from the pillar. As Lu Renjia told the doctor that he was completely out of his mind, the claws landed on the doctor's body, and he was blown away by the impact. The doctor coughed up blood as he fell into the room where Lu Renjia was trapped earlier. He lay down on the pool of water, surrounded by huge skulls. His expression turned to horror as he gazed upon Lu Renjia's appearance. His hair was blazing like red feathers, and his armor looked like the setting sun. The doctor recognized his appearance from their files before. Crimson Shura was one of the nine platinum level awakeners from the Dragon City's Tinder base. Lu Renjia dissolved the helmet part of his armor to speak with the doctor. He told him that if he had so much free time to read those messed up documents, then he should consider consulting a psychologist. The doctor did not expect the situation he was in. He trembled in fear as he asked Lu Renjia not to kill him. As he looked upon the doctor with a sullen face, 
He asked if he believed he could save him now. He told the doctor that he had another question to ask. The doctor interrupted Lu Renji a mid-sentence. He could not believe he was being given another chance and told him to ask away. As Lu Renji recalled the story of an escort mission by the Dragon Gate Escort Agency that went missing along with the escorts, his eyes glowered. He asked the doctor if he knew about the incident. With sweat dripping down his face, the doctor nervously told Lu Renji that a minor character like him wouldn't be able to access such confidential information. Lu Renji's face was now calm as he pushed for more information by asking the doctor if the incident had anything to do with their organization. The doctor told him that he had read relevant reports about it in the documents given by the organization, and they were kept in the warehouse beside them. But he hadn't had the time to read through most of them. While Lu Renji's attention was on the warehouse, a huge hand loomed over him and was about to hit him. Behind him was the doctor who merged with more carcass, yelling that this was his chance. The doctor's sinister expression was back, and he told Lu Renji that he was not foolish to believe that he would spare his life when he revealed his true identity before him. The doctor's body yet again blazed, and he told Lu Renji that he was not sick, and that his current state was the future of mankind. He was celebrating his victory and told Lu Rengia that he did not notice when he quietly merged with the pet his master gave him. Now, he possesses so many abilities, so if he keeps on merging, he will become a god of the world. The doctor was startled when Lu Rengia interrupted his monologue and corrected him that he did actually notice. Lu Rengia told the doctor that he just did not care, as he proceeded to dismember the doctor's mutilated body. Lu Rengia mockingly laughed at the word god as he landed on the pool of water. As his armor dissipated, he crossed his arms and informed the lifeless doctor that this was precisely why he had advised him to consult a psychologist. A pre-recorded video depicting the suffering of humanity since the catastrophe began played in the background while Miss Yu Rong lay unconscious on a makeshift bed on the ground. This promotional video, created by the Water Bear Organization, featured a person wearing a gas mask and a cloak, who referred to their organization as the true savior of the world. After the masked individual introduced themselves in the video, they requested a password for more information. Consequently, Lu Rengia, who had been watching the video to gather more intel, became annoyed as he attempted to guess and enter a password. Disappointed, Lu Rengia walked away from the console, grumbling about the preaky approach and the trouble he had gone through. Since the password he entered was incorrect, the system locked up. He then proceeded to search through drawers for useful documents. During his search, he discovered the secret formula the doctor had mentioned and decided to take some for Miss Yu Rong. However, as he picked up the medicine, he noticed that it was labeled aspirin, which was merely a common fever remedy. Despite his complaints, he still took some, and while doing so, he spotted a notebook. At first glance, the diary appeared to be filled with rambling nonsense, but upon closer inspection, Lu Rengia found an entry about the organization planning to raid a group of escorts at the border. Their aim was to capture high-quality experimental subjects. The entry also mentioned an escort couple with sensitive identities who nearly caused the operation to fail. Consequently, the organization decided to put them into a deep sleep. Lu Rengia's thoughts then drifted back to the events that had taken place a year prior at Dragon City's Tinder base. Multiple men tried to calm him down and convince him not to go, but he sent them all flying through the air. With his crimson-colored blazing eyes and hair, he inquired if he appeared calm and demanded to know who had instructed the men to restrain him. As one of the men attempted to pacify him and answer his question, another individual leaped from behind and landed a palm heel strike on Lu Rengia. He was sent flying with force, causing damage to the ground. Cursing at the old man while standing up, Lu Rengia faced Master Huang, who revealed that he had been the one to ask the men to hold him back. The men breathed a sigh of relief upon his arrival. With a grim expression, Lu Rengia was about to ask Master Huang if he knew about the situation, but he was interrupted mid-sentence. Master Huang informed him, however, that he knew Uncle Mo and Aunt Huang, who had raised him, were leading the escort team at that time. As Lu Rengia attempted to ask another question about why this was the case, Master Huang interrupted him once more. He explained that the couple were gold-level escorts, and although the Dragon Gate Escort Agency had formidable forces, they were still raided and none of them were found afterward. Consequently, he asked Lu Rengia what he thought he would be able to discover if he went there. 
Gradually, Lu Renjia sat down on the ground, appearing to have calmed down as he analyzed Master Huang's words. Eventually, he deduced that what Master Huang was trying to convey was that they needed to begin investigating undercover. Master Huang did not provide him with a direct response. Instead, he inquired if Lu Renjia had calmed down and asked him to come to the base later. Lu Renjia was abruptly brought back to the present by the console repeating the password incorrect warning. Clutching a cloth with a symbol imprinted on it, he realized that Master Huang was correct in asserting that the escort group had not encountered any demonic beasts, but rather a group of devious individuals. Grasping the piece of cloth and the diary in each hand, he swore to his uncle and aunt that he would avenge them very soon. Yet, as he frantically flipped through the diary, he quickly realized there was no further mention of the incident or its location, so the clues abruptly ended once again. A voice from outside captured Lu Renji's attention. The voice was calling out for a Dr. Kai. The person dismounted from his motorcycle, revealing himself to be Sinan Pei, who found it odd that no one was responding to him. Sinan was holding out a paper, attempting to double-check if the address was correct, and he indeed confirmed that he was at the right address. However, his face was full of doubt as he looked at the demolished building that was still in flames in front of him, noting that it was different from the mission description. Despite all his doubt, wondering if he would find someone in such a place, he bravely entered the building and started calling out and asking if there was anyone around. Suddenly, a loud thud was heard behind Sinan, and he felt shudders as Lu Renjia jumped from behind him, all the while confirming that there was someone. Next, a huge impact was heard, and Sinan lost his consciousness. The moment he opened his eyes, he found himself tied up and hanging upside down from the ceiling. Hysterically, he asked for help, negotiating with Lu Renjia to spare him. But Lu Renjia told him to stop being noisy and asked why it was him again. Sinan felt relieved when he realized that it was Lu Renjia who tied him up. He then greeted him, hoping he had been well, and guaranteed that he never mentioned Lu Renjia to anyone, all the while swaying from side to side. After offering all the pleasantries, he boldly asked Lu Renjia if he could put him down. However, Lu Renjia just told him that he would reconsider the request after he had finished asking, and proceeded to inquire why he had come to the place. Confidently, Sinan answered that it was for a well-paid escort mission he received in the black market. Nevertheless, Lu Renjia told him to cut the crap, all the while rummaging through his bag and asking him if the parcel was inside. Lu Renjia managed to pull out a men's magazine from Sinan's backpack, and his face was full of judgment while Sinan frantically explained that it was not the parcel but rather his strategic materials. As Lu Renjia started going through the pages of the magazine, he coyly said that the thing was very suspicious, so he would be confiscating it for further investigation. In response, Sinan tried to protest, saying that he spent a lot on buying the magazine. However, when Lu Renjia started staring daggers at him, he panicked and blurted in agreement that it was very suspicious indeed. Consequently, Lu Renjia, his master must thoroughly investigate the magazines, and he would also give him the address of the seller. Lu Renjia seemed pleased with the agreement. Subsequently, he pulled another item from Sinan's back, which appeared to be a handheld radio with a single red button at the center. Lu Renjia looked at Sinan, full of judgment, and asked him if he had come all the way there just to deliver an item with only one button. Sinan retorted that it was a mission he received in the black market, and the offer was very generous. With an expression full of curiosity and mischief, Lu Renjia asked Sinan if he had clicked the button before, to which Sinan strongly replied that he was a professional escort, and was also worried that it would explode with just a simple click. Before Sinan could even finish his sentence, Lu Renjia had already clicked the button. Consequently, he just cast aside the words he had just said. All the while, Lu Renjia was continuously clicking on the button and wondering why nothing was happening. Suddenly, a static sound came from the handheld radio, and the voice on the other side asked if the experiment was completed. As the voice inquired whether the experiment was a success, Lu Renjia coaxed Sinan to answer the question. While still hanging upside down, Sinan confidently replied that the experiment was a success. There was no response from the other side for a while, and then, all of a sudden, the voice said that they would remember Sinan's voice and proceeded to hang up immediately. Infuriated, Lu Renjia called the voice a coward for not daring to speak another word. He even dared the voice to call back and give him their address. Meanwhile, Sinan was worrying if he had said something wrong and why the person on the other line wanted to remember his voice. Sinan urged Lu Renjia to stop hitting the device and noticed that it was burning. The handheld radio suddenly lit up and exploded. The entire building was covered in smoke and rubble was flying in all directions. The transformed Lu Renjia emerged from the smoke, carrying Sinan on his right arm and Miss Yu Rong on his left. 
As they were making their way out, Lu Renjia pointed out how ruthless the person was for detonating the hospital without uttering a single word. At the same time, Sinan couldn't believe that he had been carrying such a vicious item the whole time. Lu Renjia asked Sinan if he had seen the person's face when he accepted the mission. But Sinan told him that, in general, you don't get to see what dealers look like in the black market. He added that the person who assigned him the mission was wearing a mask that made sounds. In a desolate rocky area, the person who was wearing a full cloak and a gas mask in the promotional video pushed a button on a handheld device, causing it to make a beeping sound. Staring into space, he said that the doctor had been discovered. He then sighed and remarked that it was expected of trash to be useless. In the beginning, a young girl was balled up in a corner, hungry and searching for her parents. Eventually, an old man approached her and somberly told her that it was very unfortunate that her parents had been eaten by a demonic beast. Subsequently, he handed her a piece of bread, which she devoured vigorously. As time passed, the old man loomed over the now teenage girl and told her that she had indeed become a beauty as she grew up. He declared that it was time for her to repay him, all the while undressing and revealing a lewd, drooling face. Desperately, she tried to defend herself, and the next thing she knew, she found herself engulfed in flames and floating midair. In a horrifying display, she burned everything and everyone to death. Confused, she questioned herself about what was wrong with her. Suddenly, a gigantic, sinister face of Dr. Kai appeared behind her and informed her that she was sick, but he could help her. He grabbed her into his palms and told her that as long as she gave him her abilities, he could help her. However, he then commanded her to die. Out of nowhere, a huge fist butchered the doctor into pieces. It was the transformed Lu Rengia, who told the doctor to get lost. With a sweating, red face, Miss Yu Rong awoke from her dream, feeling startled. At this point, Sinan was driving his motorcycle, while Miss Yu Rong sat in the sidecar's passenger seat, and Lu Rengia rode at the back, engrossed in reading a book. Upon noticing that she was awake, Sinan greeted her with a smile and mentioned that she seemed to have had a nightmare earlier. Still terrified, Miss Yu Rong looked at the stranger and immediately fired multiple questions about his identity, her location, and the whereabouts of her escort. Sinan only answered the last question, explaining that her escort was reading a book behind her. Nonchalantly, Lu Renjia turned around and asked her if she was looking for him, while holding a book in his hands. Relieved, he told her that she didn't burn up and that the secret formula had been quite effective. Feeling reassured, Miss Yu Rong relaxed as Lu Renjia told her not to worry since the squinting-eyed man wouldn't cause her any more trouble. However, her expression of relief quickly turned to disgust when she realized what Lu Renjia was reading. She questioned him about the nature of the magazine he was reading with such a serious face. Proudly, Lu Renjia gave her a thumbs up and declared that it was learning material, prompting her to respond that he was shameless and to question whether he thought she was blind. While driving, Sinan glanced over at Lu Renjia with a worried expression and advised him to put the magazine away. As they were nearing town soon, and such treasures were easily coveted by others. Annoyed, Miss Yu Rong yelled that they were missing the point. Eventually, they arrived at an apartment building, where Lu Renjia looked quite pleased as he laid down on a cushion, appreciating its softness. He commended Sinan, admitting that while he wasn't very capable, he did know how to enjoy life. However, Sinan retorted angrily that Lu Renjia had no right to talk about his capability since he was sleeping on his sofa. In response, Lu Renjia asked what more he wanted when he had already given him his bed to sleep in. Sinan's expression turned grim as he pointed at the ragged, patched up mat on the floor, but Lu Renjia showed no regard for it. Meanwhile, Miss Yu Rong, who was in the same room as them, overheard their bickering. Consequently, she offered to sleep on the floor instead, as she wasn't used to sleeping on a bed. However, Sinan, blushing, insisted that it would be an honor for her to sleep on his bed and encouraged her to sleep well. Shamelessly, Lu Renjia told her to ignore Sinan and advised her to rest early, as Sinan would be escorting her to a place the following morning, which would be a long journey. Upon hearing this, Miss Yu Rong asked Lu Renjia where she was going, and he simply replied that it was for treatment and someone there could help her. Blushing at his kindness, Miss Yu Rong politely said that he couldn't keep helping her and then inquired if he was coming along too. Lu Renjia, laying down on the couch, informed her that he had other matters to deal with, so he couldn't always stay with her. However, he assured her not to worry, as the people where she was going were very friendly. Miss Yu Rong looked down and, with a solemn smile on her face, agreed with Lu Renjia, acknowledging that she couldn't keep living like that. In the morning, while looking at the letter placed on Sinan's bed, Lu Renjia mentioned that Miss Yu Rong had really left without informing them. However, Sinan burst his bubble by saying that they had watched her leave last night, and he had wanted to stop her, but Lu Renjia hadn't let him. 
Liu Renjia picked up the note and Sinan asked him what was written on it. Liu Renjia revealed that it was an acknowledgement of debt, stating that she would pay him back in the future. Consequently, Sinan questioned if she intended to be always indebted to him and asked if Liu Renjia wanted him to go after her. Liu Renjia responded that there was no need and then inquired if there were high grounds in the area. Standing at the edge of a beam, Liu Renjia was overlooking the town they were in. He was talking to someone over his handheld radio, and the person on the other line confirmed that they had received the new intel and had found the lady that he mentioned. Liu Renjia was pleased with the news and added instructions that her physique was unique, so they should keep a close watch on her. The person on the other line told Liu Renjia that they had assigned someone to follow her and asked if they should invite her to their base for protection. After giving it some thought, Liu Renjia decided that there was no need. He said that everyone had different aspirations, and she had made her own choice, so they just had to follow her for now. The person confirmed that they understood the instruction and proceeded to report about another matter, which was the information on organizations that were purchasing laboratory equipment on a large scale. Surprisingly, there weren't any. The person said that the person purchasing must be moving around secretly, as there were no witnesses or reports of anyone wearing gas masks, so they couldn't act rashly. Liu Renjia understood and said that he would continue to follow up on the case. The person on the other line was about to end the call but remembered something. He told Liu Renjia that everyone was now wondering what his relationship with the girl was since he had given his coat to her. Then, the person immediately hung up. Liu Renjia looked dejected when he realized what it was that he felt missing, and Sinan, who was kneeling and quivering at the edge of the building behind him, criticized him for noticing it just now. Liu Renjia looked back and told Sinan that if he was that scared, he shouldn't have followed him. Nevertheless, Sinan retorted irritably that he was now being targeted because Liu Renjia insisted that he talk, so the safest way was to follow him. Sinan tried to threaten Liu Renjia by using his secret, but with a mischievous look on his face, Liu Renjia told Sinan that Dr. Kai was the last person who discovered his identity, reminding him of what happened to the doctor. However, Sinan did not care and demanded that Liu Renjia could not leave him behind by all means. Feeling defeated, Liu Renjia just agreed to whatever Sinan wanted to do and told him that he was going to buy clothes. Liu Renjia went into the stores and was looking at coats, but they all felt the same to him, so he decided to just pick any one of those and look for the price tag. He could not believe his eyes when he saw the price of the coat he chose. He immediately rummaged through his pocket and, to his dismay, discovered that he was completely broke. He contemplated what he should do as he was also getting hungry. As he remembered Sinan, a bright idea crossed his mind, and the clueless Sinan suddenly felt anxious. With a new coat and a steamed bun in hand, Liu Renjia was now content. Meanwhile, Sinan was complaining about why he had to pay for everything. However, Liu Renjia shamelessly retorted that it was Sinan's fault for following him, and emergencies happened. Sinan questioned Liu Renjia about why an escort like him was so poor, but instead of answering, Liu Renjia told him to stop nagging, as he would pay him back when he got money from his next escort mission. Still, Sinan told him to just forget it. Sinan couldn't let go of the idea that Liu Renjia's strength was beyond the level of a white silver escort, and he found it strange. Suddenly, Sinan's face lit up as he thought of a good idea. He proposed that the two of them should cooperate on the very profitable white silver level mission he had recently come across. He believed that, with Liu Renjia's strength and his identity, they would be able to complete the mission easily. The information piqued Liu Renjia's interest, and he asked Sinan what the mission was. Sinan answered that it was to escort a prisoner. The Spirit Wind Mountain Village was a group of bandits that had been moving a lot around the Salt City base. They had committed innumerable murders and would vanish into thin air afterward. Sinan explained that they always moved mysteriously through the mountains and forests, so the Union had a hard time arresting them. Liu Renjia then inquired about the person they would be escorting, and Sinan replied that the prisoner was a leader of the Spirit Wind Mountain Village known as the Thunderbolt Legs. As Sinan imparted the information he had on Thunderbolt Legs, a mental image of a bulky bandit covered in tattoos came across both their minds. He mentioned that his iron legs were tough and invincible, and they were in charge of escorting him to prison. Liu Renjia was delighted since they just met the requirement of two people for a prisoner escort mission. Sinan proudly agreed with Liu Renjia, informing him that the escort mission could only be accepted by a white silver level escort or above. However, at the base, Sinan was hysterically complaining about why he could not accept the mission since there was a test he had never heard of before. He aggressively raised his insignia in front of the receptionist, questioning whether she thought there was a problem with his qualifications as a white silver escort. 
The receptionist calmly adjusted her glasses and told him that she did not doubt his qualifications. She was simply following orders. She also added that the prisoner had agreed to the request, so the escort had to pass the test either way. Sinan's expression turned serious as he questioned the receptionist about prisoners suddenly having rights and accused her of negotiating a good price privately. The receptionist merely closed her eyes and replied that she had no comment. With a playful smile on her face, the receptionist informed Sinan that the test involved fighting the Thunderbolt legs and that the mission would be his if he won. Sinan appeared confident, dismissing the test as a trivial matter, and then turned to Lu Rengia with twinkling eyes, suggesting that he handle the challenge. However, Lu Rengia refused him in a heartbeat, finding it too boring. Now in an arena, Sinan continued to complain as he prepared for battle, feeling disappointed because he thought he had finally latched onto someone with a powerful position. Lu Rengia looked at Sinan apathetically, asking him what was wrong with his brain for wanting him to fight when a white silver escort could capture the prisoner. With that, Sinan reluctantly accepted that he had to fight. Back in the audience seating area, the receptionist asked Sinan if he was ready and reminded him not to kill the person. Sinan, standing on the stage, expressed annoyance at the numerous requirements. The receptionist adjusted her glasses again as she instructed the man who had been by her side earlier to let the prisoner out. The man panicked, questioning if she was sure, while Lu Rengia stood behind them, looking very uninterested in the matter. As the two of them bickered about releasing the prisoner, Lu Rengia rested his head on his hands, growing sleepy. The thick, heavy, metallic gate in front of Sinan was opened, and smoke billowed out. A silhouette of a person appeared, and as Sinan saw the chain on its feet shatter easily, he swallowed hard. A voluptuous woman with brown hair lunged towards Sinan swiftly, and the previously sleepy Lu Rengia was now amused. The woman delivered a flying kick to Sinan as Lu Rengia marveled at the fact that the Thunderbolt legs was actually a woman. Sinan effortlessly dodged the woman's kick, and as he turned his body to point his gun at her head, he confidently suggested to the lovely lady that they should end things there since she couldn't beat him in terms of speed. The woman snickered, dropped to the ground with unbelievable speed, and initiated a spinning bird kick. Meanwhile, Sinan's eyes gleamed as he recognized her refusal to give up. He preemptively apologized as he fired his gun aiming towards her. As the bullet approached her, rather than being alarmed, she simply grinned. The receptionist, who had been watching, commented that Thunderbolt Legs possessed more than just speed. Impressively, Thunderbolt Legs deflected the bullet with her legs, and Sinan heard a metallic sound upon impact. She then pushed herself off the ground and skillfully maneuvered midair to deliver an axe kick to Sinan. Although Sinan managed to dodge in time, the force of the kick created a massive hole in the arena's floor. Lu Rengia observed the fight intently, while the receptionist and her companion commented on Thunderbolt Leg's strength. The receptionist revealed that her real name was Lai Zhejin, a transformation-type awakener, whose legs could transform into steel. As one of the powerful cotters of Spirit Wind Mountain Village, she claimed to have strength that an ordinary white silver escort couldn't match. The receptionist doubted Sinan could defeat her. In response, Lu Rengia interrupted their conversation with a question. He inquired why she was called Thunderbolt Legs if her legs became steel, which left the two momentarily speechless. The receptionist then brushed it off, stating it wasn't the main point, and that it was time to test Mr. Sinan's strength. She wondered why he hadn't used his ability yet. Confused by the receptionist's question, Lu Rengia sought clarification, asking if she was referring to Sinan who had indeed been using his ability. Sinan fired another bullet towards Lai Zhejin, who promptly deflected it with her now steeled legs. Lai Zhejin taunted Sinan's choice of weapon, asserting that his small toy handgun might be useful when dealing with ordinary beasts, but was common knowledge that it wouldn't do much damage to an awakener, as she suggested that it was in his best interest not to accept the mission if he only had that much strength. Sinan executed the classic anime glasses move. Lai Zhejin suddenly felt a strange sensation in her legs that genuinely frightened her. With a smile on his face, Sinan confidently asked her if she still held the same opinion now. The receptionist was carefully analyzing which of the two common types of awakeners Sinan might be. She stated that if he were a transformation type, then it would have been accompanied by a significant deformation of the body. Consequently, if he had been using his ability as Lu Rengia said, then it was evident that he was an enhancement type awakener, where the functions of the body cells are greatly enhanced. However, as they watched the fight and witnessed the explosive power of Sinan's bullet, which was destroying the arena, 
Her companion began to doubt her analysis. He proposed that what if Sinan was actually a transformation type and his bullets were his deformities. While listening to their conversation, Lu Rengia just thought to himself that Sinan's ability was completely unrelated to the gun and bullets. He also acknowledged that Sinan had grown stronger since the last time he saw him. Nevertheless, as Sinan reloaded his gun and Lai Zhaozhen positioned herself behind him, ready to deliver her axe kick, Lu Rengia concluded that he was still not strong enough to defeat her. In response, Sinan executed a front flip, dodging her kick, and while mid-air, he fired his gun at her. Lai Zhaozhen scoffed at Sinan's aim, as the bullet missed her and landed on the ground beside her. To her surprise, the area beside her exploded, sending huge rubble flying in her direction. Astonished, she hurriedly dodged the debris. Grasping her stomach, she felt relieved that she had not been injured there. Now furious, she told Sinan that he should not think of leaving the place intact, while Sinan was confused as to why she had suddenly become so angry with him. Lai Zhejin picked up Sinan's bullet from the floor and mentioned that she felt a strange vibration when she was hit on the leg, but the bullets appeared ordinary. She threw the bullet she had just picked up, realizing that Sinan's ability was bullet vibration. Dismissive, she called it ridiculous and said that his ability was meaningless as long as he could not shoot someone. Sinan appeared worried, yet he maintained an air of confidence, praising her for figuring out so much from just one bullet. As Sinan turned to look over at the three audience members, the receptionist and her companion were trying to decipher what Sinan was attempting to convey. Meanwhile, in the arena, Sinan was sweating profusely as he tried to wave and send a signal to Lu Rengia, asking for help and indicating that it was his turn. Simultaneously, Lu Rengia wore a playful smile on his face, feigning innocence about what Sinan was trying to communicate and suggested that maybe it was his victory declaration. With worry written all over his face, Sinan looked up as Lai Zhejin got behind him, mocking him for having the time to talk to his companion. Feeling desperate, Sinan acknowledged Lai Zhejin's strength and declared that he would have to go all out. He twirled and fired bullets hysterically, naming this move the bullet storm. As Lai Zhejin dodged the bullets flying all over the place, some even reached the audience stand where Lu Rengia was laughing hysterically. The receptionist, on the other hand, was annoyed by Sinan's move, stating that he was out of his mind, while her companion protected her from the bullets. Suddenly, a voice called out to Sinan Pei, telling him that it was enough. The unexpected interruption caught the attention of Sinan and everyone else, including Lu Rengia who wondered who the person was. A large individual stood at a distance, and with a booming voice, he told Sinan to get out, creating a massive shockwave. As Sinan and Lai Zhejin defended themselves from the shockwave, and the debris flying toward them, Sinan recognized the person. The individual, whom he referred to as Wu Kayan, stood there arrogantly, instructing Sinan to be tactful as he wanted this mission for himself. Lu Rengia asked who the guy was, and the receptionist's companion informed him that Wu Kayan was an infamous escort known as the Predator. He explained that Wu Kayan's powers were far beyond that of a white silver escort, but he refused to take the level test and deliberately remained at the white silver level. Curious, Lu Rengia inquired why Wu Kayan would do such a thing. Meanwhile, Wu Kayan smiled sinisterly and approached Sinan in the arena. As Sinan and Wu Kayan were having a face off, the receptionist answered Lu Rengia's question. He mentioned that, according to the union's rules, escorts compete in an escort duel if two of the same level are interested in the same mission. Consequently, no one dared to take missions from Wu Kayan, fearing they would be killed in an escort duel. Suddenly, Lu Rengia recalled a scene from when he was competing for Miss Yu Rong's mission, and he wondered why he felt like the receptionist was talking about him as well. The receptionist continued to reveal that Wu Kayan was extremely ruthless, causing many escorts to be beaten up to the point of retirement from the escort union. Over time, no one dared to compete with him anymore, allowing him to easily obtain well-paid escort missions. This created a real problem for the escort union, as hirers could not oppose him. Liu Rengia smirked, thinking that Wu Kayan was looking for trouble. However, as he made his way out of the audience stand, he wondered if the union would recognize him if he intervened, given the large number of onlookers. Ultimately, he decided he couldn't care less, as the calabash like Wu Kayan was getting in his face. But just as he was about to approach the arena, he noticed something. Sinan was raising his hands and gesturing for him to back off. Although Lu Rengia understood what Sinan meant, he was confused as to why he was telling him to stay out of it. Wu Kayan then asked Sinan about his injury, kneeling to the ground in preparation to launch an attack. He also reminded Sinan that he had been taking low-level missions after getting beaten up by him. Nervous, Sinan admitted that he was unprepared last time but insisted this time would be different. 
Wu Kian, however, just shouted for him to bring it, causing another shockwave. Caught off guard, Sinan was unable to dodge the attack or move his body, and the impact immediately threw him. As Sinan slumped to the ground, Wu Kian taunted him, saying he had witnessed the entire battle and mocked him for thinking he could win just because he had gotten stronger. Laughing hysterically, Wu Kian told Sinan he wouldn't give him a chance to raise his gun. Wu Kian then mentioned that Sinan hadn't learned his lesson after having his arm broken last time. As he was about to step on Sinan with the intention of breaking his spine, Lai Zhejin intervened, blocking Wu Kian's leg with her own. She called out his sneak attack as a scummy trick, asserting that if he wanted the escort mission, he would have to go through her, not Sinan. Then, she kicked his legs, pushing him back. Unfazed, Wu Kian laughed and called her feisty. With a disgusting expression on his face and his tongue out, he reminded her that he had witnessed their entire battle and knew that she had been careful with her stomach. Wu Kian inhaled sharply, warning Lai Zhejin of an impending attack and questioning how she would protect her stomach. Like Sinan, she was unable to dodge the attack and slumped to the ground. Enraged, Lu Renjia watched as Wu Kian stomped on Lai Zhejin's stomach, declaring that she was a prisoner and a mere item to be escorted, so she had no right to act so righteous. He continued the assault, telling her that once he became her escort, he would be sure to have a good taste of her in the forest. Meanwhile, Lai Zhejin cursed as she lay there helplessly, worrying about her stomach. Unexpectedly, someone grabbed Wu Kian's legs. Looking down, he saw it was Sinan, still lying on the ground, pointing a gun at him and warning him not to touch Lai Zhejin, as she belonged to him. Wu Kian was irritated, and with a simple flick of his legs, he cast Sinan aside. Lai Zhejin lay unconscious on the ground, while Wu Kian turned his attention to Sinan Pei, confidently stating that there was no way he would win against him. Furthermore, he claimed Sinan was a disgrace to the white silver level escorts because of the rumors that he was more than willing to accept black iron level missions. Brutally, he kicked Sinan, who was also lying on the ground, and taunted him about his lack of friends and social life. Wu Kian continued, mentioning that Sinan only rides his motorcycle to complete one mission after another. As Sinan tried to get up, Wu Kian asked him why he was doing so, instead of running away like the last time when he broke his bone and peed his pants because his ability was harmless to him. Condescendingly, he loomed over Sinan and told him that he wouldn't even have the chance to lift his arm, so what else could he do with just a gun? Sinan stared at him intensely but was initially speechless. However, as he pushed himself up from the ground, he declared that he did have an idea. Upon hearing what Sinan said, Lu Renjia suddenly remembered that it was the line Sinan had used when he left him as bait for the demonic beast monkeys that were chasing them. Sinan settled into a crouched position, saying that if he didn't have the chance to lift his arm, then he wouldn't lift it, all the while pointing his gun at the floor. Wu Kian was dumbstruck for a moment, and then he started laughing hysterically, mocking how scary Sinan's shooting method was, and asked him if he was trying to convulse him with laughter. Sinan admitted that Wu Kian was right, he could not win against him, but as he fired his gun on the ground, he said that today he was not alone. A burst of light blinded Wu Kian, followed by dust and rubble flying everywhere, creating a smoke screen in the arena. Wu Kian could no longer see his surroundings. He speculated that the smoke was a distraction and dismissed it as a useless trick, as he could make the entire place explode with just one scream. He then started to fill his lungs with air. Unexpectedly, a blazing silhouette appeared right behind Wu Kian, which made him hold his breath. The silhouette, who was Lu Renjia, greeted Wu Kian with his hood up, so his face was not entirely exposed, and an evil grin on his face. Just like earlier, Wu Kian shouted his response, asking who was there, hoping that his sneak attack would damage the person hiding in the smoke. However, Lu Renjia just stood there, unbothered, as he complimented Wu Kian for having a clear voice. He started running towards Wu Kian, saying that he would hand back his words to him, and as he landed his punch on Wu Kian's now deformed face, he called his sneak attack a useless trick. In the audience stand, the receptionist and her companion were having a hard time seeing what was happening in the arena, so they couldn't understand the situation. The receptionist's eyes widened as she saw a giant hand with sharp claws appear in the arena. She didn't know what she was seeing. The disfigured Wu Kian was punched by the giant hand, hitting the audience stand just behind the receptionist, where Lu Renjia had been standing earlier. As the receptionist looked back, Lu Renjia emerged from the smoke, coughing. The receptionist looked at him with great suspicion in her eyes, as Lu Renjia feigned innocence and asked what had just flown by him. He acted surprised as the smoke dispersed, revealing the disfigured Wu Kian, and Lu Renjia asked how he had fallen there. 
The receptionist and her companion were not sure what had happened just now, so when her companion started asking her, she told him she was not sure either and told him to stop asking. Quick-witted, the receptionist, who saw that Lai Zhejin had lost her ability to fight, didn't waste a moment and announced the final winner is Sinan Pei. Sinan jumped happily as he expressed his thanks. Then, the receptionist congratulated him on winning the escort duel and sent them on their way. Lai Zhejin was lying unconscious on a haystack when Sinan told Lu Renjia that he thought the receptionist definitely suspected him. To this, Lu Renjia simply responded that it was okay, as she would find Sinan first before getting to him. They were now traveling on Sinan's motorcycle, with Lu Renjia in the passenger seat and a small cage being dragged behind them. Sinan asked Lu Renjia if he was cool back then, which reminded him of the smoke bomb move. He commended Sinan for it and asked why he suddenly thought of helping him hide his true strength. Confidently, Sinan responded that it was because of his value, meaning that the fewer people who knew the secret, the more valuable it was. He considered the receptionist a competitor. Lu Rengia slacked back into Sinan's passenger seat, asking him if he was not scared of getting beaten up for wanting to use him to his advantage. Sinan simply answered by quoting the saying, high risk and high return, also adding that they were able to gain a good mission all thanks to him. While on the road, Sinan, with a pained expression, asked Lu Rengia if he was really weak. Lu Renjia tactlessly told him that what else would he be, which turned the sorrowful Sinan into an annoyed one, saying he admitted the fact yet Lu Renjia somehow always had an attitude that pissed most people off. Lu Renjia laughed, saying it was alright, and added that Sinan was much stronger than the first time he met him. That compliment caught Sinan off guard, and he thanked him with uncertainty in his tone. When Lai Zhejin woke up, she immediately sat up and asked where she was and how long they had been traveling. Lu Rengia looked back and, seeing that she was finally awake, greeted her with a smile and told her that they had already left for a while. Lai Zhejin glared at them and asked why they were assigned the mission when they hadn't finished their fight yet. She also asked about Wu Qian's whereabouts. With a thumbs up, Sinan proudly answered that Wu Qian was easily defeated, as he only used 10% of his strength while fighting her, and he did not fight seriously with such a lovely lady like her. Lu Rengia told her that, with her physical condition, she should avoid fighting with others and asked her if she wanted to sit in the front with them. Lai Zhejin was surprised by the offer and that they were releasing her. Sinan also agreed that it wouldn't seem very appropriate for her to sit next to him. But Lu Rengia told him that it was not about appropriateness. Frustrated, Lu Rengia started venting out his pent-up rage about how slow their motorcycle was moving because it could not drag the small cage behind them. He said that they barely moved after such a long time that even walking on foot was much faster, and it looked like it would fall apart anytime. With a pained expression and avoiding eye contact, Sinan reminded Lu Rengia about his Rolls Royce and how he was made into bait last time, but Lu Rengia did not let him finish talking. With a devilish grin, he asked Sinan if he was blaming him and discredited Sinan, calling his motorcycle a Rolls Royce. As Sinan released Lai Zhejin and removed her handcuffs, she mocked their confidence in releasing her. She told Sinan that he was not an awakener that excelled in speed, so he could not stop her if she ran away now. But Sinan looked at her confidently, and told her not to worry, as she couldn't. While stretching her wrist, she wondered how Sinan was so confident and thought that it was because of the kid next to her. However, she immediately debunked the thought as she remembered that he was only a black iron level escort. Sinan proudly explained that he would rely on his logic. He analyzed that assigning only a white silver level escort to a same level prisoner meant that the Union did not consider unexpected circumstances. Although he didn't know how she privately came to terms with the Union, he was sure that she wouldn't run away. Sinan was celebrating as he proudly announced that it was a proven fact that the mission had no danger. This realization led Lu Rengia to understand that Sinan had brought him to fight against Wu Kayan and commended his good plan. Suddenly, something caught Lu Rengia's attention and he asked Sinan to repeat what he had just said. Puzzled, Sinan was about to say that the mission had no danger, but his sentence got cut off when someone from an elevation fired an arrow towards them, and it landed beside him. Multiple armed people emerged from the forest, chanting their motto, they were from the Spirit Wind Mountain Village. They were led by an Asian-looking man who called Lai Zuzhen's sister-in-law, saying that they had come to rescue her. He opened his fan to cover his face, struck a pose, and told her that it had been a long time since they last saw each other. Lai Zuzhen cringed along with Sinan, who questioned if they had deliberately waited until he finished elaborating his perfect analysis before jumping out to slap him in the face. All the while, Lu Rengia was just laughing at them. The Asian-looking man sternly told them to get out of their sight if they had any sense, and the armed individuals began chanting to kill them. 
The Asian looking man then threatened them, saying they would end up like the skulls adorning the pole that one of the armed men was holding. A smug smile formed on Sinan's face as he questioned if they were threatening them, and he assumed that they must not be familiar with the Tianfu base. With sparkles surrounding him, he struck a confident pose and told them to get in line. He then introduced himself as Sinan Pei, the escort who had surpassed the peak of the white silver level, and the one who had killed Predator Wu Kian with a single gunshot. Behind them, Lai Zhejin appeared gloomy, while Lu Renjia corrected Sinan, saying that Wu Kian was not dead yet. In a state of panic, Sinan told him it wasn't the time to worry about such minor details. The Asian-looking man closed his fan and shifted into a fighting stance, declaring that there were tons of white silver level fighters at the Spirit Wind Mountain Village, so Sinan's level didn't impress him. Growing nervous as he realized the man was another transformation type Awakena, and his transformation seemed stronger than the Thunderbolt legs, Sinan tried to hide his concern and called the man an ignorant fool. He was about to tell Lu Renjia not to be lazy again. But his sentence was cut short when Lai Zhejin stepped forward and blocked the Asian-looking guy's hand, which had turned into a blade, with her legs now transformed into iron. She sighed and commanded them to step back, stating she didn't need rescuing. The armed men, who also called her sister-in-law, were astonished. Sinan, standing behind them and assessing the situation, asked if that was the reason the Union feared nothing. However, Lu Rengia, sitting in the motorcycle sidecar beside him, looked annoyed as he clicked his tongue and cursed. Confused by Lu Rengia's actions, Sinan turned and asked him what was wrong. Lu Rengia stared straight ahead with a serious expression and questioned Sinan if they should trust Lai Zhejin and consider the Union naive for thinking the mission had no danger. Right on cue, the Asian-looking guy displayed a devilish grin and slashed at Lai Zhejin's legs, which she managed to dodge despite her surprise. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia continued to ask if they should consider Lai Zhejin naive for being blindly confident in holding the bandits back. Lai Zhejin addressed the Asian-looking guy, now called Scar, and demanded an explanation for his disobedience. Instead of answering her, Scar tried to persuade his brothers, the armed men, that something had happened to Lai Zhejin, suggesting the cruel world had made her afraid to speak honestly. Lai Zhejin vehemently denied being threatened and insisted Scar was spouting nonsense. With a sinister look on his face, Scar declared he didn't care whether the Union had threatened her or not. He then yelled and ordered the archers to prepare to kill the two escorts so that their sister-in-law would return to them. Lu Rengia crossed his arms and looked up, asking if they were the naive ones for falling into the receptionist's trap. Sinan, nervous and ready to fight, told him to just cut to the chase and admit that he was stupid. The receptionist's companion told her that he could not understand her decision of changing her mind. When the escort mission was constantly postponed because there were not enough men, he acknowledges their capabilities for beating Wu Kian so badly but he was still worried for the danger they would be in if they faced the bandits on their own. He continued to prove further, asking if she believed Thunderbolt Leg's words and that she could persuade them to leave. The receptionist questioned his logic and asked how it would be possible to believe a prisoner's words, to which her companion got more confused and worried, as they were screwed for sure. He asked if she had a personal grudge against Sin and Pei or if she was sure that no one would save Thunderbolt Legs and told her that Tianfu Base couldn't afford to lose a white silver level escort out of the blue. The receptionist gave him a confident smile as she asked him to take a guess and told him not to worry. Lu Rengia sat on the motorcycle, with his arms crossed in an extremely annoyed expression. He sighed. Scar ordered the archers to fire and Lai Zhejin tried to stop them, but they did not listen to her. A rain of arrows was coming towards Sinan and Lu Rengia. Sinan was prepared for battle and told them that they were the ones who started the fight. With guns in each hand, he moved swiftly and fired at the arrows to deflect them. All the arrows missed them and landed on the ground surrounding them. Lu Rengia looked at him with awe and called his move the bullet storm. All the while, Sinan was out of breath and pleaded not to bring up that move again. He was also complaining that he should have waited until he struck a cool pose first. Seeing that Sinan blocked all of their arrows, the archers looked horrified and questioned if he was really only a white silver escort. Scar exclaimed and motivated his brothers by telling them not to be afraid as Sinan only has two guns. Scar ordered them all to attack, and they all charged while chanting and exclaiming to kill the escorts and release their sister-in-law. Sinan was prepared to fire at them and told them that they were ridiculous for courting their own deaths, but someone grabbed one of his guns and threatened him not to dare hurt their brothers. Sinan was startled as he saw Lai Zhejin holding his gun to her head. She knew that their escort mission would end in failure if she died, so he dared him to shoot. 
The bandits who were charging were also startled and they stopped in their tracks, asking what she was doing. Lai Zhejin addressed her brothers and waved them away. She told them to leave because if any harm was done to them, she might as well die with them. The bandits were now in turmoil and thought about retreating, as they saw that it did not look like their sister-in-law was being held captive. Scar was displeased by the situation. He silently called them a bunch of trash and useless. He dashed and jumped above Sinan, ready to slash at them and saying that he will do things himself. Sinan and Lai Zhejin were both caught off guard and they were both stunned as they looked up to where Scar was. In the past, Lai Zhejin looked surprised while staring at a key. She asked if it was for her and the person confirmed, saying that it was a small gift. She asked what it was for, and the person told her to take a guess. She was not pleased with his answer and told him to stop messing with her. This made the person laugh and told her that it was the key to the property he had accumulated over the years. When she asked why he was doing such a thing, his smile turned into a solemn expression as he instructed her to take him and leave the place once their mission was completed. He wanted them to find a place to start over again. Those memories flooded Lai Zhejin as she looked at Scar that was above them. Scar was laughing hysterically as he was about to slash Sinan and he told him to die. All the while, Sinan just stood there as he was stunned and could not move his body. Lu Renji's eyes suddenly lit up with a red glow and a purple beast looking aura loomed over Scar saying that it was time for him to stop playing games. Scar was overwhelmed by the murderous aura that he was not able to continue his attack. He took a step back instead. Scar looked at Sinan with a horrified look on his face. He was thinking of how he was able to condense something so realistic that it was like facing an actual demonic beast. Sinan stood there, acting cool while holding his two guns, while Scar was questioning if there was still more to him. Sinan was sweating buckets and was wondering why Scar was staring at him. The murderous aura nearly made him pee his pants, but he did not make it obvious as he bragged on how mighty he was. Lai Zhejin looked over to Lu Rengia and thought that something was wrong because the murderous aura came from there, but Lu Rengia just sat there and said nothing. The bandits approached the now disheveled Scar, calling him second master. They confronted him for being reckless as he could have accidentally harmed their sister-in-law. The bandits then asked Lai Zhejin if she was really not coming with them. They asked if she was going to abandon them. They were crestfallen as their master just passed on, and now she was leaving. Guilt washed over Lai Zhejin's face as she recalled her memory with the master. She asked for forgiveness as she does not want to be abandoned anymore. Scar did not let the chance slip by. He started coaxing his brothers again to take their sister-in-law back with them. He told them that she was surely brainwashed by the union with a psychic type Awakena as this was not the sister-in-law they once knew. Lai Zhejin glared at him and asked him what he was trying to attain by doing such actions. One of their brothers grabbed Scar's shoulders and told him that he was being a bit too much as their sister-in-law had already said her wishes. He reminded him about the rule that they could not stop anyone from leaving the Spirit Wind Mountain Village which was set by their master. One of the brothers agreed and said that they were not fools. He asked how he could expect them to follow his orders and attack when they saw him get intimidated by the enemy. Scar lashed out on one of his brothers. He slashed his chest while calling them all trash. As their brother fell into the ground with a huge wound on his chest, the other bandits told Scar that he was out of his mind for attacking their sixth brother. Meanwhile, Sinan and Lu Rengia were just observing and were confused about the development of the situation as there seemed to have internal strife happening. Lai Zhejin glared as he called out for Scar with spite, but he paid her no mind. Scar turned towards the bandits and told them that he was no longer the second master. He was the boss now as the old man was long dead and commanded them to obediently do what he says. With a cylinder-shaped item in his hands, he then turned towards Lai Zhejin and told her to not move, otherwise he would not show mercy. This alerted Lai Zhejin who was now in a fighting stance, while Scar told her that she had never once looked him in the eye. Scar threw the item towards Lai Zhejin saying that he would show them all how strong he was, but she was able to dodge the item. Lu Rengia, who was behind her, caught the item in his hands. He wondered why Scar would throw a tin at them, which would have been broken if it fell into the ground. All the while, Sinan was looking defeated beside him, asking him to not simply catch unknown items that were thrown by others. Lu Rengia's eyes widened as a gas puffed out of the tin he was holding, while Sinan covered his nose, complaining that it stank. They were all wondering what that gas was, if it was acidic or a poisonous one, when Lai Zhejin suddenly looked horrified, looking towards Sinan and Lu Rengia's direction, while Scar just stood there menacingly. The ground rumbled and a gigantic worm appeared behind Sinan and Lu Rengia. Sinan looked like his soul left his body as the beast attacked them, but Lu Rengia calmly eliminated it with a single punch, wondering what was going on. 
Everyone's mouth was agape as they witnessed the incident. Lu Rengia then looked back, glaring at Scar while asking what he just threw as he was curious. An ominous aura shrouded Scar as he laughed when he realized that the murderous aura earlier was from Lu Rengia. He commended him for hiding well but said that his trick would only look ridiculous from the perspective of true strength. Scar has this maniacal wide-eyed look on his face as he spreads his arms, telling them to see for themselves the miracle that is happening right before their eyes. Multiple worms appeared all over the place, a writhing mass of slimy pinkish-brown cylindrical bodies. They were clustered together and seemed to merge into a single organism, which looked unsettling. Lai Zhejian, along with her brothers were frozen in place as they watched the gigantic worms wriggle and coil at the ground around them. While holding more tin in his hands, Scar reprimanded his brothers for just standing there, and ordered them to bring their sister-in-law back, so he could check if she was being controlled by any psychic abilities. Before letting them go, with a deranged look on his face, he declared to everyone that Lai Zhejian was now his. Lu Rengia was tossed into the air by one of the worm's bodies, and as that worm attempted to eat him from behind, he simply punched it but another one appeared behind him, attempting the same thing. He leaped in between the worm's body to dodge their attacks, and while he was doing so, he saw Sinan holding on to one of the worm's bodies. He was holding out for his dear life while crying out for his help. Lu Rengia immediately dashed towards Sinan who had his hands reaching out for him. Sinan was falling down, and he couldn't breathe, and just as he thought he was about to die, Lu Rengia's hand grabbed onto his coat. He popped out of the ground, a flower was now planted on his head, and Lu Rengia was still holding onto his coat. He was worried as he looked up at Lu Rengia, telling him that those demonic beasts were super class. Lu Rengia stood unfazed as multiple worms were showing their sharp teeth towards them, and he told Sinan to stay there for now as he needed to deal with the worms first. Lu Rengia prepared himself by giving a breath of release, and in a blink of an eye. He extinguished the worms and cut them into pieces. The disheveled Sinan appeared indifferent with what he just saw, and thought to himself if there was a limit to Lu Rengia's strength. As the worm's carcass was still falling to the ground, Lu Rengia proudly announced that he was done, and it was time to dig Sinan out. While being pulled out from the ground, Sinan asked Lu Rengia again if he really was weak, to which Lu Rengia did not respond. Sinan did not probe further and he just asked him not to simply catch something next time. He said that even though it does not matter for Lu Rengia, it matters for him, so Lu Rengia laughed and apologized to Sinan. They were disappointed by the fact that the bandits escaped when they had the chance, and the land had been badly destroyed by the demonic beast so there were no clues left behind. Sinan was also disheartened when he saw his Rolls Royce too smoking from being freshly squashed. He slumped into the ground as he said that he just changed tires. While Lu Rengia stood there thinking that the scene looked familiar, Sinan looked horrified by the problem they were facing. His bike was destroyed, and they don't know the bandit's whereabouts, so they don't know where to get Lai Zhejian and how to get there. He thought that the escort mission was doomed. Lu Rengia suddenly asked Sinan if he knew what was the thing that Scar threw as it seemed to have attracted the demonic beast. Sinan retorted that what he was asking was not important and that they should hurry and look for Lai Zhejian but he stopped himself when he realized what Lu Rengia was trying to convey. Looking at the huge pothole in front of them, Sinan asked Lu Rengia if he was trying to say that they could find the bandit's hideout if they went down the pothole, and immediately asked him if his brain malfunctioned. Back at the Spirit Wind Mountain Village, the villagers welcomed the bandits and were frantically looking for the doctor. When the doctor came to examine the sixth brother, he said that he had to stop the bleeding, and asked how he got injured. He knew that they went to rescue Lai Zhejian, so he asked one of them where she was. Scar pushed Lai Zhejian into a room while commanding her to get in. With his back turned towards the door, he commanded the two men to close the door and leave as it was none of their business now. He looked back at them and told them that he was going to undo her psychic control so they should stay away from there. One of the men tried to confront Scar but the other one stopped him. Lai Zhejian smiled at them and told them that it was alright for them to leave. The two of them were reluctant but the door was shut in their faces. Inside, Scar whined to Lai Zhejian with a dim look on his face. He called their brothers ungrateful souls for obeying her, the one who left the village for so long, over him, who managed everything by himself when the old man died. Lai Zhejian told him that Brother Feng treated them as brothers, while he was relying on the beasts to subdue them, so it was no surprise that he was losing their loyalty. With another tin in his hands, Scar told her to stop saying flowery words because he knew that the two of them were discussing to leave the village, and with a threatening look on his face, he called them an adulterous couple. Lai Zhejian was flabbergasted and was unable to respond coherently, and was stuttering. 
Inside the sinkhole, Sinan called out for Lu Rengia and told him that they just walked past the way he was going. Lu Rengia simply turned the other way and confidently told Sinan that they would go that way. But Sinan told him that they had also walked that way. Lu Rengia was now confused but tried to point towards a different path which made Sinan burst into rage, questioning if he was serious as they walked through that passage five seconds ago. Lu Rengia admitted defeat and asked Sinan if they walked through all of them, and Sinan told him that he had been looking at him confidently going in circles. Sinan confidently pointed at a passage and told Lu Rengia that they would go that way which impressed Lu Rengia and made him feel at ease. Sinan bragged that he was known as Tianfu's walking map, and when Lu Rengia told him that he had never heard of that, he confidently admitted that it was a nickname he came up with at the moment. He confidently walked towards the passage he pointed at, saying that after seeing Lu Rengia struggle, he decided that he should lead the way. Sinan was suddenly running back towards Lu Rengia at full speed, so Lu Rengia wondered why he came back and asked him if he walked down the wrong path again. Another gigantic worm was chasing Sinan. Its teeth were right behind him. While running with all his might, Sinan told Lu Rengia that he was wrong and that he should take the lead. As Lu Rengia shifted into a fighting stance, Sinan quickly reminded him not to destroy the passageway and Lu Rengia told him not to worry. The ground rumbled and dust dispersed as Lu Rengia eliminated the beast. Lu Rengia laughed as a new idea came into his mind and the demonic beast came just in time. While Sinan looked nervous behind him, saying that he had a bad hunch about the idea from the bottom of his heart, Lu Rengia started going inside the beast's mouth and told Sinan to hurry up. He said that they could avoid detours if they walked inside the demonic beast. But Sinan was horrified by the idea and begged for Lu Rengia to give him a break. In the past, Lai Zhejin and Brother Feng were running away from armed men, wondering how the news got leaked. While running away, Lai Zhejin's foot slipped at the edge of the cliff causing her to lose her balance and fall. Luckily Brother Feng grabbed her in time. While hanging from the cliff, Lai Zhejin told Brother Feng to forget about her and run. Brother Feng looked at her in earnest and told her to listen to him when a menacing silhouette appeared behind him. It was holding a sword and was swinging towards him, and as he told her to live well with him, blood splattered everywhere which left Lai Zhejin horrified. There was nothing she could do but scream his name. Lai Zhejin was caught by the Union. She was sentenced to death for committing 147 escort robberies in the past few years, but it was lightened to a life sentence and working as labor eternally, as she was a white silver level. On the day of her trial, the judge asked her if she had anything to say, so she told the judge that she wanted to make a deal, as she heard that they were allowing refugees to live in the city if one pays a huge sum of money. The judge called the idea absurd, saying that they cannot offset her crimes easily, let alone allowing her to stay in the city, but then asked what the sum was. Looking crestfallen, Lai Zhejin told them that she knew that they would not let her go easily so it was up to them to do whatever they wanted with her. She told them that she was not referring to herself as the refugee, while staring intently at the key that Brother Feng gave her. Lai Zhejin snapped back to reality with Scar accusing both of them of abandoning the village. He was aggressively pointing fingers at Lai Zhejin and getting in her face while he accused them of covertly searching for the Union. He asked her if she thought that he wouldn't find out. She was caught off guard by Scar's actions which made her took a step back and she could not respond properly to his accusations. Scar spread his arms, telling her that Brother Feng was willing to give her all of his precious assets to help her leave this place. But those assets were supposed to be his, the one who worked under him. Scar got into Lai Zhejin's face and grabbed her chin, telling her that she's included to the things that would be his. He then asked her where the things Brother Feng gave her were, and she told him that those were just some supplies. But she did not finish her sentence. With a grim look on her face, she realized that Scar was the only person in the village who knew that on the day they set off, they were not going to the nearby village to gather some intel but were going to sneak into the city. Scar looked like he panicked when Lai Zhejin accused him of being the one who leaked the news. With Scar distracted, Lai Zhejin saw this as a chance and kicked the tin out of Scar's hands. The tin dropped into the ground, away from where they were, and Lai Zhejin told him that it was useless to rely on those kinds of external objects, all the while she was preparing to launch a sidekick. As her kick landed on Scar who blocked it with his transformed hand, she asked him if Brother Feng had never taught him that before. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia and Sinan are traversing inside the beast's body that was full of sharp teeth. Lu Rengia was complaining about how it stank, while Sinan could not finish his sentence as he was nauseated. One of the two villagers who Scar closed the door, the one with the ponytail, questioned his companion for stopping him earlier. 
He was mad because Scar clearly injured their sixth brother. His companion told him to calm down and interrupted his outburst by saying that enough was enough. He told him that it was the second master who took over them and led them for so long after their big brother passed on. He was well planned and did things very thoroughly so they should just trust him. His tone was laced with fear when he reminisced about the gigantic worms while reminding the guy in Ponytail about that power, and saying that perhaps their sister-in-law needs some time. A villager came running towards them, screaming bad news, he told him not to run around the village and asked what was wrong and the guy told him that their sister-in-law and second master got into a fight on the rooftop. The ponytail guy was surprised but his companion was in rage, and in the blink of an eye he was already on his way towards the fight, saying that he would beat Scar up if he dared lay a finger on their sister-in-law. All the while, his companion was dumbfounded by his actions, as it was not what he was telling him a while ago. Pieces of damaged wood were flying all over the place, Lai Zhejin and Scar moved at such a high speed that they could not be seen. Only the point of impact of their fight. Scar dug into the ground with his weapon to prevent himself from skidding further, as he was being pushed back by Lai Zhejin's attacks. While Scar was trying to compose himself, Lai Zhejin jumped into the air to deliver her kick from a high altitude. As Lai Zhejin landed her kick on Scar, multiple floors of the building collapsed with them. Scar was now lying on the ground with Lai Zhejin stepping over his weapon, which he used to protect his body from her attack. She coaxed him into telling her the truth about how he found out about Brother Feng's plan. Scar fought back and swung his weapon, which forced Lai Zhejin to do a backflip to dodge the attack. All the while, he was questioning Brother Feng's decision, saying that he served him like a slave for more than 20 years and that he followed, worked hard under him, and went through thick and thin with him. His hair bun has now come undone. He glared at Lai Zhejin as she asked her if she knew how many times he had saved Brother Feng. So who in the village would not be convinced by his ability? Lai Zhejin was surprised when Scar went hysterical, telling her that Brother Feng not only took her away with him secretly, but he also left nothing for him, and that he even wanted to hand over the position of the master to a newcomer because he harbored evil intentions. He called him absurd. With a puzzled look on her face, Lai Zhejin asked him how he knew all this when Brother Feng never told those to anyone. Scar looked eerie as he told Lai Zhejin that the omniscient, all-knowing, and mighty existence that humans doesn't know told him those. All the while, he was recalling his encounter with the said existence. He was bowing at a giant red eye surrounded by the giant worms and multiple skulls. He opened his fan and raised it to cover half his face while he told Lai Zhejin that she was being ridiculous for thinking that there was nothing he could do without the holy relics. He tapped on his fan and called on his summons with open arms, saying that his god is everywhere. Lai Zhejin's eyes widened as she witnessed the demonic beasts attack their village. Wood chips were flying everywhere, and dust was dispersing as she told Scar that he had gone nuts and told him that he would be destroying the village with what he was doing. Scar paid her words no mind and asked her if she was scared instead and as a response, Lai Zhejin continued to talk about the village, saying that it was their brother Fang's blood, sweat, and tears. This pissed Scar off, and he commanded the demonic beast to get her. As the demonic beast charged towards Lai Zhejin, something stuck out of the soil beneath her feet. It was Sinan who was looking very dull. Everyone was dumbstruck, including the demonic beasts, when Sinan started yelling and calling out for Lu Renjia, saying that they came to the right place, and they found Lai Zhejin. Lu Renjia told Sinan to stop shouting, as he burst out of the ground, while Sinan was catapulted into the air. Lu Renjia smirked while telling Sinan that he heard him. The once peaceful village was now in shambles, with villagers screaming and calling out for help as the worms continued to destroy the houses around them. In the midst of the chaos, the villagers resentfully questioned Scar about his actions, but he merely stood there with a menacing expression. Meanwhile, as Lu Renjia confronted Scar, Sinan chuckled and approached Lai Zhejin. Leaning towards her, he confidently claimed that she couldn't escape this time. However, she retorted that she had never even considered running away. Incredulous at the scene before him, Scar inquired how Lu Renjia and the others had survived. Ignoring the question, Lu Renjia sniffed the air and observed a strange odor, similar to the one emanating from the tin. He deduced that Scar must have placed devices throughout the village in advance and curiously noted that none of the demonic beasts attacked Scar. Lu Renjia then interrogated him, demanding to know why the beasts weren't attacking and if there were any odd symbols on the devices. Unfazed, Scar raised his blade, denying any knowledge of such symbols. With a swift motion, he gestured towards the beasts and challenged Lu Renjia to ask them himself. As the beasts' mouths opened wide, resembling blooming flowers in summer, Scar commanded them to attack Lu Renjia. 
concern for Liu Renjia's safety, Lai Zhejin shouted a warning, but Sinan's priority lay elsewhere as he ordered her not to move or leave his sight. Worried, Lai Zhejin questioned Sinan's indifference to his companion's predicament while Liu Renjia's hair turned red as he lunged towards the beasts. Nearby villagers, who had been bravely defending their homes, wondered why the beasts ceased their attacks and asked if they were already saved. The creatures began retreating, and the villagers observed them converging in one area, puzzled by their behavior. Suddenly, they spotted something flying in the sky, too small to identify clearly. As Lu Rengia dove towards the beasts at full speed, the villagers speculated that the airborne figure was a human. However, when he unleashed a powerful punch, obliterating all the beasts in a single blow, they questioned their earlier assumption. Every villager was left dumbstruck, Lai Zhejin included. While Sinan remained unfazed, his attention and gun still trained on Lai Zhejin. Hovering midair, Lu Rengia took another sniff and found it odd that the acidic smell had intensified. At that moment, Scar burst into maniacal laughter, proclaiming that Lu Rengia was finished. He explained that, having killed so many holy envoys, it would undoubtedly come to settle the score personally. Right on cue, something massive erupted from the ground below Lu Rengia. With a wry smile, Lu Rengia glanced down at a gigantic red eye beneath him, realizing that the source of the foul odor was its putrid breath. The demonic beast, with its gigantic red eye, demanded to know who had killed its envoys, as it sought vengeance. Lu Rengia told the beast that although it looked terrifying, he acknowledged its strength, particularly its ability to speak the human language. As soon as the beast noticed Lu Rengia, it immediately recognized him as the one who had killed its envoys and declared that he would die as its revenge. Meanwhile, Scar rejoiced, spreading his arms wide and taunting Lu Rengia, asking if he thought he was almighty just for killing the envoys. Sinan, who was standing guard beside Lai Zhejin, expressed his disappointment and horror. He mentioned that he had believed Scar's power to be some new technique but it turned out Scar was merely a puppet. This caught Lai Zhejin's attention, and she asked Sinan what he meant by puppet. Sinan explained that some demonic beasts found it inconvenient to move around in the wilderness, so they would tempt other living beings to become bait or help them hunt prey. Humans who succumbed to the power of the demonic beasts and betrayed their kind for a symbiotic relationship were known as puppets. The villagers soon gathered around Lai Zhejin, checking if she was alright and condemning Scar for his actions. Armed with weapons, they surrounded Scar, calling him a traitor and ordering him not to attempt escaping. Scar, angered by being called a traitor, retorted that they had betrayed him. He claimed that he didn't want to end up like this, but their lack of respect pushed him to his limits despite his hard work. As the gigantic beast wreaked havoc on their village, Scar told them that they would now experience fear since he had unleashed the beast. He warned them that they would all end up like Brother Feng, who had been stabbed in the back, and they were all doomed. Lai Zhejin, upon hearing Scar's words about Brother Feng, realized something. Scar, surprised by Lai Zhejin's reaction, had inadvertently revealed information. Lai Zhejin recounted that when Brother Feng was stabbed in the back, they both fell off a cliff, and she was later rescued by an escort downstream. The Union had not discovered who had dealt the final blow to Brother Feng, and there were no clues about his corpse. Lai Zhejin deduced that Scar's knowledge of Brother Feng's wounds meant he was likely responsible. Enraged, Lai Zhejin called Scar a bastard and attempted to kick him, but he blocked the attack, showing no remorse. He even told her that she would be joining Brother Feng soon. Scar then launched an attack called Bladestorm at Lai Zhejin. Sinan came to her rescue, firing at Scar and telling him to stop mentioning storms. Scar was shocked when Sinan's bullets shattered his blades. With both of his arms severed, Scar fell to his knees, remarking that there was something strange about Sinan's gun. Sinan corrected him, stating that there was nothing unusual about his weapon and bullets. Striking a cool pose, Sinan warned Scar not to think about escaping, as he planned to take both him and Lai Zhejin back together to earn extra money. Lai Zhejin stood behind him, looking grim. Sinan was about to continue speaking when Lai Zhejin collapsed, clutching her stomach in severe pain. Concerned, Sinan asked her what was wrong. Scar took advantage of their distraction and fled, growing back his blades and slashing through the villagers. Sinan tried to shoot him and told him not to run, but Scar had already slipped away, shouting that they would be punished by the gods. As the gigantic beast covered its eyes with its tentacles to hide from Lu Rengia, Lu Rengia effortlessly ripped the tentacles off. He smirked, telling the beast to stop playing tricks and hiding, and asked if that was all it had. However, Lu Rengia's expression changed as something caught his attention. It was Scar, standing at the edge of the cliff with his arms spread wide open in acceptance, calling the beast his god and master, while asking it to save him, his faithful servant. 
In exchange, he promised to dedicate the entire village to the beast. Lu Renjia stared at Scar with a puzzled, unfazed look on his face, wondering what Scar was up to and if he had lost his mind. The beast gazed at Scar intently upon hearing his words of dedication and seemed pleased, accepting the offer. As it began to wrap its tentacles around Scar, he panicked, pleading for it to wait and asking what it was doing. But the beast ignored his cries. Without hesitation, it chomped on him, causing blood to splatter between its sharp, massive teeth. Lu Rengia was horrified by the scene, yet also impressed that Scar was the second person he had encountered who sought trouble by attempting to negotiate with a demonic beast. He couldn't help but think of Sinan, the first person he had encountered in a similar situation. The beast then turned to Lu Rengia, announcing that it was now his turn to die. The eyes of the demonic beast started bulging out of its body as if they were going to pop out. Meanwhile, villagers watched the spectacle from a distance, wondering if its stomach was upset because Scar was poisonous. Sinan interrupted their speculation, informing them that the situation was dire as the beast was leveling up. The villagers, however, did not understand what leveling up meant. Sinan explained that demonic beasts gain power by swallowing other creatures, and once their accumulated power reaches a certain level, they break through their physical limits and advance to a new level. It was also said that an Awakener's power is similar to that of a demonic beast but pure. So many demonic beasts targeted Awakeners instead. Realizing that the beast intended to fight Lu Rengia after devouring Scar, Sinan grew distressed. Knowing the situation was dangerous, he began shouting at Lu Rengia to stop the beast quickly as it was leveling up, encouraging the other villagers to join him and shouting. Although Lu Rengia, some distance away from the village, could hear them, their words were inaudible. Thus, he simply waved at them while his back was turned to the beast. By now, the beast had completely transformed, towering over Lu Rengia who appeared minuscule in comparison. Lu Rengia turned to face the beast and immediately noticed that it had become stuck while leveling up. The beast wasted no time, and its sharp, gigantic teeth lunged at Lu Rengia. Caught off guard, Lu Rengia's eyes widened in surprise as the beast's teeth began to envelop his face. As the beast closed its mouth and chomped down, it laughed maniacally. Sinan and the villagers watched in horror. The beast was overjoyed, knowing that after consuming Lu Rengia, it could continue to level up without needing to search for prey in the shadows. However, it was taken aback when Lu Rengia spoke from inside its mouth, remarking that the beast was timid. Alarmed, the beast's mouth began to protrude in all directions, and without delay, Lu Rengia burst forth. Now fully clad in armor, with four golden arms extending from his back, he told the beast that although it had been close to leveling up, it had continued to hide in the mountain. Glaring at the beast, he questioned whether it had been living like that or hiding from something. Confused and baffled, the beast wondered why Lu Rengia was still alive but couldn't finish its sentence due to disbelief. As Lu Rengia advanced to attack, the beast grew frightened, warning him not to come near and offering to cooperate while raising its tentacles defensively. Lu Rengia ignored the beast, tearing off its tentacles with his newly grown arms and declaring it was too late. He attacked the beast's body relentlessly, ripping it apart until it was nothing more than a pool of blood. Sinan and the villagers were horrified and frozen in place, watching the gruesome fight. One of them dared to ask Sinan who exactly was the demonic beast between them, and Sinan, confirming that he was being asked, replied that he didn't know either. The villagers had started patching up their destroyed village. The doctor checked Lai Zhejin's pulse and she anxiously asked him about her condition. The villagers surrounded them, filled with worry as they lay on the ground. The doctor looked extremely surprised when he realized she was not injured. However, Lu Rengia interrupted him and finished his sentence by asking Lai Zhejin if she was pregnant. As Lu Rengia appeared behind the crowd of villagers, looking relieved even with his tattered coat, the villagers started running away from him. Lu Rengia realized that something was off before they set off and now he knew why she refused to fight with all her might. When he looked up, he was surprised to see the villagers huddling together, looking at him with horrified expressions. He asked them why they were looking at him like it was him who made her pregnant, but Sinan cleared up the misunderstanding. He told Lu Rengia that he was certain that it was not what the villagers meant. Lai Zhejin confirmed her pregnancy and told the villagers that she was carrying Brother Feng's child. The villagers were surprised to hear that Brother Feng had always hoped that his child wouldn't have to become a bandit and could live a peaceful life. Lai Zhejin looked heartbroken as she revealed that he did not know that it became his last wish. She admitted that she used all the properties Brother Feng left for her to sign a residential agreement with the Union. This would allow her child to live in the base after being born, and as long as she was willing to serve the sentence, the child's living expenses would be completely covered by the Union. 
She had not told the villagers about the matter, fearing that they would think they were selfish. The doctor crouched down in front of her and asked her if she remembered Brother Feng's motto. If you can make a choice to not be a bandit, then don't be one. The doctor told her that Brother Feng's dream was also everyone's dream, and they were more than happy to hear their wishes and not think that they were selfish. The rest of the villagers rejoiced and agreed with the doctor. They said that her child was also their child and it was wonderful news that their child could become a resident of the city. Lai Zhejin blushed as she was touched by their words. While Lu Renjia was relieved that things got resolved, he told Lai Zhejin that if she was done talking, they should set off. As soon as he started talking, everyone backed away. He called them out for doing such things and asked them what kind of bullying they were doing to him. He even asked if there was shit on his face or something, as everyone was looking at him strangely. The villagers huddled together, trembling in fear as they called him Lord Escort and asked him if he was going to arrest them. One even pleaded not to kill him, while another told him that they had never killed anyone before and swore that they would never rob escorts in the future. Lu Rengia looked petrified as he remembered a dark fragment of his past, where he was glaring and blazing over a mountain of corpses. He sighed while looking dejected and told them that he was exhausted and not in the mood for it. Sinan sensed the atmosphere and started to worry about his master. But he was not able to convey his worries as Lu Rengia interrupted him, complaining about the deceiving receptionist, and that he would not fall for her trap of suppressing the bandits. The doctor suggested they stay the night since Lu Rengia said he was exhausted. He even offered to summon the most beautiful girl in the village after their sister-in-law to serve them both good wine and food. Both Sinan and Lu Rengia's eyes twinkled when they heard those words. Their expressions were full of anticipation as Sinan wondered if there was such good treatment. The doctor clapped his hands and summoned little Kiwi to greet the guests and serve them well. Then an extremely muscular person appeared, wearing pigtails and a bikini top. Both Sinan and Lu Rengia's faces were horrified and stone cold as they gazed upon the being that was offered to them. The doctor whispered to little Kiwi to take out all the good wines he had hidden and some gold and silver from the warehouse. He instructed little Kiwi to not treat them badly, as it would be beneficial for them if they could establish a good relationship. As soon as the doctor finished his instruction, little Kiwi pointed at the shadows that were running away in the distance, saying that their benefactors had already left. With a somber look on his face, the doctor praised them for not being disturbed by the fact that there was a beauty before them and left just like the wind without bringing nor leaving anything behind. He said that they were real escorts. On the other hand, Sinan carried Lai Zhejin in one arm, just like a child, and while he and Lu Rengia ran with all their might, he asked Lu Rengia why the girl's dressing style was different from theirs. Lu Rengia told him not to ask him and just run. Approximately one year ago, at the high bunker base number 13 in Dragon City, a cannon fired a shell towards Lu Rengia. However, he effortlessly caught it in his hands, crushing it and causing an explosion. Astonishingly, Lu Rengia remained unharmed and simply stared at the camera pointed in his direction. Subsequently, as Lu Rengia tossed the crumpled cannon shell aside, the individual monitoring the camera footage let out a sigh. He then reported to Miss Wang Zai who was in the room with him, that Lu Rengia was still out there. The man mentioned that it was impossible to force Lu Rengia to leave, and inquired whether she truly had no intention of meeting him, considering she was the commissioner of the escort mission his foster parents had accepted. Huddled in a corner of a windowsill, Miss Wang Zai informed the man that she didn't want to meet him, as she had already divulged everything she knew to the union. Burying her face between her knees, she added that she wouldn't know what to say to Lu Rengia even if they did meet. The man sighed, assuring her that he would find a solution. Before exiting the room, the man offered Miss Wang Zai some comforting words, stating that Lu Rengia was well aware of the dangerous nature of escort work and wouldn't hold a grudge against her. Miss Wang Zai remained silent, only lifting her head to watch him leave. Upon closing the door, the man encountered young master Wang Ying, who was inquiring about his sister's well-being. The butler informed him that Miss Wang Zai still refused to see anyone, expressing his hope that she would eventually move on. Wang Ying was relieved to hear the news, and instructed the man to leave Lu Rengia to him. He then walked away, but his words caused the man great concern. The man asked Wang Ying to wait a moment, reminding him not to destroy the base in the process. Several machines were activated and aimed at Lu Rengia. Wang Ying's voice echoed, informing Lu Rengia that he had brought some new toys. If he wished to meet his sister, he would first have to help test their power. Lu Rengia's eyes gleamed, and he smirked. He was about to acknowledge this unique welcome ceremony, and warn them not to expect mercy when a fist suddenly interrupted him. Grandmaster Huang struck him on the head, causing him to faceplint onto the ground. 
he scolded Lu Rengia, reminding him to be polite and wondering who had spoiled him so much. Lu Rengia, now lying face down on the ground, asked Grandmaster Huang why he had come. Grandmaster Huang informed him that Lao Kayan had sent him. As Grandmaster Huang lectured Lu Rengia, he emphasized that a girl typically finds a guy annoying when he's always pestering her. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia appeared utterly defeated. He attempted to argue that he simply wanted to ask something. But before he could finish, Grandmaster Huang began dragging him by the foot, reminding him they had business to attend to and needed to set off immediately. Wang Ying was momentarily speechless, realizing that the old man who had effortlessly silenced Lu Renjia with a single punch must be Grandmaster Huang the strongest figure in Dragon City. Fast forward to the present at the Tianfu base, where Sinan and Lu Rengia had just completed their escort mission. The receptionist congratulated them and handed over a bag of gold. Lu Rengia, still wearing his tattered coat, lifted the bag and questioned Sinan about the bounty, asking whether it was substantial. Sinan, smiling proudly, gave him a thumbs up and informed him that it would be enough to purchase at least 10 tops. The receptionist explained that they had received a bounty above the quota of a white silver level escort mission because the reward had been quite generous. With that information, Lu Rengia inquired whether the bounty was enough to buy a motorcycle. When the receptionist asked if he was looking for something similar to Sinan's motorcycle, and informed him that he was still far from affording one, Sinan suddenly coughed aggressively, as if something had jabbed his insides. Sinan appeared drained of life as he bid farewell to his beloved Rolls Royce II and told it to rest in peace. The receptionist chimed in, asking if he planned to purchase a new bike. Clearly scheming, she sounded overly delighted while offering them a better paid escort mission. Lu Rengia, fuming with anger, instantly declined, accusing her of plotting something and attempting to get him in trouble once more. As Lu Rengia began walking out the door, the receptionist tried to persuade him by mentioning that the mission was related to an aboriginal and that the bounty was quite lucrative. However, Lu Rengia dismissed her, stating that he had encountered many aboriginals and that such missions were readily available. He even boasted that he could accept two missions simultaneously. The receptionist's face turned serious as she informed Lu Rendia that the commissioners were from a base near Dragon City and had been attacked by demonic beasts on their way to Fish City. She added that one of them had escaped to the Tianfu base, requesting the Union to send an escort mission to find her missing sister, Wang Zai. The receptionist successfully captured Lu Rengia's attention, prompting him to turn around with a serious expression and ask her to repeat what she had just said. Prior to the catastrophe, a number of the most influential nations constructed shelters and bases designed to preserve human civilization. As the apocalypse unfolded, humanity narrowly avoided the potential disaster of extinction by utilizing these shelters, thus maintaining the remnants of human civilization. Many years later, when humans finally emerged from their shelters, they discovered survivors living in a world filled with uncertainty and radiation. These survivors were referred to as otherworldly humans, while those who emerged from the shelters proudly identified themselves as aboriginals. Responding to the pleas of the otherworldly humans, the aboriginals, who retained advanced technology, employed it to construct shelters for the otherworldly humans, enabling them to reside in the new world dominated by demonic beasts. The otherworldly humans struggled to adapt to the altered environment and seldom ventured outside. Yet they possessed vital technology and knowledge that offered hope for rebuilding human civilization. Consequently, they were regarded as the best and brightest in the new world. At the Tianfu base, several individuals, including one who appeared to be a high-ranking official, were bowing to a person clad in what resembled an astronaut suit. This individual reassured someone on a call that they would find a way to rescue her before ending the call by clicking a button on their handheld radio. The person in the protective suit, Wang Yin, expressed frustration with the officials, inquiring about the length of time he would have to wait for sufficient escorts and deeming their base ineffective. One of the officials placated Wang Yin, asking him to remain calm and explaining that there was a current shortage at the Tianfu base. The official gestured toward his troops and informed Wang Ying that the mission announcement had been issued and they had urgently contacted the fish base for assistance. Gold-level escorts were expected to arrive in a few days to support the mission. Wang Ying, however, insisted that he could not afford to wait and asked the existing escorts to set off first. The official agreed to make the necessary arrangements promptly and bowed meekly, pressing his hands together. As the officials endeavored to guide Wang Ying, Lu Rengia positioned himself in front of him, donning his new coat's hood and a red scarf wrapped around it in his neck. The official became alarmed, suspecting Lu Rengia to be an assassin, and promptly ordered his troops to form a protective barrier around Lord Wang Ying. 
In response, multiple spears were aimed at a bewildered Lu Rengia. Meanwhile, Sinan was frantically rushing to Lu Rengia's side in an attempt to defuse the tense situation. He introduced himself as Sinan Pei, a white-level escort, and presented Lu Rengia as his companion. Although spears remained pointed at the pair, Sinan gripped Lu Rengia's shoulders, apologizing profusely and explaining that it was Lu Rengia's first visit to the building which led to his confusion. When a member of the troops recognized Sinan as the individual rumored to have defeated Wu Kian, the official interjected, chastising Sinan and questioning whether the area was a place they could simply wander in and out of at will. He even warned them of the dire consequences that would follow if they disrupted Lord Wang Ying. To prevent further escalation, Sinan conceded and informed them of their intention to accept a mission. He then excused both himself and Lu Renjia, who was intently observing Wang Ying. As Sinan steered Lu Renjia away from the gathering, he whispered a reprimand to his master, who had disregarded his guidance regarding the meeting room's location. However, Lu Renjia nonchalantly admitted that he was not lost. Instead, he had deliberately sought a glimpse of Wang Ying upon hearing his name. Puzzled, Sinan inquired why Lu Renjia had suddenly decided to see Wang Ying, especially after claiming they were close acquaintances, to the extent that he disguised himself as a rice dumpling to avoid recognition. Lu Renjia remained silent, preoccupied with his own thoughts. He found something captivating and wondered aloud if the voice he heard belonged to Wang Ying. Assuming the question was directed at him, Sinan responded, asking how he could possibly know. As the duo walked away, the official called them back and instructed them not to accept any other missions, but rather join their team, emphasizing that their current mission held the highest priority at the base. Furthermore, they would be compensated for their efforts. Multiple escorts of different levels were venturing into the demonic beast forest. One of the lower-level escorts who has a bandage on his head was worried about attracting any demonic beasts, as there were so many of them and the white silver level escorts have ventured deeper into the forest. So his companion with the goggles comforted him, saying that they were only in charge on the periphery so it shouldn't be dangerous, and told the guy with the bandage to not jinx them. Someone shouted at them to cut the crap and kicked one of them in the butt. It was the official, and he was fuming while he instructed them not to miss a single corner. As Lord Wang Ying and his twin sister got separated when they were assaulted by a demonic beast nearby while Wang Ying was sitting on a chair being carried by the official's troops. The official drove away the escorts from the area while saying that the escort mission was a red-ranked escort rescue mission, so they would be generously rewarded if they could find the missing person. But they should not dare think of upgrading to the next level for their entire life if they fail. Meanwhile, Sinan was eliminating a demonic beast while discussing with Lu Rengia about the red-ranked rescue escort mission and how the number of demonic beasts has increased after they arrived. Lu Renjia just stood behind Sinan and did nothing as many escorts were with them, and Sinan told him that although they wanted to accept the mission, he got the feeling that they had encountered a gang, and Lu Renjia asked what a rescue escort mission was. Sinan turned to look at Lu Renjia and realized that he was only a black iron level escort, but then the both of them in unison, that he was the strongest while giving each other the thumbs up. Sinan began explaining that the delivery missions Lu Rengia accepts only uses the main road so he would hardly encounter any high-class demonic beasts. But in a rescue mission, one has to go into the dangerous wilderness so that was why. Only white silver level escorts or above could accept the mission. Sinan continued to explain that the red color represents paramount importance and extreme danger, and proceeded to ask Lu Rengia if he had not read the Union Handbook. To which Lu Rengia, who was now walking in a different direction and had his back turned towards Sinan, replied that he had just flipped through it because either way, he had also encountered quite a number of demonic beasts in his delivery missions. Sinan retorted that it was because Lu Rengia does not use the main road and also told him that he was going in the opposite direction the coordinates are directing them, to which Lu Rengia simply responded that he knew. Lu Rengia looked like he was staring into space when he told Sinan that dozens of people were looking for a needle in a haystack and it would take too long to find her, and then he trailed off. Sinan asked him what Lu Rengia meant, but he responded that it did not matter and told him to check something out. Both of them were looking at a melted trunk, which Sinan was surprised to see and asked if it was a transformation type ability, to which Lu Rengia replied that those were the traces left behind by the magnetic blast rifles that are used by the primitive guards so if they follow the traces, they should be able to find some clues. Lu Rengia told Sinan to follow him closely while Sinan told him to wait a moment as he feels a little flustered whenever he leads the way. All the while, 
A shadow hiding behind the bushes and the trees was observing them and listening to their conversations. When they arrived at the place where they traced back the traces, Sinan's face was sweating profusely while intently looking at something. It was like he could not believe what he was seeing. He marveled at the crash site of the car that was used by the primitives. Sinan shook Lu Renji's shoulders as he held onto them and when he was about to ask about the car, Lu Renji confirmed with an uninterested look on his face that it was indeed a Rolls Royce. Sinan's arms and legs turned to mush and he was blown away, saying that he had no regrets in his life now. While examining the car, Sinan asked Lu Rengia if he could lick the car but Lu Rengia did not answer his question and just told him that he was so annoying. As Lu Rengia touched and examined the traces further, he deduced that a fierce battle happened at the scene, and he asked himself what kind of demonic beast could leave such traces behind. He was now worrying about Little's eye. Lu Rengia opened the door and asked Sinan to come with him and find other clues. But Sinan seemed like he was not paying attention to Lu Rengia's instruction as he was busy marveling at how the car door was opened. All the while, the shadow from earlier was still observing them. The person lurking behind them let out a sinister smile. It was Wu Kayan with the left side of his face wrapped in bandage, including his eye. He looked at them with malicious intent. His veins popping out and eyes were glowing with rage as he mentioned Sinan Pei's name resentfully. A while ago, the Rolls Royce traversed through the road with multiple escorts in their motorcycles. Inside, Wang Ging was telling his sister, Little Tsai, that everyone was grateful that she was willing to come. But she did not have to join him on the mission and told her that it was good enough to take a stroll around the Dragon City. Wang Zai did not respond and was just looking in front of her, while Wang Ying glanced to check on her. He then asked the driver, A King, how far was the next base as Wang Zai might have to rest a while? A King told him to wait a while as he checked on his device. A map popped out of his device and he told Wang Ying that there was a third level base nearby called the Tianfu base, and they should be able to stay there for some time. As a Kang looked back at Wang Ying, asking if he should ask a Chang to inform the others later, a shadow appeared in front of the windshield. This startled Wang Ying and told him to watch out, but it was too late, their car had already hit one of the escorts in the motorcycle. The car swerved and fell off the road while trying to regain its control. They fell off the embankment and entirely shattered their windshield as they crashed into the trees. Wang Ying coughed and asked what was going on while Wang Xi thought they were in a car accident but she immediately withdrew her words when she realized something was wrong. She saw a Kang being impaled by something and raised into the air, while he was telling the both of them to run. It was one of those humanoid-looking beasts that was assaulting them. Wang Zai knelt to the ground as he looked up at the demonic beast that was looming over her. She said that it was not a demonic beast and asked herself what that thing was. Back to the present, Lu Rengia, who was searching the car for clues, found the device that a Kang used. He was staring at it intensely when Sinan approached and asked him if he found any clues, but immediately asked him what he was holding as soon as he noticed it. He was about to explain to Sinan what the device was but the official cut him off, asking them what they were doing and why did they separate from the main force to hide and slack off. The official has his entire squad behind him, including Wang Ying and Wu Kian on his side. He said that if Wu Kian had not suggested a rescue plan for them to come to the area, they would not have discovered the two of them and then told them to hurry up and return to the team. Sinan was confused about the rescue plan being mentioned. He gestured his hands towards Lu Rengia, and was about to explain their side, but Wu Kian interrupted him, saying it was bullshit. With a sinister look on his face, he questioned how a mere black iron could know what a bullet mark from a magnetic blast rifle looked like. Then he proceeded to conclude that Lu Rengia must have overheard his report to Wang Ying and rushed to the area immediately because Sinan Pei eagerly wanted to take credit and called him a despicable weasel. Sinan smirked and said that he understood the situation. He then immediately pulled out his gun and pointed it at Wu Kian, saying that he was there to look for trouble. Wang Ying stopped them before the situation could escalate further and reminded them that their top priority was to find his little sister as quickly as possible. Then he asked Sinan and Lu Rengia if the two of them found out about anything. Sinan was surprised when Lu Rengia told them that they did not find anything. He even told them that he was just a black iron level escort after all while glaring at Wang Ying. Wang Ying was speechless and the official started to console him again, saying that the low level escorts do not have much experience with teamwork and they are used to fooling around. He then proceeded to endorse his nephew, Wu Kian, to be assigned as the leader of the escort mission commanding the frontliners, saying that even though he was also a white-silver-level escort, he was quick-witted, 
has a vast amount of experience with teamwork missions, and he could come up with new and better ways to do things. All the while Wu Kian was maliciously grinning behind the official while introducing himself. Later, a demonic beast attacked two other escorts when Wu Kian jumped in to save them both by screaming at the beast and it fell to the ground in an instant. One of the escorts expressed his gratitude that Wu Kian came in time to save them. But the other one was not happy and criticized Wu Kian for not following the rules where a white silver escort should walk in front, while the other one was trying to stop him from saying such things. When Wu Kian heard what the other escort said, he was in a rage and kicked the escort, questioning and undermining him for teaching him what to do despite being just a black iron escort. He told him to scram when asked and to stop talking so much nonsense. He then yelled at them and bossed them to speed up their work searching for the primitives because if anything were to happen to Wang Zai, they were all doomed. As the rest of the escorts made their way, the official praised the proud Wu Kian and said that he was right to leave the leadership matter to escort Wu. Wu Kian turned and faced the official with a meek face, assuring them and saying that he would be sure to get rid of all the danger and rescue Wang Zai to which the official was satisfied with how he did things. The official stated that this was the first time that Tianfu base had been assigned an entrustment by a primitive so once the mission was over, it would definitely benefit the base and ensure Wu Kian that he would also be generously rewarded, to which Wu Kian was flattered. Wu Kian praised the official by saying that everything was thanks to his guidance but the official throwed back another compliment, saying that it was all because he was reliable and strong. All the while Lu Rengia and Sinan were observing them while the rest of the escorts went on their way. While still looking at the official and Wu Kian, Lu Rengia asked Sinan if they were trying to entertain each other, to which Sinan sighed and told him that he does not understand the mortal world. As the other two escorts made past Lu Rengia and Sinan, Lu Rengia noticed them and told them not to go in that direction. With a puzzled look, the escort asked Lu Rengia what he meant and told him that he should also hurry up. But before he could finish his words, a huge snake jumped out of the bushes in front of them, and they were extremely startled. The two of them hugged each other in fear while screaming for help. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia held Sinan's shoulders and told him to go get it as there were too many eyes around, and Sinan told him that he was afraid that they were already too late. But Sinan was not able to finish expressing his sentiments as Lu Rengia flung him towards the snake. All he could do was yell at Lu Rengia, asking if that was how he was going to attack the beast while Lu Rengia simply just wished him good luck. The snake and Sinan lied on the ground side by side and both of them had a lump on their heads when Lu Rengia approached them and showered Sinan with praises, saying that it was as expected of a white silver level escort for killing the demonic beast in an instant. The two escorts started to praise Sinan as well. One expressed how amazing Sinan was for saving their lives in just one blow, while the other agreed and added that they did not believe the rumors that he defeated Wu Kian but now they do. Despite being in pain, Sinan still managed to strike a pose while accepting their gratitude, and said that a little snake was just nothing to him. As Wu Kian saw them celebrating from a distance, he got pissed off and called on his team, which asked him if he wanted them to teach Sinan and Lu Rengia a lesson. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia advised the two escorts to go on the other road as it was much safer, in which the two escorts readily followed without any question even though they looked puzzled. When they were gone, Sinan asked Lu Rengia why he was not in a hurry and added if it was because of what he just found. And Lu Rengia nonchalantly responded that that was not really the reason as it was just a map commonly used among the primitives. All the while he pulled out the device and looked at it. As Lu Rengia tried to start explaining things, Sinan's chest bumped into his shoulder as Sinan was trying to cover the device with his body while looking at something and told him that they should talk about it later. In front of them was Wu Kian's team, holding spiky weapons and were calling for Sinan Pei. And Sinan told Lu Rengia that they should see what those guys have got to tell them. As the four of Wu Kian's crew crowded over Sinan and Lu Rengia, they told Sinan that he was getting pretty full of himself now that he was capable, and asked him if their appearance reminded him of how his bones were fractured. But Sinan did not succumb to their taunts and just told them that he knows how to count and to get straight to the point. The redhead with the mohawk told Sinan that their boss, Wu Kian, has instructed them to follow and investigate the traces of the demonic beasts and has recognized Sinan's ability, so he has allowed him to investigate deep into the forest of the Demon Mountain, and then he continued to taunt him by asking what he was waiting for and told him that he should express his gratitude to Wu Kian and then scram. Sinan stared at them intensely and retaliated by saying that the location was not the place where the traces were found and asked them if they had really decided to stand against him. The redhead told him to cut the crap as their top priority was the mission. He proceeded to ask Sinan if how could he guarantee that Miss Wang Zai did not choose a different route out of fear, 
when she got separated from Lord Wang Ying when they fell off the cliff, and he also asked if he could bear the consequences if anything was to really happen. The redhead told Sinan that Wu Kian makes the decision for everything now, then he trailed off and winked at his teammate. He then whispered that Sin and Pei would definitely not listen to them so they should take the chance to kill him. Sin and saw through their plan and told them that they were just finding an excuse to kill him, and in that case, he refused. But Lu Renjia turned his back from them and started walking away, saying that what they said was nice and told Sin and that they should head there, so Sin and was surprised. As Sin and turned to grab onto Lu Renjia's head, Lu Renjia calmly asked Sin and what was up and told him that they were supposed to go there anyway. But Sinan was in a rage, his eyes bulging out, asking Lu Renjia what was up with his head and informing him that they were roasting them. But Lu Renjia simply said that they were just picking on his fire. Lu Renjia then touched the unconscious snake and threw it in the air. He then acted surprised on why the demonic beast had awoken. With a mischievous look on his face, Lu Renjia told Sinan that he should take a step back and tolerate them, as seeing the bigger picture was more important. All the while, the snake he just flung into the air landed on Wu Kian's team, which made Sinan question his talk about tolerating them. Wu Kian was surprised when he saw his team squished under the unconscious snake. He yelled at them and bombarded them with questions, asking what they were doing and what would they have done if they had alerted Lord Wang Ying, then proceeded to question how did the demonic beast suddenly jump. As Sinan and Lu Renjia's silhouette from the distance caught his attention, he got pissed off more and said to himself that they should not think that they could escape just like that. Meanwhile, as Sinan and Lu Renjia were traversing through the forest, Sinan questioned Lu Renjia if they were going in the right direction as it was different from Lord Wang Ying's statements. But Lu Renjia told him that that man's words are unreliable, which surprised Sinan, who then asked why he did not capture him if there was something wrong with him. As Lu Renjia pulled out the device while they were making their way, he told Sinan that he did not have evidence so they could not just kidnap Wang Ying in front of the Union, and also, their priority was to find Wang Zai. The map popped out of the device as Lu Renjia told Sinan to check it out, to which Sinan was surprised at how Lu Renjia was able to use the device of the Aboriginals. Lu Renjia confidently told Sinan that there was nothing odd about it as he was once an Aboriginal soldier. And upon hearing this, Sinan tried to paint a picture of it in his mind but he could not imagine him being one with the erratic personality of his. Lu Renjia ignored his snide remarks and pointed at the map and said that it was the coordinate of a dedicated shelter left behind for the aboriginals before the catastrophe. He proceeded to say that Wang Zai was no fool so comparing to wandering in the forest aimlessly, she went to a safe place to wait for rescue. That information puzzled Sinan, so he asked Lu Renjia what were the traces of battle that they had been following, and as he said that, he stepped on a sticky white liquid on the ground. Lu Renjia face immediately turned serious as he answered Sinan's question, looking at the lifeless soldier wrapped in white strings. He told Sinan that those traces came from them. He said that they risked their lives to lure the assailants with all their might for Wang Zai's safety, and Sinan asked if the gooey liquid came from the demonic beast that assaulted them. Lu Renjia looked gloomy as he looked down at the corpse, saying it was perhaps the assailant, but they had not seen similar traces at the scene. Lu Renjia knelt into the ground and touched the gooey liquid, then he paid his respects to the corpse, wishing for them to rest in peace and told them that they had worked hard enough. Meanwhile, Wu Kian had been hiding in the bushes with a sinister smile on his face. He had been spying on them again, and he was ecstatic that Sinan and Lu Renjia had found more clues. He said that he was thinking of getting rid of them in that deep forest without them realizing and did not expect to gain anything. Wu Kian was startled when one of his crew screamed and called for him. He then reprimanded him for bawling as he could attract high-class demonic beasts. But as Wu Kian looked up and saw a gigantic spider demonic beast who had already captured one of his crew, his face was filled with terror as he realized the danger of the situation he was in. Lu Renjia raised the map into the air as he told Sinan that Wang Zai should be nearby so they should get a move on. And Sinan, who was observing him, was perplexed by his actions, and questioned if he had to raise and shake the device every time in order to look at the map and Lu Renjia told him that he does because he would gain inspiration after shaking the device for a while. Sinan grabbed the device from Lu Renjia's hand. He then gestured towards his left and told Lu Renjia that it was where the northwest was. And then he told Lu Renjia that he made him very anxious and the shaking also gave him a headache, to which Lu Renjia did not retaliate, 
and just told him that he could have the device. Something caught Lu Renji's attention. Then a loud sound suddenly echoed through the forest which surprised the two of them. Sinan looked scared as he told Lu Rengia that the sound gave him goosebumps, while Lu Rengia looked puzzled and questioned if what they heard was Wu Kian's voice. He also asked why a battle happened nearby, to which Sinan replied that he does not know and added that it was best if Wu Kian died. Lu Rengia told Sinan that they should go and take a look as they probably have encountered a demonic beast, to which Sinan sighed and with a heavy heart, he agreed to go as it was the rules of the union. Meanwhile, Wu Kian and his crew were fighting the beast and one of his crew worried about him as he fell to the ground when the beast attacked. They were backed into a corner and were terrified when they realized that physical attacks do no harm to the beast. They all stared at the beast that had its mouth full of blood and pondered within themselves if that was what the deep forest of the demon mountain was like and were contemplating on what they should do. They were frozen in place when the beast spewed its web at them. But then a bullet came into the rescue and destroyed the web just in time before it hit them. With Lu Rengia just standing idly behind him, Sinan stood proudly behind Wu Kian and his crew, and told them to take a guess if he did miss his shot, then proceed to ask them what they were doing in the area. Wu Kian looked maniacal as he turned and saw Sinan holding onto the device. The beast was now charging towards them and Wu Kian's crew started to panic and screamed that the beast was coming. Hearing this, Wu Kian approached Sinan and offered that they had to temporarily join forces due to the circumstances, to which Sinan was not happy but could not refuse due to the rules of the union. Malice immediately filled Wu Kian's face as he went behind them and sneaked an attack by screaming that them teaming up would never happen, and this startled both Sinan and Lu Rengia. Sinan was blown away by that attack and he dropped the device in the process. Wu Kian immediately picked up the device. He looked delighted as he looked at the clue that Sinan and Lu Rengia found, and as he was saying that with the device in his hand, he no longer had any use for the two of them. Someone called out to him. While Wu Kian was squatting with the device in his hands, Lu Rengia was shrouded with dark aura as he approached him, saying that Sinan came all the way just to save Wu Kian, so he was being too much. Lu Rengia was glaring daggers as he asked Wu Kian how he wanted to die, but his expressions immediately switched to a concerned one as he heard Sinan crying out to him for help. Sinan was now wrapped up in the beast's thread and was only a few inches away from its mouth. He was screaming at Lu Rengia, telling him to save him first and ask Wu Kian later, to which Lu Rengia retorted that he had only said two sentences and he was already being wrapped by the beast. He questioned how he could have given in so quickly. While Lu Rengia was preparing to fight, Wu Kian and his crew had started running away. They questioned what a black iron level escort could do and told them to stay and focus on dealing with the demonic beast, to which Lu Rengia responded that they could not just run away. He jumped from the ground and was preparing a punch as he told them that he would settle the score with all of them later after he deals with the beast. All the while, Sinan was yelling as he tried to remind Lu Rengia to not go all out and avoid attacking him. All of a sudden, something caught Lu Rengia's attention that made him stop his attack. An ornament with a jade pendant was hanging on one of the beast's legs which Lu Rengia recognized. While Sinan was still wrapped by the beast's tread and was hanging by its mouth, Lu Rengia said that it was Wang Zai's jade emblem that was hanging on its legs. And that kind of demonic beast likes to build its nest nearby, so it was not the right time to kill it. Then he proceeded to grab onto the beast's two front legs and rip them out. Sinan, who was now swaying as the beast wriggled in pain, asked Lu Rengia what did he meant and Lu Rengia told him that he chopped both of its legs so it would escape to its nest immediately. As the beast turned to run away, Lu Rengia continued to explain that they should be able to find its nest if they followed it, in which Sinan hollered and asked what would happen to him. As he sat at the top of a branch, Lu Rengia was silent for a moment, then he told Sinan that he got to hang in there for a while. Wang Zai was inside a shelter and was curled up on top of some storage boxes. As she observed that there had been no movement outside for a long time, she stood up and picked up a weapon as she contemplated if the demonic beast had already left. She clicked a button on her helmet and a system notified her that the scanning of her surroundings was completed and there were no radioactive biosignals detected. Wang Zai let out a sigh of relief when she heard the system notification, and she felt fortunate as the shelter she was in used to be an armory, so she was able to arm herself before going out. She then strengthened her resolve to go out by thinking that her brother and the others might still be in danger, so she could not stay there waiting to die. As she reached out to the console to open the door, she kept talking to calm herself down, saying that she was not sure if Long Cheng's side had received the news and how long the reinforcements would take to come. But as the door started to open, she could not help but admit to herself that she was scared. As her system's scanning resumed, she started to contemplate on what she should do if the demonic beast decides to come back. 
With the danger she was facing, she immediately remembered someone she used to rely on and said that if that brat was still around, she would not have been scared. She then blamed herself and sighed, wondering where he could have gone. She was continuing to talk to herself when the system interrupted her with warnings. This immensely startled Wang Zai. The system gave her a warning that it had detected a radiating organism approaching her location at high speed. And Wang Zai did not have time to do anything but scream as she saw the huge demonic beast in front of her. Following the warning, the system also gave her a notice that combatants were also approaching, and as Lu Rengia landed on the beast's body and squashed it, the system identified him as well. Lu Rengia called out to Wang Zai who looked relieved to see him. As Wang Zai was about to ask Lu Rengia why he was there, she got startled and screamed when Sinan fell into the ground head first his body still wrapped by the beast's threats. There was a moment of silence as Wang Zai stared at Sinan who had his head thrusted to the ground and his feet in the air. Sinan immediately regained his composure and introduced himself as Sinan Pei, a silver level armed escort, and then he proceeded to shower Wang Zai with flattering words, saying that he was blessed to have met an exceedingly beautiful lady like flowers in the moon, and how he would take the dart aimed at her in order to save her and successfully fulfill his mission. Wang Zai was dumbfounded, and she just stared at Sinan, then she fainted. Lu Renjia immediately caught her in his arms. Worry was written all over his face as he tried to talk to her and asked her what was wrong. Sinan who was standing beside them was fidgeting, asking if what happened was his fault. Wang Zai was profusely sweating as she lay unconscious when her system started analyzing her situation, and indicated that there was a loss of consciousness due to high body temperature and an unstable mental state but there were no presence of wounds or radiation pollution. As the system finished its analysis and suggested to deal with the slight fever, Lu Rengia looked a bit relieved when he realized that the cause of her fever was that she was extremely nervous and suddenly relaxed when they arrived. Wu Kayan was now leading Wang Ying, the official, and the rest of the escort towards the deep forest of the demonic mountain. He was explaining that following the footprints could predict which direction Wang Zai was headed for, and then he proceeded to slander Sinan's name by twisting the story of what happened earlier, saying that he was forced to rescue Sinan because of the rules of the alliance, but he was desperate to steal merit and dared to act rashly in order to attract high-level demonic beasts. While holding the device he stole in his hand, Wu Kayan told the official that it hurts for him to have lost two of their brothers, but he had no choice but to retreat first and request reinforcements, and the official gave him comfort, saying that it was nothing to bother, as with the addition of the Alliance's support, they should be able to take down the demonic beast. When the official asked Wu Kayan where Sin and Pei was, Wu Kayan's expressions twisted into an evil grin as he told the official that he presumes that both Sinan and his little follower have met their deaths in the mouth of the beast. As the official said that it was a pity that his Tianfu base would not gain another silver level escort, the bushes near them started to rustle. Everyone, including Wu Kayan was startled, and the official panicked and immediately gave orders to his troops to protect their boss, Wang Ying, as there was movement up ahead. Looking crisp and unscathed, Sinan emerged from the bushes while carrying Wang Zai in his arms, and then he told the escorts to not be afraid as he, the silver level escort Sinan Pei, had rescued Miss Wang Zai safely under the mission. Wu Kain was flabbergasted that his eyes were almost falling out of their sockets. He was also puzzled on how Sinan managed to survive the demonic beast that was above his grade. He was sweating profusely as he tried to calm himself down, telling himself to think about what happened. As he asked himself if he missed out on something, a sinister silhouette appeared behind Sinan. It was Lu Rengia, who was emitting an ominous aura as he gave him a menacing grin, telling him that it was very nice to meet him. As Lu Rengia stood there, resembling a demon peering into someone's soul, Wu Kayan started crying, with snot and saliva running down his face. He touched his injuries, recalling the painful memory of how he got them. The official asked Wu Kayan what was wrong, but he could not communicate properly, only uttering unintelligible words. Lu Rengia looked menacing, and as he took a step forward, Wu Kayan became terrified, screaming for him to stay away and not come any closer. Consequently, Wu Kayan peed his pants, which the official and his troops immediately noticed due to the smell. However, before they could properly ridicule Wu Kayan for wetting himself, Lu Rengia's fist landed on his face, sending him flying. Wu Kayan collided with a tree several meters away from where he had been standing and fell unconscious, much to everyone's surprise. Blood oozed out of Wu Kayan's nose, horrifying the official who immediately ordered his troops to defeat Lu Rengia for attacking an escort. The troops swiftly surrounded Lu Rengia, who, prepared to fight, tauntingly asked if they all wanted to die that badly. Lu Rengia displayed an evil grin as he was about to launch an attack, 
but his expression changed into a meek one once Wang Zai called out his name. She told him not to create a scene, and he immediately complied, putting his hands back in his pockets. Although sulking, he told the troops they should consider themselves lucky. Meanwhile, Wang Ying informed the official that his sister was not looking well, so he would like to take her back first. Wang Ying stared intently at his sister as Lu Renjia approached her and asked Sinan if she was dreaming about something. Back at the camp, Wang Zai lay peacefully in bed while Sinan and Lu Renjia kept watch over her. With concern etched on his face, Sinan reminded Lu Renjia that he had said he wanted to lay low and not expose his powers, as many people were spying on them. Just as Sinan was about to ask if what he did was to help him out, Lu Renjia interrupted. Lu Renjia admitted that he had been so focused on beating them up that he had forgotten about hiding his powers. He then assured Sinan that his identity would not be revealed. Upon hearing this, the concerned Sinan became enraged claiming that it seemed like Lu Renjia only wanted to get rid of him, and his head still bore the bruise from hitting the snake. In the midst of their commotion, Wang Zai awoke, searching for Lu Renjia, who responded that he was merely listening to a fool's complaints. Despite answering her, Wang Zai still continued to look for Lu Renjia, insisting that she wanted to apologize about Uncle Mo and Aunt Wong. Lu Renjia merely smiled when he realized that Wang Zai was just talking in her sleep and affectionately called her silly. However, when Wang Zai suddenly said that she was thirsty and wanted water, Lu Renjia's expression changed in an instant, and he looked irked, complaining that she was still asking for stuff even when dreaming. Meanwhile, Wang Ying was standing outside the tent with a guard, and Lu Renjia remarked that it had been so many years, but nothing had changed at all. At the time when Wang Ying and Wang Zai were escaping from the demonic beast that assaulted their convoy, brave soldiers sacrificed themselves to ensure their safety. One of them even bid farewell to their young master and miss, as they died by detonating a bomb in their hands while being impaled by the beast. Wang Zai believed they had gotten rid of it, but Wang Ying informed her that it was only for a short period of time. He then called for the soldier named Ozzy and commanded him to protect Wang Zai while escorting her to the nearby armory ruin. Upon hearing the order, Ozzy confirmed his understanding. Wang Ying said he would be distracting the beast away from them, which greatly worried Wang Zai. She protested and opposed the idea, wanting to leave with her brother, but the soldier had already ushered her away and told her they had to leave quickly. Wang Ying stood guard near a tree with a gun in his hands. He instructed Wang Zai to hide after she reached the ruin and assured her not to worry, as he would come to look for them after distracting the beast. He also mentioned that there should be someone nearby at the Longcheng base. Gazing upon Wang Zai, who was reluctant to leave, Wang Ying told her that he wouldn't say much but firmly believed he would be able to find her very soon. In the present, Wang Zai was still lying on the bed, asking for water as she was thirsty, while Lu Renjia reiterated what she said to Sinan. Sinan grabbed the horns of his cloak and criticized him for complaining that she was always asking for favors when he did the same thing too. Lu Renjia refuted Sinan's statement, saying he had no choice as he couldn't leave the place. Sinan immediately asked if it was because of Wang Ying and added that hearing Lu Renjia say those things made him feel strange. Lu Renjia confirmed this and admitted that he just wanted to take a look at what Wang Ying was doing at first. Sinan looked baffled, finding it hard to believe what Lu Renjia had just said. He reminded Lu Renjia that he had happily beat up Wu Kai and so Wang Ying would no longer act rashly, having lost his strength. Nonchalantly, Lu Renjia shrugged and said that it was the perfect time to do it, while Wang Zai was in that state. He explained that he could handle that kind of guy anytime, but his priority was to ensure her safety, so he needed to stop Wu Kai from disturbing him for now. Unable to argue with what Lu Renjia said, Sinan fell silent. Unexpectedly, Sinan mentioned that he used to be the servant of the eldest daughter, and he could slightly understand Lu Renjia's feelings, which made Lu Renjia smile. However, the atmosphere turned gloomy as Lu Renjia empathized with Sinan for having to deal with a lot in the past. Sinan agreed, saying that certain memories were coming back to him at the moment. Deciding not to dwell on it further, Lu Renjia changed the topic by asking Sinan if he was going to fetch the water. Sinan confirmed that he would and added that a good idea had come to his mind. Meanwhile, Wang Ying stood near the camp, talking to someone on his handheld radio. He seemed to be reporting the situation and said that he would act accordingly. After ending the call, Wang Ying noticed Lu Renjia leaving the tent with a barrel on his back. Emerging from the bushes, Wang Ying reunited with the others, overhearing the official asking one of his troops about where Lu Renjia was going, as they still needed to settle the matter about the attack on Wu Kian. The troop replied that he was fetching water for the lady, who wasn't feeling well. The official wore a condescending expression as he declared that Lu Renjia couldn't do anything even if he tried to run. Upon hearing this, Wang Ying's eyes gleamed, and he smiled evilly. Wang Ying entered the tent and instructed the guard to stand watch outside. He immediately approached Wang Zai, who was lying on the bed, and pulled out a syringe-like device. His face twisted into a sinister expression as he raised the device, preparing to plunge it into Wang Zai. 
Just as the device almost reached Wang's eye, the guard caught Wang Ying's arm and told him not to move. The guard admitted that he hadn't expected the pair of glasses to be useful, and had been contemplating whether Wang Ying's motive was to steal something from Wang Zai. After pondering, the guard confessed that he never thought Wang Ying would actually attack her, and then called him a piece of trash. The guard removed his cap, which had been covering his face, and it turned out that the guard was Lu Renjia all along. He then asked Wang Ying what his original plan was and if cosplaying as Wang Ying was fun. Meanwhile, the guard whose uniform Lu Renjia had stolen was tied up somewhere in the bushes, wearing only his socks and underwear. At the same time, Sinan, who was wearing Lu Renjia's cloak, was traversing through the forest searching for something while wondering if anything had happened to his master. He pulled off his hood as he looked through the device with the map, hoping that things would work well so Lu Renjia could look up to him. Suddenly, a beeping sound caught Sinan's attention, and he sighed sadly as he realized that what Lu Renjia said was right. He found the lifeless Wang Ying leaning back against a bloody tree trunk with a hole through the side of his abdomen, and Sinan thought that it was too late for him. Respectfully, Sinan knelt on the ground and paid his respects to Wang Ying. He even assured him that he and his master would definitely take care of Wang Zai, as she was too pretty to be an ordinary person. As Sinan drooled, he indulged himself in his imagination, picturing Wang Zai having a favorable impression of him if she received his care and concern while feeling downhearted about her brother's departure from their world. However, a cube-shaped device fell out of Wang Ying's hands, which made Sinan panic and begin to apologize for imagining the impossible. He then promised that he would immediately fetch water for Wang Zai. Sinan's apologies came to a halt when something caught his attention. He noticed that the device was projecting images, and as he approached the device to take a closer look at the projected images, his expression turned serious when he realized how grave the situation was. Abandoning the barrel that he was supposed to fetch water with, he ran towards the camp, shouting that he should quickly inform Lu Renjia. As Sinan ran and shouted for Lu Renjia to wait for him, a cluster of ice spikes flew in his direction, and blood was shed. Back at the camp, troops hurried inside the tent, attempting to arrest Lu Renjia. They ordered him not to move and to surrender for the offense of pretending to be in an alliance for nefarious purposes and for making a foolish attempt to attack Wang Ying. The official asked if he was Lu Renjia and reminded him how much of a serious offense an assault was, suggesting that he conduct himself appropriately. Lu Renjia sighed and paid the official and the troops no mind. Instead, he addressed the fake Wang Ying, telling him to come forward and attack him since more and more people surrounding them was a pain. He then revealed that even though he was not on good terms with Wang Ying, he had known him since they were young. Lu Renjia exposed that the one standing in front of them now was not Wang Ying, and he was not even a person. As he finished his sentence, the fake Wang Ying jumped behind, ready to pierce him with his spiky arms. The fake Wang Ying's face began to deform as it smiled maniacally and declared that it was his win. The troops were just staring, and Wang Zai remained unconscious while the fake Wang Ying tried to pierce Lu Renjia's chest with its spiky arm. Unfazed, Lu Renjia simply grabbed the spiky arm with his hand and broke it into two pieces, mocking the fake Wang Ying for having yelled earlier that he had won. Intrigued, the troops ogled at the fake Wang Ying as he told them to take a look at how it could change its appearance. He then explained that he had already told them earlier that the one standing in front of them was not Wang Ying and was not even a human. Initially, the troops and the official looked horrified but their expressions completely changed as they thought that it was a human's morphing ability, they looked amazed. Their reaction threw Lu Renjia into a fit of rage, saying that humans are hairless monkeys that have not been exposed to radiation, so they do not have any abilities. The official interjected by saying that ordinary persons are the ones with powers and asked how the ways of the world could be respected in the present day. Joining the conversation, one of the troops chimed in and asked if Lu Renjia was going to bully them just because they have never seen humans before. While everyone was distracted with the discussion, the fake Wang Ying, despite having just lost his right hand, seized the opportunity to lunge towards Wang Zai and pierce her with the syringe-looking device he was holding earlier. However, Lu Renjia noticed that it was trying to get past him to attack Wang Zai. Suddenly, Lu Renjia's eyes and hair turned scarlet, and the tent they were in got shredded as he told the fake Wang Ying not to underestimate him. The fake Wang Ying's helmet broke, and he crashed into a tree trunk. Panicking, the troops immediately surrounded and checked up on him. They grew worried that his helmet was broken, while some of them raised their weapons towards Lu Renjia, acknowledging that he was a strong black iron, and they commanded him not to move. Tiny spikes grew out of the fake Wang Ying's shoulders, which startled the troops that approached him. On the other hand, Lu Renjia remained where he was and stood guard in front of Wang Zai as he observed what was happening to the fake Wang Ying. Its body started to deform and began to grow another head, 
Both of its arms had completely transformed into spikes. The troops that had checked up on him earlier were now frozen in fear while Lu Renjia observed intently. Finally, it revealed its true form, the beast that had assaulted Wang Ying and Wang Xi's convoy. It was also a form that Lu Renjia was familiar with. The beast stood there cursing and stating that it had been exposed, while the troops in front of it trembled in fear. However, the tension among the troops immediately dissipated as one of them commented that it must have been the look of a human who has been exposed to the outside world. Another one added his speculation that it could have been the reason that humans have to wear protective clothing at all times. All the while, behind them was a pissed off Lu Rengia who had been listening to their nonsense and was now feeling like killing them all. The beast's eyes gleamed, and it declared that since it had been exposed, all of them must die. It then proceeded to lunge and attack one of the troops, who, frozen in fear, didn't have time to do anything but scream. Just in time, Lu Rengia appeared behind the troop and told him to get out of the way. Effortlessly, Lu Renjia managed to catch the beast's spiky arm while flinging the troop away from him. He then calmly told the beast that he had something to ask, so it should take things easy and be more composed. Subsequently, Lu Renjia's eyes and hair turned scarlet as he glared at the beast, demanding to know why it attacked Wang Ying and Wang Zai. As his flames intensified, he bombarded the beast with questions about why it pretended to be Wang Ying and what it wanted from Wang Zai. He then insisted that it answer him in a very detailed manner. By now, his eyes were bursting with flames and some of his clothes began to burn. He told the beast that he would allow it to have a faster and less painful death if it obediently complied. Upon seeing Lu Rengia's fist approaching, the beast began to plead for him not to come near. However, Lu Rengia showed no mercy and punched its shoulders. The impact instantly ripped them apart, leaving the beast with no option but to scream. In desperation, the beast confessed that it was merely following instructions and that it knew nothing about its purpose. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia's blaze continued, and he sinisterly grinned at the beast while stepping on one of its spiky legs. Anticipating the pain that was about to come, the beast's mouth hung open. Without further ado, Lu Rengia broke its spiky arm in half and asked if that action helped it recall something. The beast, screaming and writhing in pain, suddenly gulped and lunged towards Lu Rengia, telling him to go to hell. Unfazed, Lu Rengia caught its attack with ease and immediately ripped off the arm that dared to pierce him. With both of its arms gone, the beast lay on the ground screaming. Lu Rengia stood behind it, telling the creature to take its time since he could spend the entire day with them like this. As the beast told him to wait and tried to say something useful, its skull began to form lumps, as if boiling from the inside. Alarmed and recognizing the situation, Lu Rengia immediately dashed towards the beast and ripped something from its neck. As he moved past the beast, he held a cylindrical device in his hands, visibly annoyed. As the device beeped, he chastised the beast, commenting that they always like to self-destruct without saying a word, which was incredibly frustrating. The beast behind him exploded simultaneously as Lu Rengia crushed the device in his hands, which also erupted. Lu Rengia sighed, gazing at Wang Ying's helmet. He reminisced about the past when Wang Ying confronted him about getting close to Wang Zai. At that time, he had warned Lu Rengia to stay away from Wang Zai, feeling that he had been a little too enthusiastic about her. However, Wang Ying's reasoning confused Lu Rengia since he believed his actions were normal among friends. Subsequently, Wang Ying sternly reminded him of his identity and blatantly called him a mere alien, an outsider. As Lu Rengia held Wang Ying's helmet, he stared intensely at it, recalling the three of them, him, Wang Ying, and Wang Zai, playing together as children. He remembered Wang Ying's words that keeping his distance from Wang Zai was for his own good. Meanwhile, the troops in the vicinity cautiously made their way past Lu Rengia as if they were walking on eggshells. Next, Lu Rengia sat down on the bed where Wang Zai lay and stared into space, complaining about the tough circumstances and his lost clue. In the meantime, the cluster of ice spikes previously aimed at Sinan now impaled the ground. The person responsible for the attack praised Sinan for his speed. Injured, Sinan still held the cube in his hands while grasping a different, much larger gun. He complained about the pain he felt as he approached the camp, expressing gratitude for having his brother's pistol. Then, he cursed and wondered what level of power he had encountered. Determined, Sinan resolved to pass the information and the cube to Lu Rengia as soon as possible. He persisted in moving forward, telling Lu Rengia to wait for him. As Sinan traveled back to the camp, he remained alert when someone emerged from the trees in front of him, asking why he had returned in such a state after going to get water. Recognizing the person, Sinan immediately raised his gun to defend himself by attacking first. However, the individual beat him to it and struck him with a strange skill emanating from their mouth, which pierced his chest. Caught off guard, Sinan couldn't determine the nature of the ability that hit him. As he spat blood and fell to the ground, he contemplated the attack. Meanwhile, the person puzzled over why Sinan was wary of him and wondered if he had discovered something. 
Taking a step, the person noticed the cube device at his feet. Picking it up, he pressed a button to play and display the projections. The video displayed a Kang calling out for Wang Ying and asking for help, claiming someone was following him. Then, as Wang Ying let his guard down due to the confusion, since a Kang had already died, the a Kang in the video transformed into the beast and pierced through Wang Ying's stomach. Peering through the trees, the person in the back asked if Wang Ying was dead and where the girl was. The device's system took a closer image of the person, revealing the officer's face. He was commanding the beast and questioning why it was still in the area when the girl wasn't there. Furthermore, he asked how he was going to find Wang Zai in the vast mountain, calling his subordinates a bunch of useless people. As the video showed the officer instructing the beast to follow him to the Tianfu base, mentioning another way, he displayed an evil and eerie smile. He seemed amazed by the magical item the aboriginals possessed and was thankful he had ambushed Sinan first. Meanwhile, Sinan, who was lying on the ground, woke up and called the officer an old man, making him realize that Sinan was still alive. Deciding it was best to send Sinan to the afterlife, the officer was interrupted by his troops who came to inform him that Wang Zai's tent was now ready. They asked what he was doing in the area. The officer paused for a moment. When he turned to instruct his troops to carry the injured Sinan he found on the ground, there was no trace of the sinister expression he had just displayed. He instructed them to be careful while moving him for treatment, and his troops confirmed they understood. Calmly, the officer approached the tent that Wang Zai was in. However, as he entered the tent, he urgently called for Lu Renjia, saying that they had found Sinan unconscious near the camp and that he seemed to be dying. He urged Lu Renjia to quickly check on him. Worry was evident on Lu Renjia's face upon hearing what the officer said. But, when Lu Renjia arrived at the tent where Sinan was being treated, he was confused. The medical team reported that Sinan was fortunate to have dodged attacks that would have been fatal. Lu Renjia pondered and stated that it wasn't luck. He asked if the team could determine how Sinan was attacked. The team speculated that Sinan's injuries were frostbites, likely inflicted by a demonic beast. However, Lu Renjia appeared surprised as the team noticed a severe injury that was entirely different from the others. Back at the tent where Wang Zai lay unconscious, the official nonchalantly tossed the cube device, an evil grin plastered across his face. As he looked at Wang Zai condescendingly, he stated that it didn't matter how powerful she was, since she was still at his mercy. Moreover, he added that nobody would come to her rescue even if she screamed her throat out. Suddenly, he seemed to recognize his mistake, as if it were unintentional. He quickly corrected himself, clarifying that she couldn't shout because she was unconscious. His eyes filled with malice, the official gazed down at her while holding another syringe-like device in his hands. Regrettably, he mentioned that he was going to miss out on the fun. The official was taking his time preparing the syringe in front of Wang Zai, and was wondering if the mission he was doing was important for the higher-ups to want him to carry it out. He also wondered if the Lord would be satisfied with his performance once he completed the mission successfully. The official was laughing maniacally, thinking how sure he was that he could be transferred out of this barren place soon. But Lu Rengia suddenly appeared behind him, acknowledging how happy he seemed, and his face immediately twisted in surprise. At that moment, the official decided to launch a surprise attack. He started to breathe deeply to prepare his skill and fired it towards Lu Rengia. The attack hit Lu Rengia and landed on his forehead. The official wondered if his attack had hit Lu Rengia, although his expression was already expectant. He then started boasting about Lu Rengia faking his strength and how he would have killed him long ago if he had known that was the case. With little sparks of fire emitting from Lu Rengia, who seemed to be frozen in place, he suddenly spoke and asked if something had whizzed by. He said he did not see it clearly because it was so sudden. His head was now covered in flames that served as his protection from the official's attack. He said that he could not take his eyes off the official's ability as it was impressive. The official was startled that Lu Rengia was able to withstand his attack with his head. He cursed and began to transform, his body started bulging and ripping through his clothing. He then warned Lu Rengia to avoid being reckless as the aboriginal, Wang Zai, was still in his possession. The official grew in size, with multiple mouths all over his body. He was holding Wang Zai and threatening Lu Rengia, who was standing in front of him, that he would hit her until she vomited blood. He even added that he knew that Lu Rengia would notice the abnormal wound on Sinan, although he could not save her even if he had arrived. The official was about to say something when Lu Rengia interrupted him by asking if there was something wrong with him as he kept getting carried away even though he was so ugly. He then proceeded to threaten him by saying that he should let Wang Zai go at that moment. The official got taunted when he heard Lu Rengia say the word ugly and fired an attack through all the mouths that existed on his body. Lu Rengia did not move an inch, he just stood there and took all the attacks head on. 
There was a huge explosion as the officials attack hit Lurengia, which startled all the troops at the camp and made them wonder what was happening to the tent. Feeling victorious, the official explained that his ability was to compress the air in his mouth into a filamentary attack, and the Union was always punctual in strengthening his perfect physical body. He said that the countless mouths on his body could instantly increase his ability by hundreds of times, and that Lurengia would never understand the greatness of the tardigrades. Emerging from the blazing flames, Lurengia was intrigued by what tardigrades were and asked the official to tell him more about them in detail. In exchange, he would also introduce his ability. The sight of Lurengia unharmed greatly horrified the official who did not notice the thin red strips that were growing out of Wang Zai's shoulders. Lu Renjia snapped his hand, and in an instant, the arm that was holding onto Wang Zai got sliced out of nowhere. Then Lu Renjia said that his ability was blood. As the official writhed in agony from having his arm chopped off, Lu Renjia reminded him that he had earlier instructed him to release Wang Zai. Lu Renjia caught Wang Zai and asked the official if he thought he was foolish enough to leave her unguarded. He then explained to the official that he had marked her earlier for tracking purposes. Lu Renjia paused for a moment, pondering his words and wondering why they made him sound like a playboy. As he carefully laid Wang Zai on the ground, he decided to forget the matter as he had promised her safety. The official, now missing half his body, hysterically asked Lu Renjia what kind of monster he was. Lu Renjia stared at his hands and asked the official if he had indeed called him a monster. He then explained that he could control the blood in his body and use it to form armor to protect himself. He could also enhance the speed and strength of his physical body from the inside. As a demonstration, he punched the official in the gut, sending him flying through the air and coughing up blood. With blood oozing from Lu Renjia's claws, he added that he could release his blood to form tangible objects, such as weapons. However, doing so would deplete his blood reserves. As he slashed his claws through the official's body, he revealed this disadvantage. The official's veins popped out of his body, and he coughed up more blood. He knew he was about to die. While all this was happening, Lu Renjia heard a voice whispering the word monster. As he noticed Wang Ying's helmet lying on the ground, he saw that inside was Wang Ying's bloody face, whispering and calling him a monster. This reminded him of the time Wang Ying confronted him about being a mutant. He was surprised that Wang Ying was concerned about it, as they had grown up together and Wang Ying already knew he was a mutant. Wang Ying looked horrified as he reminded Lu Renjia of the fight and his abilities. He then told Lu Renjia that he did not see him as a mutant but as a monster and requested that he stay away from them for Wang Zai's safety. With sharp, bloody claws and blazing armor, Lu Renjia stood in front of the official and told him that he was the most unqualified person to call him a monster. The official was sweating with terror but also puzzled that Lu Renjia had not killed him yet. He asked Lu Renjia if he was not going to kill him. Grabbing the official's face, Lu Renjia told him that he was not willing to kill him, as he had finally met someone who could speak fluently after seeing his true form and who had not self-destructed yet. He figured the official's position in the group must be quite high. Lu Renjia leaned in and told the official that he was also an executive of the union and would hand him over for adjudication. He then threatened the official and demanded to know his purpose for entering the union and the plans of their group. Suddenly, ice spikes emerged from the ground behind Lu Renjia. He didn't have enough time to process what was happening before he dodged the cluster of ice spikes that aimed for him. The person who had attacked him said they would not let his plans come to fruition. Lu Renjia successfully dodged the ice spikes and was surprised that they were made of ice. He turned to look at the original target of the attack, the official, who was now encased in ice. The official immediately recognized his lord's silhouette standing behind him and asked him what he was doing there. The official frantically shared his knowledge with his lord about Lu Renjia's blood manipulation ability. He hoped that this information would spare him and give him another chance. But his lord, the masked person Lu Renjia was chasing, simply snapped their fingers, causing the ice to break apart. The masked person called the official annoying. Lu Renjia stood in front of the masked person who started a conversation by saying that the useless trash was gone. Huge ice spikes had grown behind the masked person, and it now looked like a mountain of crystals. Lu Renjia did not respond, just stared intently at the masked person. The masked person asked him where they were going to start while both his hands were surrounded by little blue glowing crystals. The masked person immediately waved his hands towards Lu Renjia, launching another attack filled with ice spikes. Ice spikes grew everywhere, and the bystander troops almost got hit by them. They had no idea what was going on as they were dazzled by the ice and couldn't see clearly. The temperature dropped without warning, and the troops were puzzled as to why they were feeling cold. The doctor who was tending to Sinan immediately commanded the troops to make a fire as they needed to keep the injured warm as soon as possible. The troops observed Wang Zai and were in awe that she was unaffected by the change in weather. They concluded that her power was definitely higher than the gold level. 
Little did they know that as Wang Zai's helmet started to freeze, the system had detected the excessively low temperature and automatically turned on the warming mode for her. Meanwhile, the masked person recognized Lu Renji's appearance as the platinum-level Crimson Shura of the Dragon City. He did not expect to meet such an interesting person as he only came to give a lesson to the brat who had ruined his plans. The masked person stood there confidently as if his victory was already ensured, saying that Lu Rengia was unfortunate for fighting against him, and he was expecting him to turn into an ice sculpture at the moment. How wrong and surprised he was when Lu Rengia burst out of the mountain of ice, blazing warm and unscathed. His surprise turned to annoyance as Lu Rengia leaped towards him to attack. He immediately burst out a gigantic shield made of ice to block Lu Rengia's punch. The masked person was surprised yet again as his shield shattered just after Lu Rengia punched it once. The masked person recognized how impressive Lu Rengia's power was but said that it was a pity. Right on cue, the arm that Lu Rengia used to punch the shield started to freeze. As the ice started to spread through Lu Rengia's head, the masked person said that it was useless for him to struggle as he had just touched his shield. The masked person was showing off his power by forming pretty ice crystals in the palm of his hand as he explained to Lu Rengia that the temperature of the body part that touched his shield would keep dropping until it freezes. So even if he was the Crimson Shira, he was still a blood-powered being that could not fight against him who has mastered the laws of nature. Lu Rengia struggled to move as half of his body had now turned to ice, wondering if he could dodge the masked person's attack if his body was frozen like that. The masked person threw a gigantic pillar of ice towards Lu Rengia, and told him to rest in peace. Lu Rengia was hit by the pillar head and was pushed back by its force. He was about to hit the troops nearby, and they panicked as soon as they saw that he was about to crash into them. But they did not have time to dodge him, they could only scream. The troops covered their heads with their arms, preparing for impact. But to their surprise, Lu Rengia stopped right before he hit them. The masked person was surprised once more as he saw how Lu Rengia stopped the force of the impact from pushing him any further and how Lu Rengia's fire started to blaze more fiercely. The troops were wondering who the person standing in front of them was and why he stopped when they heard and felt something different. Steam surrounded Lu Rengia as the ice in his body started to fizzle and melt, and the troops nearby were confused that the temperature around them started to increase. Lu Rengia's frozen body was now completely thawed, and intense flames were now surrounding him as he cursed the masked person and complained that the attack hurt. The masked person was taken aback as he saw his ice start melting. He was baffled as to why it was happening, as he stared at Lu Rengia, who was glaring at him while burning intensely, and how his force field of flames instantly melted his ice. He compared him to a demonic beast but immediately corrected himself when he felt his terrifying coercion, saying that he was like a demon god. The masked person just stood there and gazed at Lu Rengia intently. Then he burst with delight, gushing about how perfect and incredible Lu Rengia was and how he felt like he was in a dream. Lu Rengia was baffled by the masked person's reaction. The masked person was now questioning why someone as perfect as him would degrade to being with the mediocrities of the firebase. Then the masked person started to analyze how Lu Rengia's blood ability was able to form the flame. When he heard something that sounded like a drumbeat, he came to the conclusion that Lu Rengia was igniting the flame in the air by pumping out the heat of recycled blood at high speed. The masked person stared at Lu Rengia intently and then his face turned into a perverted one. He gushed about how wonderful, exquisite, and matchless Lu Rengia's ability was and that he envied it. Lu Rengia was still baffled about the masked person's reaction. He was thinking that the masked person was going insane. He instructed the troops behind him to hurry up and take Wang Zai away to a safe place. One of the troops was caught off guard and intimidated but nevertheless agreed to do what was asked. Lu Rengia then confronted the masked person and told him that he had seen him in Jangwa town on the projection board that was in Dr. Kai's basement, which kept on showing the masked person's missionary preaching. At first, the masked person did not seem to remember where the location was, but then he remembered that it was the town where he lured the high potential girl, Miss Yu Rong. And then he sounded delighted to know that Lu Rengia was there as he was finally able to put the pieces together. He was confused as to why Dr. Kai Like, who took the tool that he gave, would be killed by the trash white silver level man, Sinan, that he found. But now that he knew that Lu Rengia was there, it all made sense. Lu Rengia continued to confront the masked person and told him that he found some records regarding the Dragon Gate Escort Agency case that happened at the Fish City base. The masked person initially wondered how Dr. Kai was able to keep records but then proceeded to tell Lu Rengia that his suspicions were right and that he clearly remembered what happened a year ago, when two gold-level trash desperately protected their parcel and nearly caused the mission to fail. The masked person glared menacingly at Lu Rengia as he taunted him by admitting that he had to kill the two escorts himself. Without any warning, a gigantic fist hit the masked person, who did not have any time to react. 
He was pushed back but still managed to laugh when he realized that Lu Rengia was mad because of what he said. He arrived at such a conclusion as he saw that Lu Rengia grew four more arms on his back, and the flames that were surrounding him grew even fiercer. The masked person froze the damaged part of his body as he looked at Lu Rengia, his eyes wide and filled with excitement and admiration as he felt Lu Rengia's strong, gorgeous aura that was stronger than before. He laughed as he realized that he could not possibly win against him, especially with his hand broken. Lu Rengia's flames were now burning wildly as the masked person kept on taunting him, asking if he wanted to kill him. As Lu Rengia stretched out his arms to deliver another punch to the masked person, the masked person asked him how badly he wanted to kill him. When Lu Rengia's fist was only a few inches away from the masked person's face, he said that it was a shame and then launched an ice attack that missed Lu Rengia. The masked person was actually aiming for the two troops that were running away from the battle. The one who was carrying Wang Zai on his back did not notice the impending danger, while the other one who was dragging Sinan on the ground was able to notice the ice spikes and warned his companion about them. The ice spike was approaching them at high speed, and when the one carrying Wang Zai noticed, the spikes were already so close that all he could do was say that he did not want to die yet. As the ice spikes closed in on them, Wang Zai regained consciousness. She was surprised and did not know what was going on when she was greeted by the cluster of ice spikes. But before the spikes could reach them, Lu Renjia immediately came to their rescue and shattered the spikes with his punch. Wang Zai was startled when she saw Lu Renjia. Her eyes were filled with compassion and worry as she called out to him, asking why he was mad again, but Lu Renjia did not respond. The masked person, who now had half his body frozen, said that he expected Lu Rengia to choose to save the group of trash rather than continuing to attack him. He added that if Lu Rengia had only continued to attack him, he might have been able to kill him, which was a pity. The masked person grew wings made of ice, and as he ascended into the skies, he told Lu Rengia that he felt pity for his wonderful talent. The masked person looked down on him and told him that he was a bit disappointed in him. He then told Lu Rengia that he had lost the chance to catch him as he made sharp ice crystals rain down on them. The troops panicked as they saw that the crystals were coming at them. All the while, the masked person kept on taunting Lu Rengia and asked what his relation was to the gold level escorts, then decided to share some more details with him. He then condescendingly looked down on Lu Rengia, saying that he froze them into popsicles and then smashed them slowly. That statement made Lu Rengia more furious, and his flames blazed out uncontrollably, almost hitting Wang Zai who was standing near him, it was a good thing the troop grabbed her in time to dodge the flames. The masked person was surprised that Lu Rengia was still able to increase his power. He was amazed and thought about how he could further stimulate him and play with him when he realized that Lu Rengia's powers changed based on emotion. At the time the masked person was thinking, Lu Rengia punched the ground to propel himself into the air and launched an attack. Lu Rengia's speed was too fast, which caught the masked person off guard. But as Lu Rengia's punch was about to reach the masked person, his body began to dissolve like ice being crushed. Only his face remained intact, but the masked person still kept on telling Lu Rengia that he was really interesting. But it was a shame that he had lost his chance to kill him because he delayed the precious moments just to protect other people. With the last remaining parts of him disappearing into thin air, the masked person bid Lu Rengia farewell and told him that they would see each other next time, while Lu Rengia was left in the air, unable to do anything. The troops were discussing if everything was over and if they needed to show their appreciation to Lu Rengia when he landed. As Lu Rengia stared at his hands, one of the troops said that he did not want to show his appreciation as he was already shaking just by seeing Lu Rengia's legs and stomach. He said that Lu Rengia was ugly and asked what kind of monster he was, but the other reprimanded and stopped him from saying such things, reminding him that Lu Rengia had just saved them. Wang Zai immediately reached out to Lu Rengia and hugged him from behind, requesting for him to calm down. Right at that moment, Lu Rengia's fires were extinguished, leaving a dejected Lu Rengia in plain sight. Lu Rengia tried to tell Wang Zai about Wang Ying, but she interrupted him by apologizing, tears showing at the corners of her eyes despite them being shut. Multiple areas of the forest were now engulfed in flames. The escorts were scouring the area, looking for injured people, and they found Wu Kian. While one of the troops instructed those carrying Wu Kian to move him to a ventilated area, and told the rest that they could leave now, one of the escorts carrying Wu Kian commended him for being able to sleep soundly in the current situation. Wang Zai and Lu Rengia sat on the ground side by side as the troops were busy doing head counts and accounting for missing people. Wang Zai glanced at Lu Rengia, who was staring into space and looked gloomy. Seeing Lu Rengia's expression, Wang Zai hugged his brother's helmet and sulked. Then both of them apologized to each other at the same time, which made Wang Zai look at Lu Rengia with surprise written all over her face. Lu Rengia continued to apologize to her about her brother and for coming too late. Wang Zai told him that it was not his fault, as he was no longer their guard, 
And in fact, she should be thanking him because if he had not arrived in time, she might have been killed too. It was Lu Renji's turn to be surprised and look at the sulking Wang Xi when she told him that he could blame her. She said that everything was all her fault because he wanted to follow them out, her brother and the rest of their soldiers were killed because they wanted to protect her. She added that it was the same for Uncle Mo and Aunt Wong, she confessed that she was the one who caused them to be killed as guarding the escort's parcel together was not actually their mission and that she personally asked them to guard the parcel as she felt the journey would be unsafe. She was now crying, saying that she did the same thing to her brother by begging him to bring her because she heard that there was a clue about the incident. So she thought that if she could find some clues, maybe Lu Renjia would be willing to forgive her. As she began to wallow in self-pity, telling herself that she was incompetent, Lu Renjia interrupted her by bonking her head. Wang Xi's system immediately analyzed the extent of the hit and concluded that it was a minor one. All the while, Lu Renji aside and explained to Wang Xi that Uncle Mo was the strongest escort of the Dragon Gate Escort Agency, and they encountered an accident while guarding the parcel because the agency misjudged the enemy's strength. Lu Renji's face turned serious as he continued to say that he could not possibly blame her because what happened only proved that Wang Xi was right in thinking that the journey was unsafe, and thanks to her, the enemies had exposed themselves. As troops and escorts examined the official's carcass, Lu Renji told Wang Xi to leave the matter to him, and he gave her his word that they would soon be able to successfully take revenge for Uncle Mo, Aunt Huang, and her brother. Wang Xi leaned into Lu Renji's shoulders, she looked relieved that the tension between them had been resolved and told him that it had been a while since they had seen each other. Lu Renjia gently smiled as he agreed with what Wang Xi had just said. Both of them were startled, and Wang Xi jerked into a proper sitting position as Sinan jolted out of his bed, calling out for Lu Renjia, screaming that it was dangerous and that he had to show him the square box. When he found Lu Renjia, Sinan launched a verbal onslaught about the chief steward being suspicious, about an ice man attacking him in the forest, and about how he thinks that it was the same man in the walkie-talkie in Jiangwa town. All the while, Lu Renjia just stood there, unbothered. Lu Renjia told him that now that he was awake, they should start heading back. And Sinan, who had just had a good look at the camp, got confused about what was going on. Mysterious people had gathered inside the room full of clockworks, and they were addressing Hansu, whom they had given an informant with a special ability for his mission. They were interrogating him about the outcome of the mission when he had even confronted an enemy personally. Hansu, who was the masked person that Lu Rengia had fought with, glared at them while commending them for being fast at receiving updates. He told them to just wait for the report of the outcome, and he had nothing to say at the moment. One of the participants slammed the table in rage and cursed at him, reminding Hansu that the organization had lost a lot of important resources at once. The participant who got angry was a giant and loomed over Hansu, threatening him not to think that he could cope with them without saying anything, as he ended up with nothing and got beaten up so badly. Hansu was enraged and glared at the giant. The giant was surprised and took a step back when Hansu made a pillar of spiky ice grow from the ground to attack him and questioned him if he was teaching him to do his work. And with this, the giant threw a fit of rage and addressed Lin Hansu by his complete name, asking if he was trying to rebel. Another one of the participants told the giant to shut up and look at the icicle. The giant did what he was told and was surprised to see a few drops of blood at the end of the ice for which the other participants commended Lin Hansu for bringing back what they wanted and for doing a good job. Lin Hansu explained that he sneakily scratched Wang Xi with a tiny ice needle during the battle, and he was certain that she did not notice it herself. The giant rejoiced as he broke the tip of the ice and marveled at the blood, saying that he could continue with his previous experiments if he could parse the blood, while Lin Hansu did not show interest and just told him to take his time to play with it and proceed to ask his lord if he could get his reward. The Lord agreed, but he was curious about Lin Hansu's actions as he claimed earlier that he would work on the project. Upon hearing this, the giant immediately blurted out that the project was his. Lin Hansu had a malicious smile as he recalled Lu Renjia and told his lord that he had found something more interesting. Meanwhile, Sinan, Wang Xi, and Lu Renjia were together in a room, and Wang Xi observed them while Sinan and Lu Renjia intently read from a piece of paper. Lu Renjia looked unhappy as he asked Sinan what was written on his mission report. Lu Renjia was surprised as Sinan raised both his hands in the air and rejoiced, sharing the news that he received a commendation and was on the gold level watch list for doing a great job in the rescue mission, and turning the tide. Sinan returned the question to Lu Renjia and assumed that he should be able to go straight up to white silver level through the mission, but Lu Renjia looked grumpy instead of rejoicing. 
He crumpled the mission report in his hands while saying that all his points were deducted because of the attacks on the escorts and high officials, so his escort license was on the verge of being revoked, which surprised Sinan. Lu Rengia looked gloomy sitting on the ground as he admitted to the offense of attacking fellow escorts, as he did not care if they reported him, but he could not remember provoking any high officials. Right after Lu Rengia finished his sentence, he and Sinan exclaimed in unison, remembering the guy whom Lu Rengia knocked out and stripped. Lu Rengia called the official out for being petty when he even returned his clothes to him, but Sinan, remembering the tattered state the official was in, corrected Lu Rengia and said that he was only able to return 15% of the official's clothes. Wang Zai chimed into the conversation and asked Lu Rengia what the big deal was about being a black iron level. Then she offered for him to come back to the base with her since he wanted to work so badly and told him that she would ask the officials there to make him an executive officer. Lu Rengia pouted and sulked, saying that it was not the same, while Sinan looked smug, asking Wang Zai if she would like to consider him for the position. Sinan suddenly pointed out that Wang Zai was not wearing her helmet and asked if it was okay for her to take it off. While her system had been notifying her about the environmental monitoring status, Wang Zai pointed at the mask that she was wearing and told Sinan that the problem of the indoor environment is not serious at the base city, so she only needs to wear a mask to prevent respiratory viruses. Not knowing what a virus was, Sinan asked her what it was, and Lu Rengia frantically jumped into the conversation to try and stop Sinan from asking the question. But he was too late. Wang Zai's eyes twinkled as she praised Sinan for asking a good question. She then proceeded to explain what a virus was and kept on rambling about related topics, while Lu Rengia and Sinan looked like life had left their bodies. Lu Rengia told Sinan that Wang Zai could talk like that for a long time. Suddenly, someone at the door was calling out and asking if there was anyone inside. Sinan responded by asking who was at the door, and the person let themselves into the room and read a document for Lu Rengia and Sinan, asking them to come with her for the unified arbitration by the union. Both Lu Rengia and Sinan were puzzled, so they asked the lady what the matter was. The lady looked at them seriously and told them that it was about the arbitration suspect, Wang Ying, and white silver level escort Wu Kian, that they had attacked and killed. Upon hearing what the lady said, the three of them, Wang Zai, Lu Rengia, and Sinan, expressed their confusion in unison. Sinan asked Lu Rengia why Wang Zai did not come with them, as she could have helped them argue the case. Lu Rengia said that he did not know, as she was taken away by her sister. Sinan was glum that they were just chatting about the promotion at his house when someone suddenly appeared and took them away. But then he whispered that the lady who took them was quite pretty. At the trial room, Sinan was making a scene, questioning why they still had to be handcuffed. Then he bragged about being an escort who was about to be promoted to gold level and demanded that his handcuffs be removed. Casting aside the topic of Wang Ying, Lu Rengia asked Sinan who the bastard Hang the Guard talked about was. Sinan responded that he did not know, so Lu Rengia could not have killed him because he did not even know him. Lu Rengia's eyes widened as he asked Sinan if he was really sure. This made Sinan uneasy, and he told him not to hesitate at such a time and requested that he be confident. The judge arrived and slammed down his gavel. He commanded the court to be quiet and called upon the witnesses. Both Sinan and Lu Rengia turned to look at the door to see who was going to come in. Wu Kian entered the room with a tall blonde man, saying that he witnessed them use dirty tricks to snatch the escort's parcel and brutally murder the aboriginal Wang Ying and his uncle. With an evil look on his face, Wu Kian told Sinan that the end of his life was near. Lu Rengia and Sinan's faces were full of disgust as they saw Wu Kian enter the room. As Lu Rengia asked why he was there again, Sinan was concerned about why Wu Kian kept looking at him. The blonde guy approached the judge and presented the file of evidence that his brother, Wu Kian, had written overnight, containing all the events he had witnessed. As the judge said that the matter of the aboriginal was a serious concern, so he did not dare to judge it. His eyes widened with delight as the blonde guy told him to look at the file. In between its pages, gold was hidden in between the sheets. The judge immediately addressed the blonde guy as the chief master of the Invincible Escort Agency and asked what brought him to the city. The guy replied that he came to Tianfu base because the base requested assistance from gold level escorts for the aboriginal mission. The guy's expression immediately turned menacing as he went in and mentioned the tragic murder of his poor uncle, who was bent on serving the union. He then requested the judge to make a judgment. The judge then raised an image of the official who had turned into a demonic monster and turned to Sinan and Lu Rengia, asking if they knew the man. Lu Rengia immediately recognized the man and straight up told them that he did not kill him, while Sinan hysterically questioned what they were asking and said no. He then proceeded to demand to be released. Upon hearing them recognize the official, the judge immediately gave them the verdict of being guilty as charged. He decided that they would be immediately taken into custody for further scrutiny, and then the commendation for the mission achievement would be transferred to the temporary mission leader, Wu Kian. 
Wu Kain crossed his arms and laughed hysterically, telling Sinan that that is what he got for provoking the Invincible Escort Agency. He added that Sinan certainly could no longer gain a foothold in the Southwest Territory, and that the person to be promoted to gold level was him. While Sinan was mad and glared at Wu Kain, Lu Renjia was smiling, as if mocking Wu Kain. He then asked Wu Kain if he was happy and added that it would have also been nice if his demerits could be transferred to him along with Sinan's commendations. Suddenly, someone barged into the courtroom by kicking the door and told the judge to wait a minute. It was Wang Zai, backed up by the lady with the silver hair who gave them the arbitration documents earlier, the Tianfu base receptionist, and the group of people, officials and escorts, who went on the mission with Sinan and Lu Renjia. Wu Kian, along with the blonde guy and the judge, looked surprised by Wang Zai's arrival. The three of them were wondering what she was doing here, but only the judge had the guts to ask her the question. Wang Zai sat down immediately and told the judge that she had come for the case hearing. Then she asked what stage the trial had reached. The receptionist responded to Wang Zai's question and told her that the verdict had been given and that Lu Renjia and Sinan were guilty as charged, which surprised Wang Zai. Wang Zai turned to look at the judge. She looked extremely serious, and with a commanding tone, she asked for a retrial. Wang Zai crossed her legs as she asked the judge if he had not heard what she said, and then repeated her request for a retrial with the same commanding tone. Watching Wang Zai, Sinan whispered to Lu Renjia that he felt like she had turned into a different person, but Lu Renjia did not agree with him and told him that aboriginals have always spoken that way. The judge panicked, while the blonde guy whispered to Wu Kian, scolding him for not mentioning such an important matter to him. Wu Kian retorted, asking how a deceitful silver level man and a raggedy black iron could possibly be close with Wang Zai. He said that they just got lucky that they found her first and must have deceived her. Wu Kian was about to suggest something when an official with two spears poking out behind his head caught his attention. The official looked like he had horns poking out of his head, and upon seeing Wu Kian, wondered why he was looking at him. Memories of what Lu Renjia did to him came flooding in, turning Wu Kian into a crazy mess. Snot ran down his face as he cried and begged someone not to come any closer to him. Sinan immediately cringed at the sight of Wu Kian and asked Lu Renjia what he had done again, to which Lu Renjia responded that he had done nothing, although he did not sound so sure. Wu Kian peed his pants in the courtroom as soon as the judge noticed. He was disgusted and immediately ordered the blonde guy to get Wu Kian out of the room, calling him incontinent. Meanwhile, the blonde guy tried to explain his brother's condition, saying that his brother had become mentally disturbed when he saw a particular shape ever since he came back from the mission. The blonde guy told the judge that his brother had been serving the Tianfu base for so long but ended up with such a fate. He then accused Sinan and Lu Renjia of having involvement in the matter and requested that the judge do them justice. The blonde guy pleaded with the judge, reminding him about the benefits they usually gave. The judge told him to shut up, then glanced over at Wang Zai. The judge was intimidated by Wang Zai just sitting there without saying a word as he could not guess what she was thinking. He nervously decided to take a temporary adjournment, stating that he realized that some evidence was not clear after he reviewed the file carefully. Wang Zai glared at the judge, then asked him who gave him permission to adjourn and stated that they lacked evidence. The silver-haired lady immediately called on an official and commanded him to tell the court what he knew. The official respectfully addressed the judge and told him that he was tied up in the woods after being attacked, so he had witnessed some of the situations. Upon hearing what the official said, Lu Renjia and Sinan immediately recognized him as the 15% man. The official proceeded to tell the judge that their steward turned into something like a demonic beast. Then, a burning man with four eyes and six arms wounded the steward. But the steward was eventually killed by an iceman with a chicken wing. The judge was baffled by what he had just heard and thought that if Wang Zai wanted to acquit Lu Renjia and Sinan, she could have told him directly instead of bringing a fool to tell him the mythology. Meanwhile, the blonde guy turned to look at the official as the word ice caught his attention, which in turn caught Lu Renji's attention. Sinan was relieved that they were finally acquitted and pointed out the look on the judge's face when he saw Wang Zai. He even noticed that the judge ran as fast as he could after the trial ended and concluded that he must have been peeing his pants. The blonde guy was not happy with the outcome, he was annoyed at Sinan who was being smug and said that they were just two guys who live off women. As he tried to deliver his speech about the two of them using fancy words about Wang Zai, Wu Kian finally came back to his senses. The blonde guy looked menacing as he said that Wang Zai would not be staying long outside the Tinder base, so she could not protect Sinan and Lu Renjia in the southwest zone for long. And then Wu Kian chimed in on the monologue, saying that Sinan would be done for. Noticing that Wu Kian was back to his senses, his brother immediately kicked him, questioning his nerve to laugh when he had disgraced him. He then said that he would be teaching him a lesson after. Sinan and Lu Renjia looked disgusted again. Sinan was concerned about why Wu Kian kept staring at him when he was not the one who beat him up. 
and Lu Renjia responded that no one knows and added that Wu Kian did not even look at him once. Wang Zai chimed into the conversation and talked about records in ancient books that tackle the topic of post-traumatic brain injury or amnesia. She theorized that the brain could forget certain memories in order to maintain its normal function, or there may also be nerve damage to the brain after a severe head injury. Wang Zai was extremely fascinated by the topic and asked Lu Renjia to help her get some slices of Wu Kian's brain stem, to which Sinan interjected and said that even though he did not know what a brain stem was, he was extremely afraid of the current Wang Zai. Lu Renjia crossed his arms and told Wang Zai that he would see if he could get some tonight, and upon hearing this, Sinan hysterically questioned Lu Renjia for agreeing to her request so readily. Lu Renjia's eyes twinkled as he told Sinan that they needed to go to Wu Kian's house tonight, and Sinan was surprised. Lu Renjia explained that the blonde guy reacted unusually when he heard the word ice, and since that guy was in their family too, he believed that their family was related to the group he has been chasing. Sinan suddenly noticed the two ladies standing near them and asked them what they were doing with Wang Zai, especially the receptionist. The silver-haired lady pointed at herself and told him that she originally came from the fish city to protect Wang Zai. On the other hand, the receptionist did the same and proudly said that she came over to prevent someone from tearing down the Tianfu base because of an unfavorable verdict. Everyone fell silent, except for Lu Renjia, who asked who would tear the base down, and the receptionist just simply told him that he knew who the person was. A red-haired woman was sitting on the lap of a blonde guy, and she was dissing her boyfriend, calling him a useless person who had been acting like a lunatic recently. She then caressed the blonde guy's shoulders as she told him that the Wu family could rely on him from now on. The blonde guy tried to avert his gaze, but he turned to look at the red-haired girl and asked her about his little brother. She confidently responded that the fat pig had fallen asleep earlier in the room next to where they were. At the hole in the roof, someone was whispering and calling out to their master, telling them to stop looking. With mischievous and expectant eyes, Lu Renjia whispered back to the guy, telling him to stop disturbing him as it was just getting to the most exciting part. But the person continued to disturb him and reminded him that there were more important things at the moment. Lu Renjia then turned to the person, who had their entire face covered, and asked if they did not feel that it would be boring just to cover up the hole like that. The person admitted that they did feel the same way a little. The person pulled down the cloth that was covering their face, and it was Sinan, who was sweating buckets with his getup. He said that he just brought the night clothes in the afternoon, so the smell was still pretty strong. Lu Renjia commented that his clothes no longer fit the current atmosphere. Both of them peered at the edge of the roof and looked down at the guard who was patrolling the place. While still whispering, Lu Renjia made a comment that there were quite a lot of guards, and Sinan responded that he should not look down on the family as they were still considered very important people of the land. Lu Renjia then noticed a building that had been surrounded by guards and was being constantly patrolled. Sinan told Lu Renjia that it was probably the building where all the escort files were being kept and said that it was very suspicious. Sinan continued to say that they needed to devise a plan to get there, but he stopped midway because when he looked beside him, Lu Renjia was already gone. When Sinan turned to look at the building again, Lu Renjia was already there, opening up a window. Although he was still whispering, surprise and worry lay Sinan's words as he requested for Lu Renjia to wait for him and asked how he got over to the building and what he should do. Lu Renjia ignored Sinan and proceeded to scan the records on the building. To his dismay, they were all normal document files, and he felt like they did not have much value. Meanwhile, someone's foot slipped, and it was Sinan's. He immediately crashed onto the floor and whispered a scream as soon as he entered the building. Lu Renjia sarcastically thanked him for being discreet. Sinan explained that the window ledge was a little slippery but said that he was fine as he stood up with his right hand supporting his aching back and the left hand extended, trying to grab onto something for support. Sinan accidentally grabbed a bottle that triggered something. Sinan and Lu Renjia were speechless as they stared at the passage that appeared in front of them. Both of them were sweating and surprised about what happened. Then Sinan immediately recovered from the shock and did another one of his poses, saying that he expected that there was a secret route, while Lu Renjia looked at him furiously, saying that he almost believed him. They hurriedly went inside as they observed that the passage was going to close automatically. Inside, there were a lot of boxes. Lu Renjia wondered what they contained, while Sinan already had a guess that the boxes contained stolen darts. That is one of the secrets that many escort organizations have. After accepting the task, they would lie about failing it so they could steal the darts. But looking closely at the box labels, Lu Renjia noticed that the records on the boxes and on the outside matched, which surprised Sinan as the records outside were all just normal records. He confirmed with Lu Renjia if he did not remember wrongly as he just flipped through the records outside. 
Lu Renji pointed at the labels on the boxes and read them out to Sinan to confirm with him that he did not remember the records wrongly. Sinan continued to wonder if that was really true while Lu Renji sighed and thought about what the Wu family was doing as the records were all the same. Sinan pulled out his gun as he asked Lu Renji why he cared so much. He used the grip of his gun to knock off one of the box's locks to open it. As they opened the box, they were baffled to see that it was empty and wondered what was wrong with the Wu family for putting an empty box in such a place. Lu Renji sighed as he concluded that the place seemed useless for them. Lu Renji's ears suddenly perked up as he heard something. Someone from the outside grabbed the bottle that Sinan had grabbed earlier and opened the passage. There were two people carrying another box. One of them was complaining about how late it was, while the other was telling his companion not to complain as they could finally rest once they finished what they were doing. Although they were whispering, Lu Rengia heard them and warned Sinan about the people that were coming down. As soon as they entered the room, they dropped the box. The one wearing a hat started scanning the room while the other, wearing a mask, questioned him for slowing down after being in such a hurry to get back. The one wearing a hat told the guy in the mask that something did not smell right and it seemed like someone else had gotten there before them. The guy in the mask reacted and told him not to say scary things in the middle of the night. The broken lock was just sitting in the corner of the room while Sinan and Lu Rengia curled up into a ball and hid inside one of the boxes. The guy in the mask questioned why someone would come at that hour. The man wearing a hat found the unlocked box and opened it rapidly, saying that someone was hiding in the boxes, in the hopes that he would surprise the intruders. He was dumbfounded when he saw that the box was empty, and the guy in the mask cursed and told him that it should not be a surprise that the box was empty. The man wearing a hat questioned why they would leave the empty boxes in the room when the secret codes had already been taken out. Upon hearing his complaints, the guy in the mask shared some information that he found strange. He heard a few days ago that the darts had to be delivered. He said that the archives named Wu Kian as the one who delivered them. And he was about to comment on Wu Kian's condition when the man in the hat remembered that he said it was the helmsman who wanted to kill Wu Kian so that he could treat his sister-in-law right. As they made their way out of the room, the guy in the mask started to whisper and shush the man wearing a hat, saying that he could get killed saying that. But the man wearing a hat whispered back and retorted that it was not like anyone could hear them. Lu Rengia proudly stood up and popped out of the box, saying that he heard them. Meanwhile, Sinan was still crouching in the box and being wary, saying that those men knew how to act discreetly, and they might have been killed if they had opened the wrong box. Without any context, Lu Rengia turned towards Sinan and said that he was going to find it. The confused Sinan immediately asked him what he was going to find, if it was the sister-in-law. Lu Rengia immediately and sternly said no, then he told Sinan that he was talking about the codes, so he must find a way to get into the organization. Sinan was baffled by Lu Rengia's words and asked him how he could get into such a secretive organization because he figured out that they must only look to promote from the inside. Lu Rengia told Sinan that they were understaffed, and Sinan could not believe what he just said as the Wu family was in the southwest with over 100 silver masters. Lu Rengia's hair was now blazing in flames, and he was now wearing a mask, showing only his eyes, and he had this mischievous look on his face as he told Sinan that soon, the Wu family won't have enough. A gloomy aura shrouded Sinan, and he was sweating buckets, he was about to tell Lu Rengia that he was a devil but managed to cut himself off. Suddenly, an explosion occurred at the Wu residence, catching the attention of the red-haired girl girl, and the blonde guy who was doing naughty things in the room earlier. The blonde guy hurriedly went outside without wearing his shirt properly, and his pants were still unzipped. He saw his people running all over the place, so he yelled and asked them what was causing all the noise in the middle of the night. One of the men told him that there were two masked robbers in the main building who stormed in through the rear entrance. They could not clearly see them, but they were attacking anyone they saw, and they were too strong. Meanwhile, someone visited Lin Hansu and taunted him by asking if he was really beaten into a pulp just like what he heard. Lin Hansu glared at the guy. He then raised his hand to slash the guy while reminding him that he did not want him to come into his room. Lin Hansu was surprised when the guy stopped his ice midair and made it float. The guy clicked his tongue at how cold Lin Hansu's reception was. He told him that the boss had sent him to clean up his mess since he was injured, and his eyes gleamed with excitement as he mentioned the Dragon City's red-blooded cultivator. He then asked Lin Hansu's opinion on how Lu Rengia was, if he was fun to play with. Lin Hansu laughed, saying that if he went, he would find out for himself. All the while, Sinan and Lu Rengia were running around the Wu residence, being hunted by armed men. Lu Rengia was wearing a new jacket and staring at it, looking conflicted. He said that although he did not care about keeping warm, the fabric of the jacket was so short that it was more suitable to be called sleeves than a jacket. Wang Zai pointed out that it was difficult to find flame retardant materials in Tianfu base and told him to stop complaining and treat it as a special design for his fighting style. The conflicted look on Lu Rengia's face turned into a contented one when Wang Zai handed over the new thermos she had just made for him. Sinan was standing beside the silver-haired lady, pouting as he looked at the interactions between Lu Rengia, 
and Wang Zai. He felt envious of Lu Renjia as it was his first time seeing a living primitive's face, and he also wished Wang Zai would talk to him kindly. Upon hearing what he said, the silver-haired lady immediately drew out her sword and warned Sinan to watch what he was saying. Sinan frantically explained that he did not mean anything else and tried to divert the topic by asking if Wang Zai did not need to wear a helmet there. Wang Zai spread her arms and told Sinan that the room had been purposely renovated according to her instructions, so she did not need to wear isolation equipment. Upon hearing what she said, Lu Renjia asked her if she was going to stay there for a while. Wang Zai said yes and explained that they had obtained a monster specimen from the organization thanks to Lu Renjia. Since that thing was not easy to escort, she needed to do an on-site autopsy as soon as possible. She then proceeded to ask Lu Renjia if there was any news on the situation on his end. Recalling last night's shenanigans, Lu Renjia told Wang Zai that he did not get Wu Kian's brain stem as Sinan persuaded him to leave. But Wang Zai told him that she was not asking about that. Lu Renjia immediately understood what she meant and told her that his guess was that it should be available soon. Meanwhile, the receptionist was twirling a pen in her hands as she stared intensely at the Invincible Escort Agency's official request for temporary escorts for joint missions. She found it strange and questioned what the Wu family was up to. Her companion immediately informed her that the Wu residence was attacked last night by two bandits. One was claiming to be the second master of the Divine Wind Fortress, and the other was Scar. All of the members of the residence were now living in the medical center. The receptionist's face looked horrified as she asked her companion if the attackers were a tall and a short man. When her companion confirmed this, she removed her glasses and slapped the palm of her hand into her face, realizing that the rumors about Lu Renjia being mischievous were true. Her companion looked worried and asked her who the guy was. She pinched the bridge of her nose and told him that it was the demon who had been reported missing recently. Her companion was alarmed as he remembered his mental image of the Crimson Shura and asked why he was at their base. Her companion nervously asked her if they needed to report this serious matter that may affect their next plan. But the receptionist told him that there was no need and he just had to keep an eye on the situation outside. She was still pinching the bridge of her nose as she told him to let her know once he saw the two people who were entrusted with the escort mission last time come to pick up the Invincible Escort Agency's notice. Her companion got nervous and told her that he did not expect the Crimson Shura to be one of those guys, but he still agreed to do what he was told. The receptionist started to nibble at the tip of her glasses temple as she instructed her companion that their first priority was to find out what the Wu family was doing. They have almost no credibility in escorting, so she found it strange that they rushed to open recruitment the next day after the attack just because some men were injured. On the other hand, at the Wu residence, the red-haired girl told the blonde guy not to worry as the escort mission was originally set by her uncle before he died. She wrapped her arms around his shoulders and told him that it was the perfect bait for them to use for the ones who attacked the Wu residents yesterday. She assured him that they would definitely come and everything was within their grasp. But the blonde guy was worrying about his brother. The red-haired girl assured the blonde guy again that the entire Tianfu base would belong to him after the plan succeeded. She leaned into him and told him that she would also belong to him, which made the blonde guy blush. A lot of escorts were lining up for the Invincible Escort Agency's request for temporary escorts. Some were skeptical about the mission's credibility, and some were escorts who had previously vowed not to get involved with the Wu family but had chosen to break that vow because of the high compensation. Suddenly, people made way when someone was coming through the line. It was Sin and Pei, and people started buzzing in the background about Sinan's latest accomplishments as he struck a pose in front of them. Sinan stood in front of the line while the other escorts were wondering why he was there when he had a conflict with the Wu family. They thought he was there to pick a fight. The male receptionist asked Sinan what he wanted, and Sinan placed his hand on the table, saying that he wanted the tickets and was asking if the Wu family would dare to accept him. Even though the guy smiled, displeasure was still evident in his face when he told Sinan that his captain had told him that grudges were not to be used to blame anyone for the past and all were accepted. He then asked Sinan if he was registering alone and asked for his license. Sinan laughed confidently, and then he started to sweat when he said he would be waiting for an old friend who went to the restroom. Upon hearing what he said, the other escorts complained about him cutting in line when he was not going to register yet. Sinan retorted that he did not say that he would register and that they were the ones who voluntarily went out of the way. Unbeknownst to the other escorts, Sinan was sweating profusely and worrying a lot because Lu Renjia still had not returned. He recalled that Lu Renjia was immediately taken away by the Alliance as soon as they entered the arena and wondered if it was because of what they did last night. Sinan stood to the side and crossed his arms while thinking that although Lu Renjia doesn't have to worry about the Alliance, he, on the other hand, won't have a future if Lu Renjia is taken away. He was considering whether he had to register for the Wu escort mission alone or should he just bail. Suddenly, a guy with purple hair called out to Sinan, saying that he had been looking for him. 
The guy smiled sinisterly as he confirmed if he was really Sin and Pei, the one who jumped to the gold level escort just within four months and the one who has also been involved in most of the crossover missions. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia was standing in a room with his arms crossed, asking someone what cooperating with them meant. He was talking to the receptionist, who told him that he and Sinan both have unique body types, and at the same time, both of them would join the Wu family on the mission. Connecting the dots, she told him that it was certain that they would connect them to last night's attack, so she offered that they should come to their side and they could provide additional access to the Wu's escort team. When Lu Renjia heard that she knew it was them who attacked the Wu family last night, he leaned over the receptionist in an intimidating manner and told her that he was not more interested in what she wanted to do. While the receptionist stood her ground and told him that she had nothing to say as she was just going to suggest that they take an extra escort, the receptionist's companion immediately went between them to break the tension, calling Lu Renjia a rude black iron. Lu Renjia gave the receptionist his answer that he was not interested as it made no difference to him which side he was on, unless there were some extra benefits. The receptionist's companion offered Lu Renjia genetic enhancement fluids and as much money as he could want. When Lu Renjia did not respond, he then pointed his finger at him, asking him if it was not enough, and told him that he was too greedy for a black iron and he should not bite off more than he could chew. The receptionist sighed and told her companion that Lu Renjia did not need those, and then proudly offered to Lu Renjia that she would help him cancel the Demerits from his last assignment. Upon hearing this, Lu Renjia accepted the deal in a heartbeat. The receptionist was glad that Lu Renjia agreed. She then turned her back on them and walked away, saying that she still needed to finish getting ready and told them to wait there. Closing the door behind her, the receptionist was relieved that there were no more safety problems since Lu Renjia had agreed. She then looked back and held her chest and blushed while thinking about Lu Renjia's overwhelming presence. Meanwhile, inside the room, the receptionist's companion told Lu Renjia that he did not know why the receptionist asked him to work with her but that he should not think that this was something he could handle. Lu Renjia told him that it was she who kept trying to get a hold on him, and he was surprised that her companion did not know the reason behind it either. The guy then looked at him sideways, telling him to draw dropped the act as they already knew the truth about red-blooded Shura. The guy proudly declared that the red-blooded Shura was Sin and Pei and that the receptionist must have bribed Lu Renjia to get information. With twinkles all over him, Lu Renjia gave him a thumbs up and proudly agreed to what he just said. At Water Bear's headquarters, someone was reporting over the radio to their lord that their companions had joined the escort team, and everything was going well. The Lord was pleased and praised their good job, giving them a reminder that since Wu Gihang was dead, their priority task was to protect the parcels. The person on the radio confirmed that they understood the order, but they sounded like they had more concerns, so their Lord gave them permission to ask. The person on the radio stated that the parcels were important to their experiment, so they were concerned about the risk and asked their lord if they were really going to take a chance. A humanoid figure could be seen at one of the cylindrical glass tanks surrounding their lord. The figure tapped on the glass as if trying to get someone's attention as their lord responded to the person on the radio, but he did not explain any details and just told them to do it. The eyes of the humanoid figure in the tank were wide open and full of malice as their lord continued to say that if they did not give up something, they would not get the harvest. Meanwhile, at the Wu family's escort mission, multiple escorts were carrying boxes and cargo. One of them was complaining that the high and mighty Wu family could not afford to hire a porter and hired them to do the hard work. But his companion told him to stop complaining, as it was just a few boxes. He then remembered that he had hesitated to come, so he asked him why he had decided to do so. While still carrying the boxes, both of them looked behind them, and the guy in the yellow bandana told the curly guy that there was nothing to worry about. They were looking at Sinan, who was leaning against a cargo container at the corner, and said that with such a powerful escort as Sinan, who had defeated Wu Kayan, the Wu family would not dare to do anything bad. Sinan smiled at them and gave them a salute, so they decided to approach him, telling him that they were initially hesitant to come but they were relieved when they noticed that he had also signed up for the mission, and Sinan gave them assurance in return. Little did they know that deep inside, Sinan was also worried. Lu Rengia had suddenly asked him to register himself without any explanation and then ran off somewhere, and he was hiding in the corner, waiting for an opening to escape. Sinan then made some small talk, asking them why they were moving stuff when they were escorting, and they told Sinan that what they were carrying was not an escort parcel but the extra luggage of Ms. Zhang Qi. Sinan asked who Ms. Zhang Qi was, and the curly guy said that she was the head of the Union mission, and directed Sinan where she was, which made Sinan turn and look in that direction. The curly guy told Sinan that they were riding along with the escorts this time, and that there were also a few special carriages for them. Sinan commented on how opulent they were and how they really knew how to enjoy themselves. Sinan scrunched his face to take a closer look when he noticed something. 
he was looking at one of the escorts with Ms. Zhang Qi and recognized the shape and familiar aura. When the escort saw him and waved at him, Sinan immediately recognized his master, Lu Renjia, and wondered when he had joined their team. He frowned, relieved that Lu Renjia was on the mission but wondering if he had chosen to work with them or had sneaked in. The curly guy interrupted Sinan's thoughts by asking him about his junior and asked if he was not coming with him. Sinan struck another one of his cool poses, telling them that fledglings needed to learn how to fly by themselves. And the curly guy gave him a thumbs up and praised him for being a good senior. While the guy in the yellow bandana whispered to the curly guy, asking what he knew about being a senior. The guy in the bandana whispered again when he noticed a silhouette behind them and told the curly guy that the weird guy was behind them. In turn, the curly guy whispered back and asked him if he knew why no one at the base would talk to that guy. Sinan also noticed the guy and recognized him as the person who had greeted him at the office earlier. The two escorts were still whispering to each other, feeling uneasy that the weird guy kept staring at them, so they were planning to leave, while Sinan was thinking that the guy was his admirer too. All the while, the weird guy was irritated and scowling as he carefully considered the information Lin Hansu gave him. The clues Lin Hansu gave him pointed him towards Sinan, but he looked so easy to kill that he was doubtful if he really was the Crimson Shura. On the other hand, he thought that Sinan might have some trick to hide his strength, so he decided to be careful. Back at the Wu residence, the blonde guy had his back turned towards a guy kneeling and was reporting to him about the escorts being all ready to go and that they would be departing as soon as he gave the order. The blonde guy addressed the kneeling guy, Da Lai, and told him that he had been working with him for a long time, which Da Lai confirmed. The blonde guy commanded Da Lai to follow the team and escort the parcels too. Hearing this, Da Lai asked about the second master, Wu Kian. Without looking at Da Lai, the blonde guy commanded him to kill Wu Kian when he had the chance, as the Wu family never raises waste. As the escort team started to move and traveled through a canyon, someone was already complaining that the trip was too slow. So, someone explained to them that the front carriages were being pulled by human power. Even if they wanted to go faster, they could not. Lu Renjia was the one complaining, and he complained even more that it was bothersome to have too many people. Ms. Zhang Qi's escort was the one explaining things. He told Lu Renjia that he could just enjoy the trip because he would have been down there pulling things right now if Ms. Zhang Qi had not given him the white silver level chambermaid attire. Upon hearing that, Lu Renjia was delighted and stopped complaining. Ms. Zhang Qi's escort told Lu Renjia that nothing was as great as he did not get the top secret file on the red blood he requested from him. He was worried because he had already guaranteed his colleagues that they would receive the greatest master gossip. Lu Renjia retorted that he had already shown him his study materials. Looking mad while pointing at a sexy magazine, Ms. Zhang Qi's escort questioned Lu Renjia about the thing he gave him and called it a joke. He could not believe that the book belonged to the Crimson Shira but he was immediately frozen in place when Sinan popped out from his shoulders, asking why his book was in his hands. The escort's soul seemed to have left his body as Sinan raged on Lu Renjia, reprimanding him in a whispering manner. He said that the book was so precious that he should not show it off. He even brought up Wang Zai's name, who said that it was polarized printing on a coated cover, so that kind of antique was not easy to find on the market. Lu Renjia simply pouted and waved him off, he was pretending not to know Sinan at the moment. Sinan scowled and glared at Lu Renjia while contemplating if the guy was the organizer of the dart trip. He stood properly, cleared his throat, and proceeded to talk in a professional manner. He then informed them that they would be entering a high-risk area after the mountain range ahead. So, he had come to check what kind of security the supervisor, Zhang, needed. Ms. Zhang Qi, who was wearing a green cloak with horns, opened the window of the carriage and told Sinan that she was fine. Large dart teams were less likely to attract mountain thieves or demonic beasts, so she would let the guards handle the rest of the chores. What she said completely went over Sinan's head. He was so bewildered when he saw Ms. Zhang Qi's attire that he could only think of asking her what she was wearing because he thought that Lu Renjia had appeared. Ms. Zhang Qi touched her hood and told Sinan that she had heard that the coat ensured Wu Kian's illness. She did not think that it would really work, but Wu Kian kept on coming her way. So, she took it out to try it. Sinan was confounded that she went out to prepare such things. While Ms. Zhang Qi's escort was still frozen due to shock, Lu Renjia chimed in on their conversation, reminding Sinan about the brain flower that Wang Zai wanted. But Sinan yelled at him, correcting that it was a brain stem. Then he refused and told him to stop mentioning it. Meanwhile, the lifeless escort still could not move on from his discovery of the highly skilled study material of the Crimson Shura. At the other part of the convoy, one of the escorts noticed his colleague had been sighing the whole trip and decided to ask him about it. The brown-haired escort said that it was obvious that there were not enough engines for the horse carriage, so they still have to pull those themselves. The guy in the bandana told him to stop thinking as those engines are only for Wu Kian's own use. 
he said that he also brings a separate toilet and shower room and has already gone twice. The brown-haired escort was enraged, saying that it was not in line with the rules and how dare Wu Kayan do such things when the inspector was with them. But the curly guy shushed him and told him to keep his voice down. This made the brown-haired escort even more angry. He dropped the rope that he was pulling and was about to head somewhere, saying that there was no point in lowering his voice as he was going to the inspector to report Wu Kayan. He even added that going with the Wu family for those darts was unlucky. But he was surprised when he turned and saw Wu Kayan with Dao Lai standing behind him. Wu Kayan was saying that he had so much energy. An explosion occurred, and the brown-haired escort was thrown to the ground, and the other escorts tried to protest as the guy with the bandana caught the brown-haired guy. In a threatening way, Wu Kayan told them that if they had any problems, they should go ahead and tell them. But they should consider whether they could physically compete with the Wu family, where all the judges were coming from. The escorts were alarmed by the threat and did not say anything. Dao Lai respectfully bowed and told Wu Kayan that it was more important to go into the front of the convoy to protect it as it was already in a risky area. He suggested that they could teach the escorts a lesson later. Wu Kayan did not like what he heard and told Dao Lai that he was the head of the dart. So, if he felt nervous, he should just send him. Dao Lai said nothing and just stared at him intensely. While carrying a bouquet of flowers, Wu Kayan marched back, saying that getting close to the beautiful ambassador was the right thing to do at the moment. The man with the bandana commented on how Wu Kayan just rolled back and forgot the thing. As Wu Kayan arrogantly told Da Lai not to worry as they were such a large escort team, he stepped on a rope that was snapped in two. Unbeknownst to Wu Kayan, huge rocks were rolling down the edges as he asked where a bandit stupid enough to attack them would come from. Wu Kayan was startled when he noticed what was happening, and terror was written all over his face, along with the other escorts and officials who felt something was wrong. A huge group of mountain bandits ambushed them from the top of the cliff. They shot arrows that rained down on the convoy. The people in the convoy panicked as they saw the rocks falling. They were screaming and trying to find a place to hide. Ms. Zhang Qi's carriage was being maneuvered through the falling rocks by her escort. She opened up her window to check on what was going on outside, and her escort told her that they were under attack and that she should watch out for falling rocks. Zhang Qi analyzed the attack, and although their action caused a commotion, their level of attack did not threaten the escort team, so the bandits were either stupid or they had other plans. Meanwhile, Ms. Zhang Qi's escort questioned Lu Renjia about how he could be so relaxed at a time like that. He then told him to hide in the lady's carriage quickly as he could not protect him in that mess. Lu Renjia just stared at him and said nothing. The escort continued to say that there were more rocks falling there than in other places and called for Sinan Pei. Sinan immediately came and told the escort to leave things to him. He was eager to try out the new weapons that he had gotten. Sinan stood between the falling rocks and Ms. Zhang Qi's carriage and fired the pistols that Wang Zai had given him. Energy charged at the tip of his pistol, then it released a huge beam that looked like a pillar of light. Meanwhile, the guy with purple hair from earlier was standing in the middle of the messed up cargo containers and was thinking about how weird the attack was so he better prioritize protecting the parcels. Although he was annoyed that he could not go out and kill randomly, he thought that the situation was a good opportunity to see the Crimson Shura's strength. His thought process was cut off when he noticed an intense beam of light. He looked up at the sky with his eyes wide open due to shock. Then he laughed evilly as he confirmed that Sinan was really hiding his strength, and he was excited that the game had finally become more interesting. Meanwhile, Sinan just fired one bullet, and the entire hill in front of him got carved out. He did a pose, raising his gun, while saying that he had switched from Bullet Storm to Blaze version. Ms. Zhang Qi's escort's mouth was agape as he marveled at Sinan's so-called platinum-level strength, being able to stop the attacks with a single blow. On the other hand, Sinan was extremely surprised by the strength of his ammunition. He remembered that Wang Zai had told him that she mixed Lu Renjia's blood in the ammunition so it was unstable, but he had just realized how dangerous the thing he was carrying was. Ms. Zhang Qi got off her carriage and told her escort that he should not worry about her safety with Sinan and Lu Renjia around. She instructed him to bring some of his men to check on the others up front, which her escort immediately complied with. While Lu Renjia was thinking that the shot that Sinan just fired felt so familiar, he told Ms. Zhang Qi that he would also be stepping to the front. Ms. Zhang Qi immediately stopped him and told him that it was not the right time. She told him that their route had changed because she had temporarily joined them, and they had spent about half a day getting to where they were from the city. She knew that it was not easy to accomplish a trap on that scale, so the attackers should be a few awakeners. She told Lu Renjia not to act for the time being so he would not scare the fish away. Lu Renjia thought that the attack did not look like the style of the water bear, so he agreed to do what she said. Ms. Zhang Qi's escort led a few men and checked up on the other escorts as instructed. The escorts immediately gathered as soon as they saw the inspector's guards. They told them that the avalanche had stopped and the bandits did not rush down. 
but they were still defending against Eros. One of the bandits was spying on the guards, and he was worried about the number of white silver level guards present as well as the shock wave that occurred a few moments ago. One of the escorts told the guards that rocks were blocking the road, so they asked if they should storm through, and Ms. Zhang Qi's escort rejected the idea, saying that they did not have a clear picture of the current situation, so everyone should get into their positions first. A bald guy with spikes on his head was crouching on the bushes. He was talking to someone who was standing beside him and told him that things were not going according to their plan, and the person standing next to him asked him if he thought that it was easy to make money. The guy standing was Da Lai, and he told his companion that they were just experiencing a minor mishap, so they should stay on the plan and prepare for the second attack. Wu Kian emerged from hiding in a cargo container as soon as he thought that things had calmed down. He surveyed the state of their convoy and thought it was a mess. The escorts in front of him were busy tallying the goods, checking for injured men, and looking for someone who could clear the road ahead. Wu Kain was grateful that he had enhanced his private car. As he walked toward the other escorts, he caught the attention of one of them and asked if they had seen Gu Dali. The escort didn't even turn to look at him and questioned why he was asking when he was the head escort. Wu Kain was angry that the escort ignored him and said that he was just a laborer he brought with his money. He warned the escort to think through his actions. Before Wu Kain could finish his sentence, the ground shook tremendously, and the other escorts cursed, wondering if it was another enemy ambush. Wu Kain hurriedly crawled back to his private car and told the escorts outside to lock the doors, but the other escorts were busy taking cover. At the other end of the convoy, Ms. Zhang Qi and Sinan were startled by the earthquake as well, while Lu Rengia stood there as if nothing had happened. Ms. Zhang Qi was somewhat expecting this to happen and was wondering what the next turn of events would be. Sinan looked around to keep an eye out for another avalanche, but Lu Rengia smelled the air and realized that it wasn't the case as he recognized a familiar scent. As soon as Lu Rengia mentioned that the smell was that of a demonic beast wave, a herd of bull-like beasts charged towards the convoy. With the horrific sight of the beast charging towards them, the escorts went into a state of panic and focused on gathering their defenses. The guards cursed as they wondered why so many beasts had suddenly appeared, while the lower-level escorts frantically tried to think of what they should do and were already thinking about their demise. Ms. Zhang Qi stepped up on the roof of her carriage and encouraged the escorts not to panic, as there was nothing to fear. She immediately took charge and instructed the white-silver-level escorts to lead the bronze-level and above-melee-ranged escorts to the front line. She then instructed the far-ranged escorts to prepare for an attack from above the cars, and she instructed the black iron level escorts to pick up the rocks and pile them up into a dike but gave them fair warning to watch out as there may be more rockfall and arrows. As soon as everyone confirmed that they understood her instructions, she immediately told them to get up and start moving. The white silver level was now on the front lines, leading the other escorts with melee ranged abilities as per Ms. Zhang Qi's instructions, and started the countdown to the attack. The countdown finished, and the escorts immediately charged towards the beasts to block them, but there were too many to hold back, so they could not last long. That was when the long-range escorts came into the picture and started firing their attacks from the tops of the cars. The strength of the beasts pushing back the melee-ranged escorts started to diminish as they got hit by the attacks of the long-ranged ones. Lu Renjia was praising Ms. Zhang Qi for knowing how to command as he climbed to the top of the carriage and sat behind her, while Sinan was peeking behind him. Ms. Zhang Qi looked back at him and proudly smiled, saying that it was part of the basic training course for a front desk customer service agent. As Lu Rengia started to relax and think out loud about how they had nothing to do at the moment, Ms. Zhang Qi told him that things were not that simple. She looked like she was seriously contemplating something as she observed that the aggressive demonic beast wave seemed to be in a panic, as if they were on the run. She was afraid that the enemy's goal was to separate them or to focus their formation ahead. Sinan was surprised as he realized what Ms. Zhang Qi was trying to say, that the demonic beast wave was being manipulated by someone, and she seemed to be sure of it. As she confirmed what was just said, the look of determination was evident on her face as she made her decision and commanded Sinan and Lu Rengia to move back, as the demonic beast wave might be a faint attack. Just as Ms. Zhang Qi had predicted, as soon as they heard that the convoy had gotten into a fight with the demonic beasts ahead, the main combat troops of the bandits started to creep up behind them and were planning to quietly sneak up on them and wipe out the long-range escorts first. As their boss confirmed with them whether they understood his instructions, one of the bandits asked him about the attack earlier that was similar to a base cannon. Their boss confidently told them not to be afraid as he observed that the attack had not been cast again after a long time had passed. 
he concluded that it might just be some mysterious weapon from before the catastrophe, and they would not dare to use it once they got into a chaotic battle with the escorts. A silhouette suddenly appeared in front of them and confirmed that their theory was right, that there was only one shot for that weapon, as it seems to be some experimental device that Wang Xi had given. Lu Renjia brought out his sword to his shoulder and was ready to fight as he told the bandits that he had gone there on his own. He smiled as he thought about how Ms. Zhang Qi was right and told the bandits to act quickly as he was in a rush. All the bandits were dumbfounded, as they thought he was a lone white silver level guard and wondered if he had lost his mind. The boss immediately commanded that someone get rid of Lu Rengia, and reminded them not to make a big fuss about it. But the boss was not able to finish his sentence as Lu Rengia smacked his head with the sword he was carrying while the hilt was still on, reminding them that he said he was in a rush. The bandits were startled and angry about what had happened. They immediately surrounded Lu Rengia, and prepared to attack while Lu Rengia stared at the broken sword, wondering if the elder guard would get mad about it. With the spears close to his head, Lu Rengia noticed them and immediately drew the broken sword from its hilt. With one swift, blazing slash from Lu Rengia, multiple bandits flew into the air. Lu Rengia then jumped from the ground and made more blazing slashes that created multiple explosions. As Lu Rengia stood there, looking at the bodies of the bandits that surrounded him, he became vigilant when he heard someone coughing. But he immediately relaxed when he saw that it was Sinan who was walking towards him, asking if he had finished them off, and he said yes. Sinan then asked what he was looking at, so he removed the helmet of one of the bandits using his broken sword and told Sinan to look at the person. Sinan did not recognize the bandit, so Lu Rengia told him that they had met the guy before at the Wu family's courtyard, and Sinan was surprised that Lu Rengia was able to recognize him with just one look. After a moment, Sinan finally realized the situation they were currently in. The Wu family had sent their own men to ambush them. Meanwhile, the boss that Lu Rengia had hit with the sword earlier was frantically running away from the battle, saying that they had encountered a monster. He was thanking his ability that comes with having a hard head because he was able to escape the monster by faking his death when someone appeared in front of him, saying that it was fortunate that he was able to escape. The boss was startled, but the moment he saw that it was Gu Dali, he immediately asked him if he saw what happened and explained to him that no one had told him about the monster. Gu Dali calmly told him that it was not his fault as there was some misinformation, and said that they could only think of another solution. The boss was enraged, asking what solution he could come up with when his men must have been exposed, so he did not think that he would be able to stay at the Tianfu base any longer. Gu Dali bared his claws behind his back and told the boss that there was always a solution. With menacing eyes, Gu Dali mauled the boss head out of his body as he told him that the solution would not be his concern. Some of the best had flown into the air as the melee ranged escorts continued to push them back, while the rest of the escorts used the cargo containers to block the beasts. The moment they closed the cargo containers together, the escorts rejoiced that they had stopped the beasts. But Ms. Zhang Qi immediately reminded them to stay on guard and instructed the long-range escorts to take turns suppressing the demonic beasts. Still standing at the top of her carriage, Ms. Zhang Qi continued to give commands. As she instructed the melee ranged escorts to defend the front line from being broken through while telling the others to continue tallying the goods and strengthening the defense. She also reminded them to watch out for an ambush from above and be ready to hide to which the escorts complied. Someone waltzed onto the scene and told Ms. Zhang Qi not to be so nervous as everything was under his control, it was Wu Kian. He also told her that she was sticking her nose in too much. With a disgusting smile on his face, Wu Kian told Ms. Zhang Qi that he had released the demonic beast to ambush the escorts in order to test her capabilities. And he then praised her for being an excellent lady and offered her to join them so she could enjoy all the wealth because it was a shame that she was only a supervisor and a customer service rep for the union. She glared at him and immediately put on her hood, and in an instant, Wu Kian began to hallucinate again, and became a crazy mess. Ms. Zhang Qi immediately started to contemplate deeply how the Wu family had only kept a few escorts with Wu Kian, and there was no news of Gu Dali. She was thinking of how the people there were defenseless against the invincible escort agency. She started to walk towards the edge of the carriage roof while contemplating how bold the Wu family was when she was there as a supervisor. She jumped to the ground while thinking about how troublesome the situation was, and she called the attention of her escort, Old Chen, while walking towards him, away from Wu Kian, who was going crazy and was kneeling on the ground. Ms. Zhang Qi discussed with Old Chen about the investigation assignment the higher-ups gave her, and he told her that there was no useful information and suggested that they investigate a bit more. But she told him that it was enough, although they only have a speculation. She looked at him intently and told him that the Wu family probably knew what they were escorting, and it must be something big because they were willing to cover the entire net worth of the Southwest. Old Chen realized that she also thought that the ambush was executed by the Wu family's men. Then he asked her if they were going to give up like that when they had spent a lot of effort to get there. 
Their conversation got cut off when one of the escorts on the roof of the cargo container yelled that Gudali had returned. The escorts immediately flocked around Gudali and asked him where he was hiding. They criticized him for having the gall to show himself and said that they were going to report him to the Union for violating the rule of running away. Carrying a bag in his hands, he told them to be quiet and said that he did not run away. As he unraveled the bag, he said that he found something weird in the beginning, and in order to take down the team, the leader must be taken down first. Gudali held the boss decapitated head by its hair as he told the escorts that he ambushed the mountains and finished off the leader of the bandits. As he raised the decapitated head of the boss, he told the escorts that he was saddened by the truth that within the Wu family there was a traitor who was working with the bandits. Ms. Zhang Qi and Old Chen, who were listening to Gu Dali, were speechless. Without any hesitation, Gu Dali revealed that the traitor who did something so obscene and had brought shame to the invincible escort agency was their second master, Wu Qian, who was a white silver level escort. Meanwhile, Wu Qian, who was unaware of the accusations he just received, was still crouching on the ground, hallucinating, and acting crazy. Sinan and Lu Renjia, who were listening to Gu Dali, were also speechless for a moment. Sinan then pointed out that Gu Dali had rushed back to heroically reveal the truth and questioned what kind of drama they were doing. Sinan wondered if the escorts would fall for that as Wu Qian was now a fool. Lu Renjia interrupted him by making a side comment that Wu Qian had always been a fool, and then Sinan continued to say that if they insisted on such reasoning, then the Union would no longer look for any evidence. Sinan did not seem to care that much, and even though they came back for nothing, Lu Renjia told him that they did not rush back for that, and what was happening was not surprising for him as he already knew something was off the night before. Sinan leaned over towards Lu Renjia to continue asking about why they were rushing back, but then he noticed that Lu Renjia was being unexpectedly quiet so he instead asked if he was in a bad mood. Lu Renjia looked worried as he said that he felt something faint when he joined the escort team, but now it was getting stronger. As someone from the top of the cargo container gazed at the both of them with an evil aura, Lu Renjia dropped as he covered his nose and said that there was a familiar but disgusting scent among the team but he could not seem to find the exact location. Hearing this, Sinan let out a sigh of relief as he nonchalantly told Lu Renjia that he had nothing to worry about as long as he was around. As the purple-haired guy let out a sinister smile while looking over Sinan and Lu Renjia, Lu Renjia looked seriously vigilant as he told Sinan that it was very dangerous. Five years ago, military vehicles were in a convoy. Inside one of the vehicles were two men who seemed so afraid to talk to someone that they kept pushing each other to do so. The guy with the mustache sighed and decided he would be the one to talk. Then he coughed a few times and thanked the person in front of him for coming to save the Three Rivers base. The guy in front of him, who had his arms crossed, was Lu Renjia. He had longer hair and looked more mature. As he turned to look at the person speaking, the guy with the mustache handed him something that looked like a floppy disk. The guy told him that it was the detonation key for the Three Rivers base, and he was handing it to him in case the situation at the base wasn't looking good. He sweated profusely as he tried to continue talking about the coming moments, but Lu Renjia interrupted him and told him to keep it to himself because he did not need it to destroy the base. As the guy agreed to what Lu Renjia said, an enormous explosion occurred in the direction in which they were going. Lu Renjia was startled and cursed as a blazing pillar of light appeared in front of them. The guy with the mustache, along with Lu Renjia, immediately got out of the car. As soon as they got out, the guy realized which direction the explosion was coming from. Lu Renjia crouched into a fighting stance as he told his companions not to move. Then a huge hand appeared in front of them, destroying the huge debris and protecting the convoy from it. While the dust settled, the guy with the mustache came over to Lu Renjia and told him that the direction of the explosion was the Three Rivers base. Lu Renjia, who seemed to already know the fact, did not say anything in response. The guy with the mustache was crestfallen, and he kneeled into the ground, thinking that it was all over and they were too late. Lu Renjia just stood there and stared at the pillar of blazing light. Suddenly, something caught Lu Renjia's attention. Ice started to appear out of nowhere, and half of the pillar of light, which was a mushroom cloud, turned to ice and froze so quickly that the people who were watching could not believe what they had just seen. As the guy with the mustache recognized who the tremendous power belonged to, Lu Renjia's thoughts were dragged back into the present by Sinan calling out to him and checking if he was okay. Sinan looked worried as he told Lu Renjia that he felt like he was distracted. Lu Renjia apologized and told Sinan that the scent reminded him of the past and of an old acquaintance who had vanished a long time ago, the Ice King. Meanwhile, the guy with purple hair looked annoyed as he stared at his handheld radio, where someone was calling. He answered the call from his boss and asked why he had called and if he had seen his report. Then he proceeded to say that he was looking after the item like a guard dog, and if there was nothing interesting, he was going to kill all of the people with him and just bring the item back. 
His boss, who was sitting at a desk in his office full of cylindrical glass tanks, confirmed that he saw the report and asked the purple-haired guy on the other line if he was sure that the Crimson Shiro was there. There was silence for a moment as the boss seemed to be deep in thought. As soon as the boss said that he could, he immediately crushed the device in his hands, not letting his boss finish his instructions. Ice appeared in his hands, and he looked extremely delighted that things would now start to be fun. The decapitated head of the bandit's boss was flung into the air. Gudali, who had made a comment about Wu Kayan already being in a mess, threw the head to the side and told the escorts to step aside, as he would be representing the Wu family to enforce their family law. Gudali's nails swiftly grew very long, and he aimed them at Wu Qian who was still crouching on the ground, while Gu Dali said that he would punish the traitor. Wu Kayan was still crouching and acting crazy, unaware that his life was about to end. Then Ms. Zhang Qi called out to Old Chen to try and stop him, but he had already lunged towards Wu Kayan and instantly blocked Gu Dali's attack with his sword. He glared at Gu Dali and told him that Ms. Zhang Qi would be the one to determine if Wu Kayan was a traitor or not. Gu Dali glared back and questioned why the mere supervisor was being a busybody and warned them to watch their backs. Gu Dali thought that it would not be easy to deal with six white silver guards, especially if there was an elite among them, so he decided that he would just tie someone up in this case. Gu Dali charged towards Ms. Zhang Qi at an incredible speed, which startled her. Ms. Zhang Qi just stood there and glared at Gu Dali, who was now reaching out to grab her, and instructed her to command his troops to stay put. But as he tried to grab her, her image dissipated into thin air, which extremely surprised Gu Dali. Ms. Zhang Qi was already standing behind Gu Dali, and as he turned to glare at her, he realized that she was an awakener. Ms. Zhang Qi crossed her arms and smugly smiled at Gu Dali as she told him that it was just part of her training course as a receptionist, and that she had something to ask him. She stared intensely at Gu Dali with her gleaming eyes and asked him what the thing was that made Wu Dai use his own younger brother and where it was. Gu Dali cursed when he realized that Ms. Zhang Qi was a psychic type awakener, and that he was now under her influence. Unwillingly, Gu Dali started to talk, saying that he did not know what the item was but that he needed to steal it. When he was still going to say something more about the item, someone interrupted him and said that the item was with him. It was the purple-haired guy. He leaped on top of the cargo containers and landed in between Ms. Zhang Qi and Gu Dali, holding out a small box in his hands and saying that he did not expect her to be interested in the EPC and found it interesting. All the while Ms. Zhang Qi was wondering who the guy was and what an EPC was. The purple-haired guy confidently smiled as he told her that it was game over for those who bear ulterior motives towards the Wu family, even if it was her. Lu Renjia immediately called out to Sin and Pei as soon as he realized that it was all a trap. As soon as Sinan responded, Lu Renjia started igniting and told Sinan to go as far as he could. Sinan looked worried as he expressed his objection to running away without him. Lu Renjia was now fully transformed and told Sinan that the purple-haired guy clearly came prepared for the fight about to come, so he would not be able to protect him. Meanwhile, Old Chen stood in front of Ms. Zhang Qi when he sensed the danger and told her to hurry and run to the Crimson Shura. However, she yelled at him, telling him not to act impulsively. Old Chen did not listen to her and immediately lunged at the purple-haired guy, saying he would stop him. But upon hearing his words and noticing his attack, the purple-haired guy just smiled and repeated what Old Chen said in a questioning manner. Ms. Zhang Qi was startled, and she raised her arms in front of her for protection when she saw ice shards float in the air. The purple-haired guy was now enveloped by ice, from his hair down to his hands, and ice shards were floating behind him as he extended his arms, gesturing for an attack while mocking what Old Chen had said and asking if he was kidding him. Huge ice spikes grew from the ground, which caught the rest of the escorts off guard. They were frozen in place and were not able to defend themselves. They raised their arms to protect themselves, preparing to get hit. But then Lu Rengia appeared in front of them and protected them from the ice spikes. Lu Rengia immediately looked back and checked on the escorts to see if they were alright. Then he instructed them to get out of there quickly. The escorts could not believe what they had just seen. They were frozen in place with their mouths agape for a moment. And when they came to, although still unsure, they thanked Lu Rengia. The purple-haired guy, who now looked like a nice guy, was walking around the area where many escorts were frozen. He was thinking about dropping by the Tianfu base later and wiping out the entire Wu family so that he could sleep well that night. While walking around, he found Wu Kayan still crouching and shivering in fear. The guy grabbed him by the hair and upon recognizing that he was from the Wu family, he decided to make him his toy. He placed the box he was holding earlier over Wu Kayan's eyes, and it opened, revealing a slimy, wriggling creature that emerged from it. The creature slithered and wrapped itself around Wu Kayan's eyeballs, causing him to scream in pain. Someone leaped over the ice swiftly and lunged towards the ice guy for an attack. It was Lu Rengia. As he towered over the ice guy, the guy smiled and said that he would like to play with him, but he was not his opponent. He jumped to evade Lu Rengia's punch and landed at the top of a pillar of ice 
sneering and looking down at Lu Rengia. As soon as Lu Rengia noticed the fat figure wriggling beside him, he asked the ice guy if that was the appetizer and told him that he lacked creativity. Wu Kayan was now extremely disfigured, with tiny arms growing out of his head, and his stomach bulging like there was something that would come out as he walked toward Lu Rengia, still saying the words he usually says when he turns into a crazy mess. As he charged a ball of energy in front of his mouth, he called out to Sin and Pei and said that he was doomed. At that exact moment, Lu Rengia did a quick palm punch when he recognized Wu Kayan. But he was startled when Wu Kayan fired a powerful beam towards him, and he was not able to dodge it fully. Sinan was running away with the other escorts when the beam of light went past above them, and the ground rumbled. They all looked back to see where the beam came from and wondered what that was. Sinan stood in place and seemed to be deep in thought as the rest of the escorts continued to run away. The curly-haired escort from earlier noticed Sinan and asked why he stopped then told him that it was too dangerous to be so close. Sinan stood there, seeming to hesitate to say something. With his mouth wide open, the disfigured Wu Kayan kept groaning and declared that he was hungry. In front of him sat Lu Rengia, who had his one huge arm from the back dissolved due to the beam. Lu Rengia seemed to be taken aback and was speechless for a moment, and then he realized that he was careless. The disfigured Wu Kayan was now making a fuss and throwing a tantrum about being hungry. He cursed and said that he was so hungry that the tiny arms on his head started to grow, continuing to disfigure his body more. Wu Kayan's face could no longer be recognized as his body continued to transform and become disfigured. Looking at him from a distance, he now looked like multiple tentacles of different shapes and sizes clumped together. As Lu Rengia watched Wu Kayan continue to change his appearance, he thought that the power should not be underestimated. He was also wary of the guy looming over him in the pillar of ice. The disfigured Wu Kayan fired another beam, but Lu Rengia was able to quickly dodge it this time. Lu Rengia jumped right above the disfigured Wu Kayan. He summoned his gigantic fiery claw and was about to end Wu Kayan when he noticed something. He saw someone lying on top of the disfigured Wu Kayan, and he recognized that it was Ms. Zhang Qi, crouched in a fatal position with her clothes tattered. The disfigured Wu Kayan noticed that Lu Rengia was distracted, so he grabbed the chance and started to squeeze him in between his slithering long arms and throw him away. Lu Rengia stood up and was annoyed because the attack had hurt him a little. He noticed that Ms. Zhang Qi was still breathing, and he was now overwhelmed and unsure of what he should do. Someone called out to him suddenly and told him to run, and when he looked back to see who it was, he saw Old Chen sitting on the ground with ice poking out of his shoulders and arms. Lu Rengia could not believe that Old Chen was still alive, he could not help but ask him about it. But the bloody Old Chen also did not know why he survived and told him not to talk about the matter. As Old Chen told Lu Rengia to leave the place quickly, the disfigured Wu Kayan had now grown even more and was now gigantic in size. He said that even if he could easily slay the monster, his concern was the frozen tower that had shown up before at the Three Rivers base. He was concerned about the Platinum Level Ice King's Eternal Winter Realm, and in addition to the weird item from earlier, the situation seemed off and he felt that it was most likely targeted at Lu Rengia. Lu Rengia scratched his temple and told Old Chen to save his breath as he was already badly injured. He questioned why Old Chen was telling him all those things, so Old Chen told him about an escort called Ivan Jav who was involved in the battle at the Three Rivers base five years ago. Hearing what Old Chen said, Lu Rengia immediately remembered the guy with the mustache from five years ago. Old Chen said that it was his brother and that he has always hoped to meet him again to thank him for saving him. That is why he could not watch him die in vain. As the disfigured Wu Kayan fired another beam, Old Chen looked horrified and thought that it was all over. But Lu Rengia stepped in front of him and easily blocked the attack with big arms growing from his back. As Lu Rengia deflected the remaining parts of the beam, he told Old Chen that he knew it was a trap. Lu Rengia looked ahead and told Old Chen that it saved him the hassle of finding the person, so it was pretty good for him that way. Old Chen told him that he was being reckless and that he had no chance of winning even if he was the Crimson Shura. Then, Old Chen proceeded to address Lu Rengia as Sin and Pei. With perfect comedic timing, Sin and Pei emerged from behind Lu Rengia and asked Old Chen if he called for him, which startled and confused Old Chen. Sinan tossed a thermos and said that Wang Zhai had told him it was something important, so he was told to bring it to him. Lu Renjia caught the thermos and asked Sinan why he was back again when he told him to run away because it was dangerous there. Sinan immediately hid behind the ice crystals and told Lu Renjia that he knew that, but he felt like it was unsettling to leave him behind and escape on his own. But as soon as Sinan noticed Lu Rengia's injuries, he quickly went out of hiding, went to Lu Rengia, and hurriedly started collecting blood from his injuries, saying that it was a waste, which confused Lu Rengia. While Sinan was collecting blood, Old Chen yelled at them, warning them that the disfigured Wu Kayan was coming through. Sinan frantically ran away from the scene while yelling that the beast looked familiar, as Lu Rengia grabbed the disfigured Wu Kayan with his big arms to stop it. Lu Rengia calmly poured a drink for himself from the thermos as he informed Sinan that the beast was Wu Kayan, 
Then, as he was drinking, he remembered something and called out for Sin and Pei, who immediately went out from hiding behind the ice crystals and asked why he was called. Lu Renjia tossed the thermos cup aside as his injured arm began to grow back. He then told Sinan to wait for the opportunity to take old Chen to a safe place and thanked him. Meanwhile, the Ice King was sitting on an ice throne, tossing the box in his hands and wondering why Lu Rengia had not killed the infected guy yet. He then noticed that it suddenly became so quiet down there and wondered if Lu Rengia had been killed by the infected Wu Kian. He was startled when the infected Wu Kian suddenly appeared in front of him. Someone asked him if he did not feel bored sitting there alone, and it was Lu Rengia who was carrying the infected Wu Kian with him. The Ice King looked up and smirked. Lu Rengia then tossed the infected Wu Kian at him and told him that the two of them should fight him together. A fog was created due to the impact, and from it, the Ice King emerged with a full suit of armor and a set of wings, expressing how impressed he was with Lu Rengia. Both of them kicked each other at the same time, and their legs collided with each other, causing a huge shockwave to reverberate through the entire area. The wave reached Sinan and Old Chen, who were almost blown away by the strength of the gust of wind. While witnessing the fight, Sinan told Old Chen that this was the first time he had seen someone whose strength was comparable to Lu Rengia's and asked him if the Ice King's level was platinum. But instead of answering his question, Old Chen wondered to himself how it was possible that Lu Rengia and the Ice King were able to fight to a draw. As Sinan glanced over at Old Chen with a confused look on his face, Old Chen explained that the Crimson Shiro was only a pseudo-platinum in the rumors, and he could only advance to the platinum level because of his invincible strength and his title that he kills like hell. The Ice King acknowledged Lu Rengia's strength and told him that he was pretty strong. But then he told him that he was unfortunate and snapped his fingers. Ice shards grew out from all directions, and they were all being aimed at Lu Rengia. Lu Rengia was impaled by the shards as the Ice King declared that it was his awakened realm, while Sinan called out for Lu Rengia with worry. The Ice King smirked as he told Lu Rengia that it was impossible for him to beat him in his eternal winter tower, and asked Lu Rengia if he envied him as the Crimson Shura, Sinan Pei. While drooping and looking lifeless while being impaled by multiple sharp ice spears, Lu Rengia confirmed that he did envy him and left. Upon hearing what the Ice King had just said, Old Chen looked appalled and could not say anything. While Sinan looked annoyed and had his hands on his hips, saying that he believed that Lu Rengia had advanced to the platinum level by pranking and that he was now thinking of changing his name. According to legend, the most powerful people could extend their power into the space around their bodies, and they were able to freely dominate the realm, which is called the Awakened Realm, and it infinitely strengthened the Awakena. While trying to keep themselves from being blown away by the strong gust of wind, Old Chen said that the Crimson Shura absolutely cannot enter the tower. He then asked Sinan if he was stupid or if he had an ability they did not know about. Unfortunately, Sinan said that he had never seen Lu Rengia act according to common sense. Sinan looked up and told Old Chen that he also remembered that Wang Xi had mentioned the Awakened Realm and that Lu Rengia could not access it. Old Chen looked worried and was sweating as he looked at Sinan. He said they were definitely screwed and asked how he could still be calm. Sinan appeared deep in thought and did not respond for a moment. Then he told Old Chen that it was pointless to be nervous because he could not get away from the danger anyway. Lu Rengia was still hanging in midair, impaled by ice spears. He was laughing and complaining that it hurt when he laughed, which made the Ice King question him about what he was laughing at. He called the ice piercing him popsicles and told the Ice King that it finally made him recall why the Masked Man's ability struck him as familiar. When the Ice King heard about the Masked Man, he immediately thought of Lin Hansu. Lu Rengia told him that his popsicle was not bad and that it was stronger than Lin Hansu's, but he was still weak compared to the real Ice Sage King. The Ice King frowned as he heard what Lu Rengia said, while Lu Rengia's flame started to burn more intensely than before. The Ice King lined up ice shards to block Lu Rengia's attack while he wondered if it was the strange flame that Lin Hansu had told him about. Lu Rengia jumped into the air and shattered the Ice King's defenses with one punch. The Ice King then created a sword made of ice and swung it towards Lu Rengia, but he was able to block it with his arms. Lu Rengia was unscathed, and the ice sword was broken in half. The Ice King took a step back, annoyed. He stared intently at Lu Rengia and was surprised by the kind of power that he had, thinking that it was like a demonic beast, but then he said that it was a shame. Multiple ice shards were now pointed at Lu Rengia, while the Ice King declared that Lu Rengia was better off staying in the Eternal Winter Tower. Lu Rengia then called out his move, Blood Burst. Then the blood that Lu Rengia shed, including the one Sinan collected in his container, rose up like flames. This startled Sinan and made him wonder what was going on. Lu Rengia was surrounded by his flaming blood, breaking and melting the ice shards that were about to hit him. The Ice King groaned as a part of his armor broke when some of Lu Rengia's blood grazed his arm. He looked at his injured arm and realized that what had damaged him was the blood that Lu Rengia had just shed while being impaled. 
As the burning blood surrounded and circled around Lu Rengia, the Ice King told him that getting himself hurt on purpose to gather all that blood was a brilliant strategy. Lu Rengia was confused by what the Ice King just said, and as he absorbed the blood into his body and stuck it in his back, forming scorching wings that looked like those of a butterfly, he told the Ice King that he did not think of that when he got hurt. As the Ice King patched his injured arm with ice, he thought about what the document said about Lu Rengia and that he had become stronger and was completely different from how he was earlier. The Ice King was planning something as he brought out the tiny box and opened it again. This time, it was making ticking sounds like a clock, which woke up the sobbing, disfigured Wu Kayan. Noticing that the disfigured Wu Kayan had started moving, Lu Renjia wondered how it was able to wake up. Wu Kayan underwent another transformation, and his appearance now looked like a huge, slithering braided mess of hair. Lu Renjia said that Wu Kayan had gotten even more disgusting, and then he noticed the ticking sound that was coming from the box and wondered if that box was a remote control. Meanwhile, the disfigured Wu Kayan growled and had his mouth wide open while performing a leap attack towards Lu Renjia. Wu Kayan has grown so tremendously that his head is now bigger than Lu Renjia's. Lu Renjia groaned as he blocked the disfigured Wu Kayan's attack and told him to step aside and sit there quietly as he punched his head. But then the Ice King snapped his fingers, making a gigantic ice hand appear and grab Lu Rengia. Lu Rengia got annoyed, and the Ice King bragged that Lu Rengia could not go freely wherever he wanted in the tower. The Ice King then tapped the disfigured Wu Kayan to command him and called him a freak. Wu Kayan, who now looked like a scaleless fat dragon with long, slimy arms as wings, started to charge another beam attack while protesting being called a freak. The disfigured Wu Kayan turned to look at Lu Rengia and told him that he remembered him and begged for his help. He then released the beam attack, which made Sin and worry about Lu Rengia, while on the other hand, Old Chen's concern was hearing the infected Wu Kayan talk. Lu Rengia was not able to dodge the beam attack because of the ice hand holding him, so the beam hit him head on. But the Ice King was startled when he saw that Lu Rengia was able to defend himself from the attack by using his flaming blood. Lu Rengia talked to the disfigured Wu Kayan and told him that his way of asking for help was unexpected but corrected him by telling him that he was not some ordinary black iron. The Ice King was startled when Lu Rengia started to release more blood, and he wondered why he did that when he had just absorbed it. Lu Rengia loomed over the Ice King and the disfigured Wu Kayan, recreating a six-armed god image with its arms surrounding him. Old Chen was baffled to see the tower melting, while Sinan asked if what they were witnessing was another realm. Lu Rengia slashed everything around him, especially the ice and the disfigured Wu Kayan. Lu Rengia was so fast that the Ice King could not understand what was happening, and he too wondered if it was a realm. As Wu Kayan's face started to dissipate, he told Lu Rengia that he knew who he was and thanked him with a smile on his face. Lu Rengia was now holding Ms. Zhang Qi in his arms while he said his goodbyes to Wu Kayan. As Lu Rengia carefully placed Ms. Zhang Qi on the ground, he said that Wu Kayan knew who he was at first glance, so he was better than the others in that respect. As he turned to look at Ms. Zhang Qi's face to check if she was still alive, he was surprised when he was greeted with a pink slimy beast with only one eye. The Ice King, who was still floating in the air and looking down on Lu Rengia, told him that he was now trapped. Huge chunks of ice were now crumbling down as the Eternal Winter Tower started melting. Lu Rengia, who was holding onto Ms. Zhang Qi, realized that it was the creature that latched onto Wu Kayan and infected him, as its pink tentacles started to show up and wriggle around. Lu Rengia cursed and immediately backed away from Ms. Zhang Qi, saying that he did not expect the Ice King to use such tactics. The Ice King told him that he was quite responsive but that he was too late. Lai Rengia was startled when he looked at his arms and saw that they were already starting to get infected by the pink tentacles. The tentacles grew and grabbed Lu Rengia's head, latching itself onto him. The Ice King stepped onto the ground and walked towards Lu Rengia as he explained that the thing invades the brainstem and enhances the Awakener's ability, but as a side effect, the Awakener would be controlled by the Prion in the square box. He thought that it was a waste to let a pseudo-platinum use it. But Lu Rengia's ability was quite unique. He told Lu Rengia that he was useful for their new project research and welcomed him to the Water Bear organization. Sinan was hiding with Old Chen behind a huge ice crystal. He was worried about Lu Rengia and had his gun pulled out, ready to fight. As the Ice King approached Lu Rengia, he observed that his appearance did not get deformed. It was a rare occurrence, but he did not continue to pay it any mind. The Ice King held out the ticking box in front of Lu Rengia and commanded him to go back with him and let his master conduct his research on him gradually. As soon as the Ice King found it strange that Lu Rengia was not reacting, blood spurted out of Lu Rengia's face, and then he asked the Ice King what reaction he wanted from him. 
The gory scene of Lu Renji's entire body spurting out an enormous amount of blood startled the Ice King and made him back away. The pink tentacles, which the Ice King called a virus, were launched into the air by Lu Renji's blood and dissipated into thin air shortly, and it made the Ice King remember Lu Renji's special ability, which explained why he was not under his control. As the Ice King flew in the air, he thought that it was interesting how Lu Rengia eliminated the virus from his body with his blood. Lu Rengia was now hunched over, he had covered himself in the area around him with his blood, and the Ice King commented on what he just did and said that he had injured himself badly in order to eliminate the virus. The Ice King looked relaxed as he told Lu Rengia that what he did was a good idea but reminded him that, in his current state, he was still at his mercy. Lu Rengia was now starting to undo his transformation and told the Ice King that what he just said sounded good. He sat down in the middle of his own bloody mess as his fire started to die down, and he provoked the Ice King to come down and catch him. What Lu Rengia just said made the Ice King pause for a moment and collect his thoughts, as he looked at the pool of blood that was on the ground. The Ice King started to wonder if Lu Rengia deliberately spread blood on the floor to wait for him to come down. And then the realization hit him that if Lu Rengia did the move he did earlier, he might not be able to handle it. After processing the situation, the Ice King decided to let Lu Rengia off this time. Lu Rengia smiled confidently as he stared at the Ice King. While the Ice King started to fly away, he bid his farewell, saying that he would remember him for destroying the virus, and called him Sin and Pei. Hearing this, Sinan hysterically yelled at the Ice King, who was now at a distance, questioning him about what he was saying and daring him not to run away. Sinan stopped what he was doing when he heard Lu Rengia make sounds. He was coughing up blood and squirting it out of his wounds at the same time. Sinan yelled, his voice filled with worry, calling out for his master as he saw Lu Rengia lose his consciousness. As soon as Sinan approached Lu Rengia, he noticed that he was snoring, and a snot bubble was coming out of his nose, which made Sinan question if he was asleep. Lu Rengia woke up on a medical bed, and Wang Xi was sitting beside him. Wang Xi immediately asked him how he was feeling as soon as she noticed that he was awake. He did not answer the question and instead asked Wang Xi how long he had been unconscious. Sinan was leaning against the door when Lu Rengia sat up, revealing that his entire torso was wrapped in bandages. Wang Xi told him that he had been unconscious for 20 hours, 31 seconds, and 6 milliseconds. Lu Rengia threw another question, and he was annoyed this time when he asked why he was bandaged the way he was, looking like a dumpling. Sinan coughed as Wang Xi gestured towards him and told Lu Rengia to ask him. Sinan explained that he saw Lu Rengia covered in wounds and blood and he did not know how to bandage them. Lu Rengia looked at him with judgmental eyes, saying that his wounds would still heal even if he bandaged slowly, which made Sinan burst into rage as he confirmed that the wounds disappeared when he was halfway through the bandage, but there was nothing else he could do. Sinan continued to nag at him, saying that he was bleeding profusely and was so unconscious that he was worried about him. Lu Rengia stopped for a moment upon realizing what Sinan must have gone through, and then he apologized. Lu Rengia was able to easily unravel the bandages as he told Sinan that he was unconscious not because of his wounds but because of his ability. He sat down at the edge of the bed, opening a thermos in his hands, and told Sinan that he would be fine after drinking hot water. Sinan looked puzzled as he heard Lu Rengia's explanation, as he did not understand what he meant. Wang Xi looked baffled when she realized that Sinan did not know that for some unknown reason, Lu Rengia's ability time was limited, and the more intense the battle, the shorter the duration of the ability was. But Sinan retorted, asking Wang Xi how he would know when Lu Rengia usually defeats his enemies with a single punch. While drinking his hot water, the disheveled Lu Rengia told Sinan that he could only last three minutes in his rage form. Sinan went hysterical when he realized how short the duration of his ability was and asked what exactly the hidden reason was. Lu Rengia, who was calmly drinking his hot water, told him that it was hard to explain in a few words but that it would be the same as some kind of protection mechanism. Wang Xi chimed in and confirmed that what Lu Rengia said was true, and it was the reason why she asked asked Sinan to try the new technology she created in advance, and the outcome was very impressive. Wang Zhe stood up and proudly showed them a cylindrical glass tank full of blood as she continued to explain that Lu Rengia's blood was inactive after a day away from the body, and the container needed to be tested on a large scale before it was ready to use. So she took a little more blood while Lu Rengia was unconscious, and this made Lu Rengia spit out the hot water that he was drinking peacefully. Lu Rengia was sweating as he confirmed with Wang Xi if that was the reason why he had been in a coma for 20 hours, and he was worried if it was really safe for her to draw that much blood. Wang Xi's atmosphere turned serious, and she looked worried as she told Lu Rengia that Sinan's description of the water bear's strange technology made her uneasy, so she needed to analyze his body sooner. Lu Rengia asked Sinan about Wu Dai, who should have some clues about the whole incident, and Sinan told him that Ms. Zhang Qi had arrested him as soon as she got back 
and he would be arraigned that day. As Sinan asked Flu Renjia if he wanted to take a look at the arraignment now that he had woken up, Ms. Zhang Qi and the silver-haired lady burst into the room while looking mad, telling Sinan that there was no need to go as Wu Dai had disappeared. Sinan was surprised by their arrival and was confused about what they meant when they said Wu Dai had disappeared, and Ms. Zhang Qi told him that they meant what they said in the literal sense, that they had lost Wu Dai's tracks again. Ms. Zhang Qi explained further and told them that she arrested him yesterday as an inspector and had planned to go to the arraignment that morning. And that was when she found out that Wu Dai was no longer in jail and the records showed that the arraignment had already been completed. However, when she reviewed the trial documents, she did not find any record of it. And she also did not find any record of his transfers to another jail, and that was when she knew they were tricked. Sinan looked mad and told Ms. Zhang Qi that this was something that could not be done by someone with low authority. Ms. Zhang Qi adjusted her glasses and told Sinan that he was right, that there was obviously some corruption in the higher-ups of the Tianfu base. With his hands under his chin, acting like he was thinking, Lu Renjia proudly chimed in on the conversation, asking how many higher-ups there were so he could visit them at night. Upon hearing that, Sinan panicked and told him to stop thinking like that. He then asked if he planned to beat the higher-ups one by one. Ms. Zhang Qi agreed with what Sinan was saying and told Lu Renjia that his action would only alert them, so they needed to find other ways to approach the higher-ups. While they were discussing, Wang Zai chimed into the conversation, looking extremely puzzled, and asked them what the big deal was about approaching higher-ups. The four of them stared at Wang Zai, looking extremely dumbfounded as they realized the power she held as an aboriginal. Wang Zai remembered something about a document she had asked her uncle Kayan to prepare for her previously, and she was looking for it in her drawer. She looked at them expectantly as she presented the document with a seal that she was holding, and it said, Escort Agency Assistance Program in Tianfu Base. Ms. Zhang Qi inspected the document that Wang Zai held out, and she thought that it was a truly great idea, as the dart support plan was a common item used by fire bases to increase their dart board power, and because the relationship with aboriginals is very popular with each branch's senior management. The only problem they had at hand was choosing a dart board because they could not just find them randomly. As Ms. Zhang Qi was presenting the problem to the group, she trailed off and stared into space, looking like she was in deep thought. Everyone was puzzled as Ms. Zhang Qi immediately turned her head towards Sinan, who was as clueless as everyone else. While they were walking somewhere, Sinan looked ecstatic as he held the document in his hands, while Lu Renjia beside him just looked at him bewildered. He did not expect Ms. Zhang Qi to ask her to be in charge of their plan to go directly to the establishment of a new dart board. He considered it a success. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia looked concerned because he never thought that they would need to pay such a large guarantee. He only thought that it would be fine for them to submit a form for that type of request. Sinan looked at him and explained that what they paid was a security deposit because if a high-bound task fails, the patron would suffer the losses, but with the security deposit, it will keep the dart master from escaping if the dart fails. Once the dart board becomes established, they could accept all types of missions above the regimental level. Both of them stopped walking as Sinan continued to explain to Lu Rengia about the dart board. He said that the Alliance also provides benefits to the board, such as mission priority, and rented offices, and completing the mission in the name of the board will earn an additional 15% of the team's earnings. There are many benefits there, so it was naturally difficult to apply. Lu Rengia praised Sinan for doing his homework as expected, and Sinan looked happy, scratching the back of his head while bragging about the strength of his gold-level escort that was handy. While Sinan and Lu Rengia were by the door, two crestfallen escorts went out of the room, complaining that their request for a dart board had been denied because they could not judge his strength as he only had a few dart delivery tasks. They said that the examiner they just encountered was said to be very strict, so they made the application on the day he was not on duty, but the examiner had been changed. Sinan's happiness was immediately replaced with gloominess after he heard what the two escorts just said, and Lu Rengia, who looked worried, confirmed it with Sinan and asked if they came there only for dart delivery duties. Sinan was now backing out, suggesting to Lu Rengia that they should come again tomorrow, but Lu Rengia pushed him towards the door and told him not to care about the examiner, and that they should go in first. Ms. Zhang Qi was stamping their documents, and Sinan went hysterical and complained about why she was the one doing the examination, and that he spent half the day feeling nervous about it. She ignored Sinan's complaints and told him to talk less with her in public while she checked up on Lu Rengia's health, to which Lu Rengia said that he did not find any problems. Lu Rengia looked curious as he looked for old Chen and asked Ms. Zhang Qi why he was not standing next to him. Ms. Zhang Qi simply told him that old Chen went back to his job. She happily continued to say that the Union has found some amazing information, and that they have mastered the genetic enhancement fluid in addition to the items to greatly increase the awakening rate. So it seems that old Chen will soon be able to reach a higher level. Her expression then turned serious as she analyzed Lu Rengia, 
who appeared to be fine but had injuries that are not to be taken lightly. She also added that his face would be remembered by those people, so he should be more careful. Lu Rengia looked at her with doubt and was silent for a moment. Then he chose to ask her what kind of person she was. She stood up from her desk and told him that he was the front desk receptionist and that all he just needed to know was that she was not an enemy. She then gestured for them to follow her and said that the test was randomly assigned. But if it was bothersome, she could change it for them. While Ms. Zhang Qi explained to them that their task was to deliver some things, and their mission was to protect the village from demons and beasts, Sinan was sweating, thinking about how Ms. Zhang Qi told him not to talk with her, and then she was the one who kept talking to Lu Renjia. Ms. Zhang Qi looked at the documents and told them that the mission would take a week, and the location was Lin Village. As soon as Sinan heard the location, he froze and looked conflicted. Ms. Zhang Qi seemed to notice Sinan's reaction and offered to change the test. But Sinan, although he was looking grim, insisted that there was no need for such a change. With a serious face, he looked at Lu Rengia and requested that they pick that test, adding that he also had something else to discuss. A girl with long hair, whose face was covered by shadows and was wearing a dress, reached out and called out to Sinan. Sinan, who was wearing a mask and was frozen in place, had his reminiscing shattered when someone from reality called out to him. It was Lu Rengia who called him and pointed out that he was spacing out, for which Sinan apologized. Even though Lu Rengia gave him some insensitive comments for desperately wearing a useless mask, he was worried about him and checked up on him to see if he was okay and wanted to take a break. Sinan looked deep in thought, but he told Lu Rengia that he was fine and that they were just a few miles away from arriving at Lin Village, so it was better if they rested once they arrived. Carrying his huge backpack, Lu Rengia led the way and told Sinan that they should hurry up, but Sinan pointed in a different direction, telling Lu Rengia, that it was the right way to the village. Sinan and Lu Rengia were startled when they heard someone screaming for help. Lu Rengia smugly pointed in the direction he was going earlier, and said that the scream came from that direction, and Sinan nagged him that it was just a coincidence, and there was nothing to be proud of. A beautiful lady with white hair and red eyes was being chased by a demonic beast that looked like a dinosaur. The beast's fangs were about to reach the lady, but it seemed that the beast was playing with its food because instead of biting her, it headbutted her. The force threw her away and made her bump into a huge rock. She was in pain and was trying to get off the ground. As she sat down, the beast was already in front of her, bearing its fangs and ready to attack, which made her feel that everything was over. But then a gun was fired, and a bullet went through one of the beast's red eyes. The lady protected herself with her arms as blood splattered when the head of the beast exploded. The one who eliminated the beast was Sinan. He was doing one of his poses again as he said that multi-eyed birds are common demonic beasts in the area. Sinan checked on the lady to see if she was okay and offered his hand so she could stand up. The lady was reaching out to the hand he offered, thanking him for arriving in time. But then the lady squealed, and her expression was full of disgust. Sinan was startled when the lady asked him why he was there and realized that the lady recognized him. Instead of accepting the hand he had offered, the lady slapped his hand and told him not to touch her. Her expressions were full of contempt as she mocked Sinan for having the nerve to come back and for thinking that no one would recognize him if he wore a mask. Sinan, who still had his hands extended, was frozen in place and could not say anything. He just stared at the lady while sweating a lot. As the lady told him that she did not need him to save her, he saw the lady without a face who was wearing a dress earlier in his trip down memory lane. Lu Rengia stood behind Sinan, looking surprised, and asked him if he knew her. The lady ran away while telling Sinan to stay away from her, which made Lu Rengia figure out why he was wearing a mask and comment that his fate with people was bad. Sinan told him that he did not have the qualifications to make that comment. With a puzzled look on his face, Lu Rengia asked Sinan where the lady was going and told him that he saw that there were many demonic beasts in the direction that she was going, which made Sinan panic and decide that they should hurry up and chase her. The lady was making her way through the forest, and she looked annoyed. Then she turned around and looked at the laid-back Lu Rengia and asked him why he was following her. Lu Rengia told her that he was worried about her safety as there were a lot of monsters in the area, so he advised her not to run around too much. The lady looked like she was collecting her thoughts and was silent for a moment, and then she asked Lu Rengia if he was an escort. The one who confirmed and answered the question was Sinan. He was having a very hard time, dragging Lu Rengia's backpack as he told the lady that they needed to transport supplies into the village. He was huffing and catching his breath and requested that Lu Rengia walk slower as he could not keep up with him while carrying all the luggage. The lady glared at Sinan, and while she was unaware of the danger looming behind her, she begrudgingly told Sinan that he should know where the village was so they did not have to follow her. 
The demonic beast growled and was about to pounce on the lady, but Lu Rengia swiftly came to the rescue and eliminated the beast in one blow, while he reminded the lady that he had told her the place was swarming with monsters. As blood splattered in front of her, the lady was frozen in place and looked at Lu Rengia with awe. Sinan looked worried and told Lu Rengia to calm down and reminded him that even if Wang Xi had told him he looked like he had fully recovered on the outside, he still could not move around recklessly. But before Sinan could even properly finish his sentence, blood started spurting out from Lu Rengia, which startled both Sinan and the lady. The lady immediately checked up on Lu Rengia to see if he was alright. Lu Rengia looked extremely refreshed as he drank hot water from his thermos. The three of them were taking a break, Sinan was leaning back on a tree trunk while Lu Rengia and the lady sat over Lu Rengia's luggage. The lady was munching on the bread she was holding with all haste. Sinan noticed it and asked her why she was eating so fast and told her that she seemed to have been hungry for a long time. The lady did not answer Sinan and turned her back on him, which made Sinan think that she was still ignoring him. Lu Rengia looked at her with concern and asked if the union had not been sending supplies to their place or if the set monthly quota was not enough. The lady turned back to answer Lu Rengia and said that the union had been sending supplies, but it had been a while since they stopped coming. Sinan could not believe what he had just heard, and he did not think it was possible, as he had been asking people each season. Even though the lady looked away from Sinan, she answered him this time and told him that it was a possibility that the gathering of monsters had blocked the delivery of supplies. She also added that there have been people in the village who have disappeared without a trace, and the village chief said that those people had been kidnapped, which terrified everyone. Nobody was brave enough to go outside, which in turn made the fields deserted. While the lady continued to say that the food source had been dwindling, so she decided to go outside herself and find a solution, Sinan and Lu Rengia were both stuck on the topic of disappearances. Looking at the monster that Lu Rengia had defeated earlier, Sinan remembered that he had not seen any records about those beasts when he was at the base. Lu Rengia thought for a moment and then told Sinan that he was afraid it was one of those beasts that was not recorded within the Union's archives, while he stared intently at the unusual mark that could be seen at the back of the beast's carcass. Someone was being torn apart, limb from limb, by a demonic beast, while a young boy helplessly kneeled, looking up at the feasting beast. The boy looked so helpless and out of it his blood splattered all around him, and a voice asked him if he was going to run for the rest of his life. Sinan was startled when someone called out to him, and blood was also splattered around him when he came to his senses. The one who called out to him was Lu Rengia, who was kicking the beast that was about to attack him. Lu Rengia grabbed his huge backpack and threw it at the beast effortlessly while telling Sinan to wake up and stop spacing out in the middle of the fight. Blood splattered on the ground as the beast got crushed by Lu Rengia's huge backpack. Lu Rengia let out a sigh of relief while Sinan apologized and thanked Lu Rengia for saving him. Blood was squirting again out of Lu Rengia's entire body as he checked up on Sinan and worried that he almost got slashed by the beast, while Sinan panicked when he saw the blood squirt out of Lu Rengia, and he apologized for spacing out earlier. Then with a mischievous smile on his face, Sinan pulled out a container that he used to catch Lu Rengia's blood that was squirting, saying that a lot of it came out so it should not be wasted. Lu Rengia looked at Sinan full of doubt and asked him if it was safe for him to suspect that he tricked him into acting recklessly. The lady laughed and mockingly looked down at them, saying that Sinan had always been like that. She looked at them with her eyes full of contempt while she warned Lu Rengia that he better be careful with Sinan and told him that his words may be sweet, but once he was in danger, he would leave him and run away just like he did before. Sinan looked guilty and said nothing while Lu Rengia looked extremely confused by what he heard. Then the lady turned away from them and told them to go back once they were done delivering the supplies to the village. Lu Rengia noticed that Sinan looked uneasy and looked like he wanted to say something but chose not to. The village was really quiet when they arrived. They were surprised when they looked at the village notice board and saw that it was full of missing posters of people that Sinan recognized. The lady walked around the village and looked where everyone was. As they continued to walk and found nothing, Sinan wondered why the village had become so deserted, while on the other hand, Lu Rengia was wondering how long they had been walking. The lady knocked on a barred door, calling out for a third uncle. A small window on the door opened, revealing only the eyes of the man outside, who immediately recognized her as the Lin family's girl and asked her what happened. She introduced Sinan and Lu Rengia and said that she brought back two escorts from the outside who came to their village to deliver supplies. Upon hearing that they were escorts, the third uncle was ecstatic and fumbled to open his locks. The lady started walking away and waved them off, saying that she would get going, and if they had a question, they could ask the village head. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia placed his huge backpack on the ground while waiting for the village head to open the door, wondering how many locks there were. Sinan had that look of uneasiness again, as if he had something to say but could not, as he watched the lady walk away. The village chief was finally able to open his door, he had a lot of paraphernalia that was said to keep demons away, including two lit candles at his forehead that mimicked a horn. 
he greeted them by asking if they were from the Tianfu base. He then commended them for breaking through the demonic beast and coming all the way to the village, and then told them to leave the supplies there and go back. Sinan was surprised by what the village chief said and explained that they also had a mission to protect the village for a week, while Lu Rengia, on the other hand, was focusing on the village heads get up and commented that the style was quite chic. The village chief looked lifeless and stared at them for a moment. Then he told them that there was no need and told them to go back. Sinan tried to protest, but the village chief started to close his door and told them again to go back. Sinan told the village chief to wait and not close that door as he forced his way to the door and his face was squished in the process. Then he pulled out his white silver level badge and presented it to the village chief while claiming that he was a white silver level escort. The village chief's lifeless eyes were wide open as he saw the white silver level badge, and Sinan continued to convince him by saying that he was almost a gold level escort. The village chief opened the door again and looked around the premises, and while emitting an ominous aura, the village chief waved at the two of them to come in and talk. Sinan and Lu Rengia entered the village chief's house, where they saw many weird concoctions, burnt-out candles, and a decorated skull on the wall. Lu Rengia looked perplexed and whispered to Sinan, asking if the village's decorating style had always been that fashionable. Sinan lashed out at him in a whispering manner, wondering how such a thing could be possible. Still whispering, Sinan recalled an image of the third uncle and told Lu Rengia that he was always a normal and happy uncle. He was skilled in carpentry and was famous throughout the whole village, but now he did not know what had happened to him. While the candle on his forehead was still lit, the village chief lit another candle in the room and told Sinan and Lu Rengia not to just stand there but to find a place to sit. While Lu Rengia observed the village chief with utmost curiosity, Sinan looked worried. Playing with a skull in his hands, Lu Rengia told Sinan that they should find a place to sit down. Sinan looked uncomfortable as he almost referred to him as the third uncle, but he immediately caught himself and called him the village chief. He then bombarded the village chief with questions, what happened to the village, where did the villagers go, and what happened to the union's supplies. The village chief stared into space and then turned to look at them. He said that they were all caught by the marrow-sucking demon. Whenever the dog eclipses the moon, the mountains and rivers shake, and then the marrow-sucking demon would wake up with its claws and teeth. It would come to infiltrate people's homes at night, taking away those who have not done 99 good deeds. Its claws and teeth surround the village so that even the escort who had come to send the supplies was also caught. Unknowingly, Sinan now called him third uncle, and he was baffled by what he was talking about, as it was the bedtime story that used to put him to sleep. The village chief bowed down to Sinan, saying that he had a hard time waiting for an escort to come into the village and that he was a very strong white silver escort. He pleaded for him to save them. With a glimmer in his eyes, he warned Sinan to remember that marrow-sucking demons can change during the day, turning into villagers and blending in among them. Then, when the sun sets, they would revert back to their original bodies and attack them. He warned both of them not to go out anymore. Sinan asked him what all this mess was, but the village chief did not respond. He just told them that the sun would be setting soon, so they should announce the supplies' arrival to everybody tomorrow, and send them out tomorrow as well. Lu Rengia looked at the village chief with concern but said nothing. The village chief then opened the door and told them that he would take both of them to the village tomorrow, so they should not go out anymore when it's dark. He told them to go rest at the wooden house in front of the persimmon tree, as it had not been inhabited by people for a long time. Standing in front of the house, Sinan said that he did not think that he would one day come back to that house. Lu Rengia asked him if it was the place he used to live in. Sinan confirmed it and offered for him to come in. With Sinan carrying a lamp, they inspected the house, and Lu Rengia observed that it was surprisingly clean. It seemed that someone always cleaned the place. Sinan told him that maybe the house was meant to be the resting quarters for escorts, which was why the village chief told them to go there. Lu Rengia picked up a photo frame and marveled at how Sinan used to look. He made a comment that he looked barren, to which Sinan sulked and told him to shut up. Then he questioned Lu Rengia's choice of words to describe him as barren. In the picture were an adult couple, two young girls, and the young Sinan. Lu Rengia asked Sinan if the couple in the picture was his parents and recognized one of the girls as the person they met before on the road. Sinan told him that they count as family, but he has no parents. Sinan said that he lost his memory when he was attacked by a demonic beast, and the guy in the picture was Lin's uncle, the one who adopted him and lives at the house on the hill. Lu Rengia sighed and complained to Sinan that he had made him envy him for a moment and then made him realize that they were the same. Lu Rengia slumped down on the bed while Sinan was surprised when he heard what Lu Rengia said. 
He thought that because he was born in the Dragon City, he must have grown up happily. But Lu Rengia told him that the Dragon City was not as beautiful as he thought it was. Lu Rengia told Sinan to rest early as they would look around the village later. While Sinan was nagging Lu Rengia about wearing his shoes on the bed, a shadowy figure of a person was standing a few meters outside the house. Sinan complained about going around at night, and Lu Rengia retorted that the demon that the village chief mentioned was only said to come out at night. While the shadowy figure outside crossed their arms and listened to them, it started to grow fangs, its eyes grew larger, and its hair started to get long while it roared. The shadowy figure had now completely transformed into a beast that looked like a werewolf. Sinan fought with the beast, firing his gun using his left hand. But it seemed that there were more than one beast, and one of them jumped on Sinan's left side. This caught Sinan off guard, but he immediately pulled another gun from his holster with his right hand to shoot the beast that jumped on him from his vulnerable side. As Sinan blew up the head of the last beast, he was huffing and out of breath. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia was calmly drinking hot water from his thermos while commenting that the beasts they fought were stronger when they attacked at night. Sinan looked at him annoyed by how relaxed he was. While poking the carcass of the beast with his feet, Lu Rengia told Sinan that he was injured and that he still needed to be wary of the marrow-sucking demon that the village chief had told them about. Sinan was surprised that Lu Rengia believed his third uncle's bedtime story. Lu Rengia's eyes lit up as his foot came across an escort insignia that was attached to the beast's body. Sinan immediately noticed that the insignia was hung in a place where escorts hang them, so the demonic beast knew how to dress like an escort. Lu Rengia placed his hands on his hips and seemed to be deep in thought while he was staring at the beast's dead body lying on the ground with the escort insignia wrapped around its waist. He then turned to look at Sinan and told him that the beasts could possibly be the real escorts. Sinan looked horrified and he could not believe that it was possible, but Lu Rengia reminded him that it was not the first time they had seen something like that. They had even encountered the shapeshifter earlier. Lu Rengia looked serious as he told Sinan that it was possible that the Water Bear organization had participated in these events because he saw that there was a weird mark on each of the demonic beasts they encountered. It was clear that those beasts did not spontaneously gather. Lu Rengia also brought up the village chief's condition and inferred that the demonic beasts had suddenly grouped up at a certain point in time. Sinan could not say anything when he realized what Lu Rengia was trying to say. Lu Rengia told Sinan that there may be a secret hidden within the village, so they better be careful. Suddenly, someone arrived and pointed a gun at Sinan and Lu Rengia. The person told them not to move and questioned their identities and why they were sneaking around in the middle of the night. Sinan looked startled as he recognized the man as his uncle. He immediately turned his back on his uncle while saying that they came from the Tianfu base. Sinan's sudden movement made his uncle more vigilant, who yelled at him not to move while thinking about what he said about coming from the Tianfu base. Sinan's uncle realized that they were the escorts who had come into the village earlier to deliver the supplies, and then he asked them if the village head had not warned them about coming outside at night. But then, even with his back turned towards his uncle, after looking at him for a moment, his uncle was able to recognize him. Sinan awkwardly turned around and laughed, telling his uncle Lin that he was back. In a luxurious house, Sinan nervously sat on a couch with a very laid-back Lu Rengia sitting beside him while his uncle Lin praised him for becoming an escort at the Tianfu base. His uncle said that he could not believe that many years had passed and that Sinan being an escort made their village look good. Uncle Lin asked why Sinan was wearing a mask, but then he changed his mind and said he would not ask about it. He then said that if Auntie Lin knew that he had become an accomplished person, she would be happy. He then remembered Xiao Lan and mentioned that Sinan must not have met her yet. So, he called for her and told her to come down and see who came back. Lu Rengia asked Sinan discreetly if he was sure he was the person from the picture. Sinan said that Uncle Lin recognized him at first glance, so he did not think he was being impersonated. But Lu Rengia was still doubtful. A voluptuous blonde lady came down the stairs and told Uncle Lin to stop calling for Xiao Lan, as that girl was not there. She said that she did not know where she ran off to. She then reprimanded Uncle Lin and reminded him that he had told him before not to favor Xiao Lan too much as it creates problems, and she told him to see what he did. Both Lu Rengia and Sinan looked puzzled, and Sinan seemed not to recognize who the lady was. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia looked surprised when he remembered the lady in the picture and immediately thought it was her, acting differently after she had taken off her glasses. Seeing Lu Rengia's reaction, Sinan frantically explained to him that it was clear that she was not the same person because not too long after that picture was taken, Auntie Lin fell ill and died. Uncle Lin was mad and yelled that he had told Xiao Lan too many times, and then the lady retorted at him, asking what the use of yelling at her was. The lady then looked at the living room and noticed the guests. She acknowledged them and welcomed them into the village. She even acknowledged who Sin and Pei was, the person whom their master was talking about, and told him that he was so handsome. The lady approached Sinan and said that she had heard her master say that he was an escort and praised him for being really young and talented. 
Sinan looked uncomfortable and asked her who she was, and she introduced herself as Yong Dai. Uncle Lin looked defeated and sighed, commanding Yong Dai to stop messing around and go look for Xiao Lan. Lu Renjia, who was laid back earlier, suddenly looked vigilant. Suddenly, there was an explosion, and a huge fire could be seen coming from the direction of the village. Uncle Lin and Yong Dai were astonished, they did not know what was happening. But after a moment, Yong Dai's expression was replaced with horror as she realized that the fire was coming from the direction of the warehouse. At the village, a lot of villagers were gathered at the burning warehouse. They were unfazed by the scorching heat as they tried their best to put out the fire. Uncle Lin was running towards the burning warehouse with Sinan and Lu Renjia behind him. He called out to the village chief, his third brother, and asked what was happening. Then he reminded him that he warned him beforehand that no one should bring fire into the grain warehouse. As the village chief turned to look at Uncle Lin, he looked worried and horrified, saying that Xiao Lan was still inside the warehouse. Uncle Lin looked helpless and asked the village chief why he did not tell him sooner while Sinan looked desperate. Sinan then ran towards the burning warehouse without hesitation while calling out for Xiao Lan, telling her he was coming to save her. Uncle Lin got worried and tried to call out for Sinan to stop him, but he was too late. Sinan was already inside the building, unfazed by the fire, and was calling out for Xiao Lan. Meanwhile, Xiao Lan was sitting on the floor, coughing. She did not know what happened or why the place was on fire. She then noticed a lamp on the floor near the sack of grains that was surrounded by fire and burning with a blue color, not like the other parts that were burning red. As her surroundings continued to burn intensely, she started to get dizzy. Xiao Lan was lying on the floor, feeling hot and dizzy. She curled up into a fetal position, feeling like she was going to die, and then called out for her mom and sister. Meanwhile, Sinan was still scouring the warehouse, calling out and looking for Zia Lin. Xiao Lin was close to unconsciousness when she saw someone she thought was her father. She quickly realized that it was not, it was Sinan who had already found her. He immediately knelt down and checked up on her, noticing that she was about to become unconscious. He shook her to wake her up, called out her name, and told her not to sleep there. Sinan panicked, but he looked determined to get Xiao Lin out of the burning warehouse. However, he noticed something strange. Lu Renjia sniffed the air and immediately created a mask to protect himself. He was now standing at a toppled pillar next to Sinan and told him that there was something wrong with the smoke, which startled Sinan. Lu Renjia crouched to get closer to Sinan and asked him why he went inside when it was better for him to stay outside. Sinan, who now had Xiao Lan in his arms, apologized to Lu Renjia and said that he was not able to think clearly when he heard the news. As Lu Renjia explained to Sinan about the mask and said that he could use his blood to remove the toxic gas, Sinan got annoyed at him and told him that they should talk later as Xiao Lan was in danger. But before Sinan could properly finish his sentence, Lu Renjia's eyes were blazing with fire as he absorbed the flames that were burning the warehouse. As the fire at the warehouse died down, Uncle Lan scolded Xiao Lan. He nagged her about how he had told her many times not to mess up and now this had happened. Then he questioned if she was starving and came to the warehouse to steal grain at midnight. He proceeded to tell her that her mother and sister were gone, so if anything happened to her, he would be left alone. All the while, Sinan and Lu Renjia, who were squirting blood again, were just standing on the side and letting them have their moment. Suddenly, Sinan looked vigilant and called Lu Renjia to tell him that something was wrong. Lu Renjia listened to him intently as Sinan questioned if he had been away for too long, as he did not recognize any of the villagers who were gathered around the warehouse at that time. One of the villagers complained that their whole body was wet and took their shirt off. A strange mark could be seen on his back, on the right side of it. Lu Renjia noticed the mark and said that it was very similar to the one the previous demonic beast had. Meanwhile, the village chief interrupted Uncle Lin from scolding Xiao Lan, saying that she just escaped from death so he should go easy on her. He also said that she was not to blame because from the day his wife arrived, he must have known what kind of life Xiao Lan lived. Sinan was surprised when he heard what the village had said and asked if he was referring to Yong Dai. But instead of answering Sinan's question, he diverted the topic and told them that they should check the grains first. The village chief carried a lamp to inspect the warehouse, and as he saw a few sacks of grains, he said that there were still some grains left in the corner, all thanks to the two heroes who extinguished the fire. He also said that if the village rationed them little by little, then it would be enough, so they should not blame the girl anymore. Lu Renjia agreed with what the village chief said about not blaming Xiao Lan, and then he proceeded to grab the lamp from the village chief's hand. He tossed the lamp towards the remaining grains, which startled the village chief, Uncle Lin, and Xiao Lin as well. The grains burned with blue flames, and Lu Renjia said that Xiao Lin had burned them well. The village chief asked Lu Renjia what the meaning of the blue fire was, and Lu Renjia told him that it was the color of phosphorus fire, so their grain has a problem. 
Lu Renjia explained to them that since the grains were burning like that, the grain did not simply exceed the standard amount of phosphorus, the grain was simply pure phosphorus. All the while, Yang Dai was standing behind them, listening to their conversation. Yang Dai did not look worried when she realized that she had been exposed. Instead, she looked pleased, with a lustful look while praising Lu Renjia for being a handsome little smart guy and saying that she likes smart people the most. Lu Rengia explained that, according to the remaining books left behind by the aboriginals, phosphorus was a crucial substance for the human body, but there was a limit to how much of any element could be present in the body of a normal human. He added that when he was a guard, he would occasionally see the aboriginals test food for its chemical values with specific criteria, so the amount of phosphorus they were consuming was probably over the limit even for an awakener. He added that the presence of too much phosphorus leads to problems in the skeletal structure because it affects the intake of some other elements. The village chief then assumed that it must have been the reason for his hair loss, but Lu Rengia corrected him and said that it was just hair loss due to aging. Uncle Lu said that the aboriginals are just people who could not survive outside of their fragile eggshell. He questioned how the grains could be problematic when they had been continuously consuming them. Xiao Lin seconded that and said that the grains were supplies from the Tianfu base, so they should be eating the same thing. Lu Renjia then paused and thought deeply about the Tianfu base. At the village, one of the villagers was chasing another, asking where he was going and told him that they had been outside for too long. When the other guy told him that he was going to the toilet, the guy suggested that he should just use the toilet jar and wait until morning before going out. The orange-haired guy reasoned out that the jar was already full. Then he asked the one chasing him if he was not going to the toilet as well, so that he would not wet the bed, and the other guy responded that he was talking nonsense. The other guy warned the orange-haired guy about the marrow-sucking demon and asked what he was going to do if he ran into one when it was so dark and windy out there. The orange-haired guy laughed uncomfortably and told the other guy that he was just going to use the toilet and that there were a bunch of infrared alarms from the union placed outside the village, so if anything was nearby, it would be noisy and chaotic. Just as the orange-haired guy mocked the other guy for believing the village chief's story and said that it was something that could have only fooled kids, a huge beast appeared behind him, and it had a twisted expression, like a contorted Halloween mask. The other guy looked so horrified, and his eyes were so wide that his eyeballs looked like they were going to pop out of their sockets. The alarm bell of the village started to ring to warn the other villagers of the attack. Sinan immediately recognized that the alarm was for a swarm of monsters, while the village chief looked alarmed and said that they had stayed outside for too long. He looked extremely horrified as he said that the marrow-sucking demons were coming. Meanwhile, the werewolf-looking beasts with strange markings on their bodies were also attacking the village. The villagers were all puzzled as to where the monsters were coming from when the village entrance was still intact, and they had the idea to run deeper into the village because it was too late to go inside the houses but they could not run as well as they were already surrounded. As one of the beasts pounced on the helpless villager, who was only able to scream for his life, a gun was fired and hit the beast in the eye. Of course, it was Sinan who fired the gun. With a bullet in its eye, the beast just stood there for a moment without anything happening to it, which puzzled the villager. But then the beast's head exploded. Sinan fired multiple shots and eliminated the beast swiftly. While doing one of his cool poses and with a serious look on his face, he told the beast that he did not know where they came from but they should get out of his village. The demonic beasts have swarmed the village. Uncle Lin commanded the village chief to quickly gather the villagers at the second wall beneath the mountains. He told Xiao Lin to go with them as well and leave the rest to the two escorts. Upon hearing this, Xiao Lin protested as she thought it was a bit too much. But Uncle Lin told him that it was okay because Sinan is now a white silver level escort. Xiao Lin looked extremely doubtful when he heard Uncle Lin say that Sinan was a white silver level escort. Meanwhile, Lu Rengia was calmly drinking hot water from his thermos as he watched Sinan get surrounded by the werewolf-looking demonic beasts. At that time, Sinan was reminiscing about his past, the young boy who was crying so much after coming back from town. Andy Lin squatted in front of him to question what happened in town when he tried to awaken his ability, and asked if it failed. Uncle Lin was the one who answered the question, saying that Sinan was successfully awakened but the final result was not very good as the only comment was that his reaction speed was a bit quicker than ordinary people. Sinan then interjected, with eyes still filled with tears and snot running down his nose, and said that the officials in the union told him that his ability was useless. Then he continued to sob. Andy Lin was heartbroken when she heard the news and immediately grabbed Sinan into a hug and comforted him, saying that he should not cry and it was alright. God prepares their path in life when they are given their abilities, and what determines the ability's strength was not how others judge it, but how they use it. Sinan spread his arms and tossed the guns that he was holding aside while the horde of demonic beasts were about to pounce on him. He told his auntie Lin that he just wanted to use his abilities to protect everyone. Sinan's eyes glimmered with determination, and Lu Rengia, 
who was now closing his thermos, looked at Sinan with awe as it was rare for him to see Sinan being serious. While counting the beasts and taking note of their locations, Sinan grabbed a weapon that was holstered at his back. Sinan's eyes looked like they had crosshairs in them as he locked onto all his targets. He revealed the weapon he was using was the gun Wang Sai created and he called upon Lu Rengia and Wang Ying, saying he would be borrowing their strength. As Sinan fired the gun, Lu Rengia, who was just observing from the side, confirmed his speculation that Sinan was moving his wrist at a frequency that is hard for the naked eye to see. After exiting the gun barrel, the bullet vibrates at a special frequency and damages the demonic beasts, because normal bullets could not even scratch them. Lu Rengia looked extremely engrossed at Sinan and said that his enhancing ability was not that of a normal level and it was even used on Wang Zai's gun. Multiple demonic beasts were now being eliminated mid-air as Sinan turned his back on them. Sinan revealed that it was his Bullet Storm 2.0 burning version plus blood fangs. The demonic beasts were being dismembered by Sinan's attacks, and the village chief, Zio Lin, and Uncle Lin were surprised and looked at the scene with their mouths agape. Meanwhile, Lu Renji's blood was squirting with such strong pressure as he held down his laughter upon hearing the name of Sinan's move. Sinan, who was now embarrassed, yelled at him and told him not to laugh as he spent an entire night trying to think of the name, and that he was not allowed to hold in his laughter so much that blood spurts out of his wounds. Lu Rengia was no longer holding his laughter, and the pressure of the squirting blood had become weak. While he was laughing out loud, he gave Sinan a heads up that the fight was not over yet. And right on cue, the huge beast with a twisted expression that looked like a contorted Halloween mask appeared behind Sinan. The beast looked extremely horrifying as it lunged at Sinan, who was caught off guard. Fortunately, Sinan was able to dodge the attack ungracefully. As Sinan lay flat on the ground in front of him, Lu Rengia checked up on him to see if he was alright and told him that the beast felt a bit familiar and was a high level one. Sinan then asked if he was referring to the weird bug that they had encountered. Sinan knelt down as he was swapping magazines and said that he would deal with the beast once he was done swapping. Lu Rengia's blood could not be used for long durations, and upon hearing that, Lu Rengia felt like it was his fault. Lu Rengia suddenly remembered something when Sinan reminded him of the bug, and he told Sinan that he was concerned about the thing on the beast's body that looked like a prosthetic limb. The prosthetic limb was hanging lifelessly on the chest of the beast. Sinan looked conflicted as he recognized the prosthetic limb. Meanwhile, the village chief looked horrified as he also recognized it as the prosthetic limb of Feng VI, and Zio Lin's eyes widened when she heard what the village chief had said. She confirmed with him if he meant the old master Feng. The village chief confirmed it and said that he was a retired escort that returned to the village after a serious injury. Because of his background as an escort, he became a village guard, and he was one of the first people to go missing. The village chief said that he made the prosthetic himself, so there was no way he could be wrong about recognizing it. Upon hearing what the village chief had said, Sinan had a hard time accepting the fact that the beast standing in front of him was indeed the old master Feng. And then Sinan looked horrified as the realization hit him that if the beast was really old master Feng, then the other demonic beasts were the other missing people. Sinan's thoughts were in disarray as he felt conflicted about what he had just done. Seeing Sinan's condition, Lu Rengia started to emit flames as he told Sinan to leave the rest to him. As the beast's arm was about to grab him, Sinan just stood there as he refused Lu Rengia's help. He calmly closed his eyes and thought about the old master Feng, who was an alcoholic and a known bluffer in the village and was only able to get to the bronze level after being an escort for all his life. He reminisced about the time when he was just a young boy and the old master Feng gave him advice that when he became an escort, he should make sure to buy a Rolls Royce as it was the most important part. And when Sinan was feeling down about what the trainer in town told him, old master Feng comforted him and told him not to listen to those guys because even a guy like him managed to become an escort. Sinan swiftly dodged the beast's attack and loaded the magazine into his gun. As he fired the gun towards the beast, he told Lu Rengia that he should at least let him send old master Feng off personally. A huge beam of light appeared, and the beast that stood before Sinan earlier was now quickly disintegrating into thin air. Lu Rengia crossed his arms, and he let out a sigh of relief as he finally saw Sinan act like a white silver escort. The prosthetic limb fell on the ground, and Sinan picked it up, stared at it, and grieved. Meanwhile, Young Dai was in a room that looked like a laboratory. She said that she did not think that an experiment of that level would fail and that the man with the mask should not be underestimated. Then she mentioned a guy whom she did not expect to make an error in judgment. She opened a small vault containing vials and grabbed one, saying that she would let the guy's error go as everything would be okay as long as she had the present. She was looking at the container that she was holding that had the water bear's mark on it and said that she might still need to use it in the end. As the sun rose, blue flames rose from an area near the village. 
They were burning the bodies of the demonic beasts they had killed the evening before. Xiao Lin and Lu Renjia stood side by side. Xiao Lin asked him why they were eager to burn the bodies, and Lu Renjia told her that it was because they would be in trouble if there were a virus or harmful bacteria on the beasts. As Xiao Lin observed that the color of the fire was the same as the grains, she asked Lu Renjia if those beasts were really the missing villagers, and he told her that he was not sure as they could also be the escorts who disappeared or other things. And as Xiao Lin got curious about what exactly happened that made their village become the way it was, an old man interrupted her and told her to stop thinking about it. He said that they were lucky that there was a white silver level escort who cleaned up everything when the demonic beasts attacked and surrounded their village yesterday, so now the village would be in peace like before. The old man and Xiao Lin looked at the burning bodies, and he said that he wouldn't have thought that those beasts were made by humans, and he hopes that kind of thing does not happen again. The old man was in high spirits as he thanked the escorts and said that everyone in the village was now rolling up their sleeves and getting ready to work in the fields again. Lu Renjia was contemplating something, it seemed like he wanted to say something. But then he just sighed and told the old man that what they were doing was good. Lu Renjia remembered something and asked Xiao Lin where his father was, and Xiao Lin told him that he had hurriedly gone to dispense the food, as in these kinds of situations, there are many things to do. Lu Renjia then asked Xiao Lin about the person who was always looking for her and asked if they would not be looking for her in this situation. He even told her that he remembered the village chief saying that they were not in a good relationship. Xiao Lin immediately recognized that Lu Renjia was referring to Yong Dai and said that she was not bad and that she treated her like everyone else. She then looked glum as she told him that she was the problem. She didn't like Yong Dai because she gave off a feeling that was particularly hard to describe. And as Lu Renjia confessed that he did not like Yong Dai either, Xiao Lin sounded a little excited to find that she was not the only one feeling the same thing and told Lu Renjia that Yong Dai's gaze always felt like she was looking down on people. As Xiao Lin continued to say that she not only felt like she was not treated as a member of the village but also felt like she was not treated like a human being. The image of Sinan and Dr. Kai immediately went into Lu Renjia's head as he told Xiao Lin that he had met those kinds of people during his missions. Xiao Lin suddenly looked disappointed when she told Lu Renjia that she noticed that his companion, who was wearing a mask, did not come. She remembered the time Sinan saved her and told Lu Renjia that she had almost changed her opinion of him. Lu Renjia looked puzzled and told Xiao Lin that Sinan came but immediately went straight back to the village. At a place that looked like a cemetery, Sinan placed old Master Feng's prosthetic limb on the ground and apologized to him that his other parts could not live anymore. He looked down at the prosthetic limb and talked like he was talking to old Master Feng, saying that they burned the rest of his body to cleanse it, but the prosthetic limb remained, and now he had made it into a mound for him. Sinan crossed his arms and continued to talk, saying that they could not say if the other villagers were dead or alive and that it would be difficult to find things for a memorial even if they wanted to. So he was getting special treatment and that was why he should not get angry at heaven. Sinan turned to look at the next grave to his right. It was Auntie Lin's headstone, and beside it was another headstone with a ribbon placed on top of it. Sinan knelt onto the ground and wiped the dust off the other headstone, revealing an image of a girl he called Xiao Xuan. As the ribbon swayed in the breeze, Sinan talked to them and said that it had been a while since they had seen each other. In the village, a young girl with white hair who looked like Xiao Xuan was talking to the young Sinan and asked him why he had asked her to close her eyes. She thought they would be playing hide and seek and looked worried because she was not good at it. The young Sinan told her not to worry too much about the details and just close her eyes. Despite looking doubtful, she still agreed to what Sinan said. She closed her eyes, leaned against a tree trunk, and started counting. When Sinan told her she could now open her eyes, a ribbon was attached to her hair. She looked surprised, so Sinan explained that he thought it would look good on her when he saw it in town and asked if she liked it. Xiao Xuan carefully adjusted the ribbon on her hair and told Sinan she liked it. She then asked him if it looked beautiful, to which he replied that it looked nice. They both sat on the ground, and the girl asked Sinan how his trip to town went. She was curious and asked if he had introduced his abilities to the Union. Sinan told her that his trip was not good and that he had no chance of being an escort. Xiao Xuan told Sinan that she had asked her father, and he said that it was impossible to have that kind of ability because time does not exist in the physical world. Sinan leaned back and said that he had not told the Union about his ability because they would not believe it, and if he did not do well, he would be laughed at. Xiao Xuan smiled kindly at him, saying that she believed him. Her smile shone as she gave him encouraging words, saying that he would be the strongest escort in the future, and that he would be like old Master Feng, protecting everyone. Sinan smiled and told the girl that nobody wanted to be like old man Feng and promised that even if he did not become an escort, he would still protect her. Then, the gory scene of someone being eaten limb by limb by a beast appeared in front of the kneeling young Sinan. 
He looked terrified and screamed. Instead of running away, he picked up a huge stone and ran towards the beast, yelling for it to return Xiaok Xuan to him. He was really tiny compared to the size of the beast as he went closer and courageously attempted to attack it. As the beast was about to bite him, Old Master Feng came and swept him out of the way of the beast's mouth, scolding him and saying that he was going to lose his life for no reason. Old Man Feng looked terrified as well as he looked back at the beast, wondering how it got there when it was supposed to be down in the depths. Old Man Feng told him to stop shouting and get out of there as Sinan struggled to break free from his arms, calling out for Xiao Xuan and reaching out to the monster. Back to the present, Xiao Lin and Lu Renjia came into the cemetery and found Sinan kneeling on the ground. Xiao Lin looked mad at Sinan for visiting the cemetery, and she was about to confront him when Lu Renjia stopped her. He told Xiao Lin that they should go in later as he looked solemnly at Sinan. Sinan was crying his heart out, and he was shaking while kneeling on the ground. Suddenly, the ribbon atop Xiao Xuan's headstone was blown away by the wind. A golden light seemed to be guiding the ribbon, and Sinan thought that it was Xiao Xuan's spirit. All their attention was caught by the ribbon, and they were surprised when it landed on a sword hidden in the bushes, which Sinan recognized as Old Man Feng's sword. The sight of a ribbon sitting atop a sword that was digging through a beast's remains, which was wearing a flowery shirt, greeted the three of them. As Sinan recognized Old Master Feng's sword and questioned why it was there, Xiao Lin recognized the flowery shirt as something owned by the wife of the eldest Xiang brother. Upon hearing what she said, Lu Renjia made an observation that the woman had a unique appearance, judging by the skull. Sinan speculated speculated that Miss Lu had mutated earlier than Old Master Feng, and as he observed that the body had already decomposed into bare bones, he wondered what had happened. Lu Renjia interjected that he remembered the village head mentioning the first batch of people to disappear, and speculated that Old Master Feng was probably the one who had investigated the matter, and perhaps he had encountered something there and fought. Xiao Lin looked surprised when she heard them mention Old Master Feng investigating, and upon realizing that he had really been turned into a beast by other people, she wondered who those people were and why they had done what they did. As they continued to observe their surroundings, Lu Renjia noticed that the patch of ground where the bones were lying had no vegetation and was slightly lower than the ground next to it. It was covered and hidden by taller grass and he speculated that this prevented the perpetrator from discovering the remnant of the fight and failing to get rid of it. Lu Renjia continued to observe and said that with further inspection, although it was very hidden, the ditch without vegetation continued on deeper. Xiao Lin and Sinan were both surprised by what Lu Renjia was able to observe, and Sinan wondered if it was a result of the rain. But Lu Renjia told him that it would not be that straight if it was made by the rain. Lu Renjia had a smile of victory as he explained that it was a track left behind by a large object being dragged across. Then he commended Old Man Feng for doing a nice job and managing to catch them. The three of them followed the trail, with Xiao Lin walking in front of them. She commented that they had yet to encounter any demonic beasts on the way, so it seemed like the area had been cleared before. Sinan tried to warn her, saying that it would be dangerous for them to move forward, so she should go back first. But she told him not to worry about her because she would eventually return when things truly got dangerous. Xiao Lin turned her back to Sinan and continued to walk, telling him that as a member of the village, she had to do something, no matter who wished to destroy their village. Sinan was about to say something to her, but he was not able to finish his sentence. With her back still turned towards Sinan, she asked him how long he had been gone from the village. Then she turned to look at him with contempt and said that it was not his village anymore. Sinan wanted to say something, but she did not want to hear him. She turned and walked away. As Sinan let out a heavy sigh, Lu Renjia looked at him with concern and offered his thermos, asking if he would like some hot water. Suddenly, Xiao Lin stepped on something metallic, which Lu Renjia immediately recognized and tried to warn her about. Xiao Lin stopped walking when she heard Lu Renjia yell and asked him what the matter was. The metal she was stepping on gave way underfoot, revealing a deeper hole beneath her, and she immediately fell down. Lu Renjia remained on the surface with Sinan, who was calling out to Xiao Lin, his voice filled with worry. Xiao Lin screamed as she continued to fall into the hole that led somewhere underground. She expressed discomfort as she landed on a hard tile floor. She complained that her butt hurt as she pushed herself off the ground and stood up. She looked ahead of her and wondered what that place was. But her thoughts were cut off as Sinan and Lu Renjia also came out of the hole she fell through. But they landed in a painless manner. Sinan immediately checked up on her to see if she was hurt, and she confirmed that she was fine, while Lu Renjia made the observation that the hole they came from seemed like an underground air ventilation system. As Lu Renjia looked at the area ahead of him, he immediately recognized the containers that the monsters were being put in. 
Lu Renji across his arms and smiled knowingly, saying that it must be fate. Sinan asked Lu Renji what he meant when he said it must have been fate. As they stared at the containers in front of them, Sinan continued to ask Lu Renji if it was related to the organization he had mentioned before. Lu Renji confirmed and reminded Sinan about the woman who had stayed at his place for a while. Lu Renji's brows furrowed as he remembered Miss Yu Rong and told Sinan that she had been sent to Jiangwa village by the masked man to be experimented on. Because her uncontrollable ability prevented her from coming in contact with air, she was put in a container like the ones they were looking at. Sinan then remembered that a black iron had pushed the container around and wreaked havoc at the plaza back then. He said that he had an uneasy feeling about it, but he was not even surprised when he realized it was actually Lu Rengia. Lu Rengia looked away from Sinan as he said that he was investigating a lead that was hard to come by. He took a jab at Sinan, saying that he was not like someone who found their way to that terrible hospital on a random escort mission. Sinan immediately defended himself and said that he had carried a terrifying bomb for two whole days, and the masked person came to him for revenge after he dragged him into the matter. Xiao Lin chimed in and told them that she had no idea what they were talking about or why such a place would be in their village. As she continued to ask about the creatures in the containers and what they really were, Lu Rengia cut her off and said that they were not creatures. He looked like he was deep in thought as he said that a basement of that size could not be built in a day or two, and judging from the height of the grass covering the vents, the place had already been there for a relatively long time. As soon as Lu Rengia was about to explain the things in the containers, Sinan let out a cough and interrupted him. Sinan took over the explanation and was trying to water down his words to explain what those things in the containers were. But someone interrupted him by clapping their hands and saying that they were people. Some of them were villagers who had passed by, while some were escorts who had come in the past. The room lit up, revealing Yang Dai, who was standing at an observation platform above them. Lu Rengia immediately recognized her but could not remember her name properly, so Sinan corrected him and said that her name was Yang Dai. Yang Dai applauded them and said that although she did not expect them to leave immediately after just taking care of old man Feng, she did not expect them to find the place so quickly. From the way they were talking, it seemed like they were investigating something, so she asked who they were actually. Meanwhile, Xiao Lin looked appalled as she looked at Yang Dai. She yelled and questioned why she was doing such things when her father and the villagers had never mistreated her in any way. Yang Dai glared down at her and said that more than a century after the catastrophe, creatures roamed the lands, and other than the escorts who ran around flaunting their powers, mere humans were nothing but ants standing on two legs. Yang Dai laughed hysterically as she continued to say that mere humans had no value in surviving and they were just feasting on the aboriginals' leftovers. She said that countless people die in the wild every day, and it pisses her off that a small girl who has yet to see the world asks her those kinds of questions. Xiao Lin looked surprised at what Yang Dai had just said, and Sinan cut off the conversation, saying that it was enough. Xiao Lin looked worried as Sinan stepped in front of her while pointing a gun at Yang Dai. He told her that if she was done with her rubbish speech, she should come down and surrender, and warned her that he was a soon-to-be gold-level escort. Young Dai looked down on them and said that he was a mere white silver level escort with a useless black iron level escort that coughs up blood at the slightest movement. As purple smoke started to dissipate in the area, and the three of them immediately covered their noses, she told them that over the years, she had captured many similar materials, so there was no need to be foolishly arrogant. With Yang Dai looking down on them from the observation platform and the smoke that Sinan discovered to be poisonous, the three of them seemed helpless. Adding to the trouble they were in, a glass broke, and Lu Rengia was surprised when he saw tentacles come out of the smoke and grab Xiao Lin who was surprised as well. Xiao Lin groaned as she was dropped at the observation platform, beside the now annoyed Yang Dai. Yang Dai grabbed Xiao Lin's cheeks with one hand, and her expressions were contorted with anger as she found the situation troublesome because it would be quite tricky to explain if anything happened to Xiao Lin. Meanwhile, the people in the containers started to surround both Sinan and Lu Rengia, and Yang Dai told them that for both of them, they just had to play with those babies. Yang Dai grabbed Xiao Lin's arms as she told Sinan and Lu Rengia that those experiments were all above SSR level. She then carried Xiao Lin on her shoulders with ease as she suggested they enjoy it slowly since she thought it was a bit overly luxurious for just a white silver and a black iron level. She turned her back on them and bid them farewell, telling them that the two of them would have made excellent experimental material, which was a shame. Sinan pointed his gun with his left arm at the beasts while he called for Xiao Lin. But his actions were useless. The beasts quickly gathered around and surrounded them, and one of their tentacles had already wrapped around Sinan's left arm. Sinan broke free from the tentacle's grasp by shooting it with his other hand, and Lu Rengia approached him, saying that those experiments could not be allowed outside and must be wiped out thoroughly. Lu Rengia suddenly grabbed Sinan's shoulders and told him to go after Yang Dai first and make sure she didn't get away. 
He told Sinan that he would come to find him once he had dealt with the beasts, while Sinan had a bad feeling about the situation, as he asked Lu Renjia how he could go after Yang Dai. He was tossed towards the exit point where Yang Dai went through earlier, and Sinan somewhat expected it to happen and realized that it was the bad feeling he had earlier. Lai Renjia began to summon his fire to deal with the beast as he told them to come at him all at once. But to his surprise, his fire died down and blood started squirting from his wounds again. Lu Renjia looked unamused as he asked the beast to wait a bit for him and wondered if he had used too much strength putting out the fire last night. Meanwhile, Xiao Lin had woken up and was wriggling to break free from Yang Dai's arms while asking her what she was doing and commanding her to let go of her that instant. Yang Dai got annoyed and glared at Xiao Lin, telling her to stop messing around. Yang Dai tossed Xiao Lin to the ground while regretting taking care of such a little brat. She raised her hands to hit Xiao Lin while asking her if she thought she had no temper and declaring that she had had enough of her. But before Yang Dai could hit Xiao Lin, the flying Sinan caught up with them, and he immediately fired his gun while yelling at her to stop as he appeared behind Yang Dai. Yang Dai was surprised, but she was lucky that she was still able to dodge the bullet when she turned to look at Sinan. Missing her, the bullet hit the wall in front of her and exploded, causing a lot of debris to fly towards her. Sinan landed, skidded through the ground, and told Yang Dai to stop resisting and come with him to Tianfu to receive judgment. While skidding, he dug his pistol into the ground to stop himself from skidding further. All the while, Yang Dai screamed as she covered her face with her arms to protect herself from the debris. Her face contorted with anger as she saw that her face was scratched, and she cursed Sinan. Although he was sweating buckets and feeling guilty, Sinan tried to play it cool and said that it was just a small scratch and that she was not very pretty to begin with, so there was no need for her to be so dramatic. Sinan checked up on Xiao Lin, who was sitting on the floor behind Yang Dai, and she confirmed that she was fine. Suddenly, Xiao Lin noticed that Yang Dai was holding something in her hands. As Yang Dai raised the gigantic syringe, Xiao Lin tried to warn Sinan that Yang Dai had taken something out and he needed to be careful. But she was too late, as Yang Dai immediately dug the needle into her own arms. The red liquid oozed into her arms while she cursed all of them. She continued to curse at them as a powerful aura surged through her, and her clothes started to disintegrate. All the while, Sinan was on guard and was confused that Yang Dai had stabbed herself. Suddenly, the machines around them started to disintegrate as well, and they seemed to be getting absorbed by something, or rather, someone. Yang Dai now stood in front of them, with half her body gone and replaced by machinery. She was smiling menacingly as she told them to die. Yang Dai bombarded Sinan with attacks, and as Sinan dodged them, Yang Dai told him to stop dodging and just accept his death. As Sinan continued to seamlessly dodge Yang Dai's attacks, Yang Dai got annoyed and questioned what kind of man twists and turns like a bug. Sinan fired his gun and retorted about what Yang Dai had said about him when she was the one who no longer looked human. His bullet hit Yang Dai, but it did no damage. She even called them useless and questioned how an attack of that magnitude could ever be effective against her artificial body. Sinan crouched down while reloading his magazines and contemplated how the metal actually lived up to its reputation of being unbreakable and how his normal bullets had no effect. Seeing Lu Renjia still sitting on the ground near Yang Dai, Sinan thought it was difficult to use Lu Renjia's blood in such an enclosed space because, if he was not careful, he could hurt Xiao Lin. Suddenly, Yang Dai fired multiple missiles at him. She had a crazy look on her face as she told him that she would see how he would dodge those. Sinan's eyes lit up, and his iris produced a geometric pattern inside them as he noticed that Yang Dai fired explosives. It was like watching a dancer as Sinan gracefully avoided the explosives fired by Yang Dai. In his final move, he twirled and shot the rest of the explosives. While he realized how crazy Yang Dai really was, he worried even more about Xiao Lin, who could get accidentally hit by those explosives in such an enclosed space. Yang Dai was taken aback by what she had just witnessed, and she could not believe that Sinan had actually managed to dodge all the explosives she fired. He even had time to shoot down her grenade. Suddenly, Yang Dai had an evil look on her face as soon as she realized something. She laughed hysterically as she finally understood something. Even though Sinan looked confused, he was still on high alert as he asked Yang Dai what she was laughing about. Suddenly, something lit up and detonated behind Sinan, who noticed it too late. He did not have enough time to react and dodge the explosion, so he was fully hit by the explosion behind him. Xiao Lin looked horrified, and worry was evident in her voice when she yelled and called out to him, while Yang Dai told Sinan that she was laughing at something most joyous indeed. Yang Dai approached Sinan, who was now lying on the ground, and she told him about the 160 experiments they had performed using the Zhanghua village serums given to her by the boss. It was a shame that, although they had managed to merge humans and demonic beasts, the added limbs would cause their brains to become overloaded. 
and as she reached out and grabbed him by the hair, she told him that most test subjects would succumb to madness in a short time after merging. Then, they would completely lose their humanity after a while. Still grabbing Sinan by the hair, Yang Dai raised him off the ground as she mentioned a person who was constantly trying to make amendments to the methods and tried using new materials. She said that recently, one of the test subjects retained their sanity, and even found a way to escape, although they lost their memories. Yang Dai had a knowing smile as she continued to tell her story, saying that with the test subject gone, materials decreased little by little. But the person used the same material to make a few more serums before the report ended. She said that the person kept what they added a secret from her, but she now realized when she saw Sinan's ability. Sinan's eyes widened in surprise as Yang Dai disclosed her discovery that what was added to the serum was his nervous enhancement ability. She then offered for him to come help them in their experiment, saying that an ability like his could only be turned from trash to treasure in their organization. Sinan smiled when he remembered something about a southwest cave, and then he asked Yang Dai if the test subject that escaped was strapped onto the body of a male Amei monkey. Yang Dai looked agitated as she questioned how Sinan knew about those details. Sinan recalled his encounter with the Amei monkey that had a human head and could talk. He then regretted how he did not discover things sooner when the signs were already there back then, and how he constantly blamed Lu Rengia and convinced himself that all of it was just bad luck. Sinan's iris lit up again, but with a different color and a different geometric shape this time. While remembering Zio Xuan's ribbon atop old Master Feng's sword, he saw both of their smiling faces looking at him. He blamed himself for not realizing that all of the weird and difficult things that he had encountered were everyone trying to tell him to come back. Sinan shot at Yang Dai's arms as he continued to regret and blame himself for not discovering things sooner. Yang Dai smiled evilly as the bullets bounced off her artificial body. She told Sinan that his attacks were useless and bragged about how the revolutionary technology she was using was made using his abilities as a basis. With her mechanical body, she was many times more evolved than him. The bullets that bounced off her body kept bouncing on the walls, and ultimately they hit her vulnerable backside. Sinan looked unfazed as he told Yang Dai that she was talking nonsense and that she was way too ugly. Another bullet bounced off the wall. Yang Dai looked behind her as soon as she realized that Sinan had reflected bullets to her blind side. But she was not able to dodge or defend herself against the bullet, it hit her arm, which was cut off from the rest of her body. Looking at Yang Dai's arm that had been cut off, he realized that her body had completely merged with the machinery in such a short time that no blood came out of it, only distorted metals. As Yang Dai's arm reached the ground, Sinan reloaded his magazines and said that Wang Xi would be very happy if he captured her alive. But before anything else, he wanted to ask Yang Dai a question. Sinan looked at her and asked how they obtained his ability. Yang Dai looked irritated by the question. She then started throwing a lot of explosives at Sinan and told him that he should become a material for her experiments. Dodging the explosives, Sinan leaped backward and started shooting them as he told Yang Dai that there was no use in talking because she couldn't understand him. Multiple explosions were starting to ruin the place and debris started to fall from above. Meanwhile, Sinan was surprised that one of the explosives was actually a smoke grenade, and he no longer had visibility of what was happening in front of him. All the while, Yang Dai approached Xiao Lin and shared her observations that the white silver escort really cared about her. She then smiled menacingly as she tried to grab Xiao Lin, telling her that she would capture her to use her as a hostage. Suddenly, someone fired a rifle and told Yang Dai that they would not let her fulfill her plans. The rifle fired a beam that went through Yang Dai's stomach. Yang Dai looked surprised when she looked back to see who shot her, and it seemed like she recognized the person but did not expect them to come. Sinan was also surprised when he looked back and saw Uncle Lin fully armored and declaring that no one could hurt his daughter. Yang Dai lay unconscious on the ground with her upper body completely separated from the fully mechanical lower part of her body. Uncle Lin felt fortunate that he was able to make it in time while Xiao Lin was sobbing and trying to relay the story of what happened. Xiao Lin sobbed as she hugged her father, and while Uncle Lin hugged her back and consoled her, he told Sinan to confirm if Yang Dai was already dead, to which Sinan complied. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fight, Lu Renjia was finally able to deal with all the beasts. It took a while, as he had to put in some effort because he could not use his abilities. He then wondered how Sinan was doing and thought that he should catch up to him quickly. Lu Renjia paused for a moment when he realized something he did not have time to see earlier because he was in a rush. It was how huge the place was. He looked around the place he had torn down and questioned how Yang Dai, a woman who came from a different village, had built the place without the villagers' knowledge. He figured that there must be someone involved who was well known in the village and quite wealthy. On the other hand, Sinan checked up on Yang Dai and realized that she was only unconscious and not dead. Sinan was surprised that that kind of attack did not result in a fatal injury and realized how really scary that serum was. Sinan was deep in thought and mulled over how the water bear got his blood. He initially thought that it was the time when he was attacked by the masked man. 
but it did not match with the timings of the monkey man. Meanwhile, Uncle Lin continued to console Xiao Lin and told her that he was thankful that Sinan had followed her, and then he asked how they found the place. Xiao Lin told him that they were investigating the missing villagers and were following the clues left behind by Old Master Feng when she accidentally stepped on a vent-like thing and fell down there. While Xiao Lin was explaining, Sinan was still deep in thought, trying to figure out how the water bear got their hands on his blood. Suddenly, Lu Renjia and Sinan came to a realization at the same time. Sinan immediately grabbed his gun from his holster as he turned to warn Xiao Lin to get away from Uncle Lin. Xiao Lin raised her head from her father's chest as she turned to look at Sinan, looking extremely confused. All the while, her father sighed when he realized that he was still found out by Sinan in the end. Before Sinan could fire his gun, he was already hit in the shoulders by the same beam that hit Yang Dai earlier. With his hair and cloak being blown away by the wind of his sudden movements, an insignia of the Water Bear organization was revealed on his chest. Xiao Lin called out to Sinan as he coughed up blood and fell to the ground. She confronted her father and asked what he was doing to Sinan. But her father raised his hands to interrupt her from talking. Uncle Lin pointed his weapon at Sinan while he told him not to play dead because he knew that he was still conscious and waiting for him to lower his guard so he could ambush him. Sinan looked lifeless while lying on the ground as Uncle Lin continued to tell him that after many years of research, he might know his ability better than Sinan himself. Therefore, he knew that with his reaction speed, it was not hard for him to avoid injury to his vital organs and just receive some minor wounds from that attack. He added that Yang Dai probably fell for that trick. Sinan opened his eyes and was silent for a moment. He then proceeded to ask the man in front of him who he was and why he was disguising himself as Uncle Lin. Uncle Lin was confused about what Sinan was asking because he should be able to tell if he really was Lin Hongnian. But then he realized that Sinan was unwilling to accept the truth, that he would rather lie to himself and avoid reality, just like when he was younger. While still pointing a gun at Sinan, Uncle Lin told him that he had looked over the data from the water bears that Yang Dai gave him. It contains details of how they merge mutants that have no abilities with other creatures to produce a new type of human by destroying the immune system using phosphorus and other elements. When he saw that it was very feasible, he could not resist the temptation of the revolutionary technology that was worthy of being recorded into the post-apocalyptic historical records. Sinan confidently told Uncle Lin that the organization definitely did not tell him about the side effects. Uncle Lin mockingly looked down on Sinan and told him that there will always be a small price for revolutionary accomplishments and that the technology could not be optimized and improved without the villagers' sacrifices. Uncle Lin looked menacing as he revealed to Sinan that the side effects of Dr. Kai Like's medicine for transferring abilities were a huge breakthrough for his and Yang Dai's research. He said that he kept the key point from Yang Dai, that the most important ingredient was his extraordinary nerves and reflexes. Sinan's eyes widened as he heard Uncle Lin say that he was not someone with a useless ability. Machinery started moving, and steam was spreading all over the place as Uncle Lin persuaded Sinan to join him. He said that if they, uncle and nephew, joined hands and continued with the project, Sinan could use his ability to incorporate mechanical armor from the Eagle City's tinder base into his own body, like him. Two female mechanical bodies were revealed by the machinery that was moving earlier. Uncle Lin had this crazy look on his face as he spread his arms and introduced his creations behind him. He told Sinan that they would not only have their names left on historical records, but they could also combine remaining genetic information with machinery to revive Auntie Lin and Xiao Xuan. Sinan glared at Uncle Lin, he was extremely mad that he could not utter a coherent sentence. Suddenly, Xiao Lin raised her hand and slapped her father while telling him that he had disrespected her mother and sister with those things he had created. Xiao Lin's eyes were filled with tears, and she looked horrified as she confronted her father and told him that he had gone mad. She told him that her mother and sister were already dead, and those things were just his toy dolls. She told him to wake up as he was also avoiding reality. Uncle Lin was surprised, and it seemed like he was brought back to his senses. But suddenly, a beeping sound could be heard, and Uncle Lin pointed his weapon at Zhao Lin, who was now scared and confused about what her father was doing. A system notified Uncle Lin about an enemy attack being detected and confirming the target of annihilation. Upon hearing this, he panicked as he didn't remember installing such a function. He tried to command the system to wait and told it that his daughter was not an enemy, but the system did not listen and proceeded to fire a powerful beam towards Xiao Lin. With things escalating quickly, Xiao Lin did not have any time to react. 
She just stood there, frozen in place while staring at the beam of light coming towards her. Lu Renjia came in time to rescue Xiao Lin. He deflected the beam by slashing it with his transformed, claw-like hands. Sinan looked surprised and relieved at the same time as he saw Lu Renjia arrive at the scene. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia was extremely mad and was glaring at Uncle Lin. Uncle Lin's weapon continued to fire the powerful beam towards Lu Renjia, but Lu Renjia simply blocked it with his claws, splitting it into multiple rays of light. Uncle Lin looked terrified as he saw Lu Renjia's claw, which managed to slice the concentrated energy beam apart, was now only a few inches away from him. Lu Renjia was mad that Uncle Lin had fired at his own daughter, so he grabbed Uncle Lin and slammed him into the ground. Uncle Lin lay on the ground with Lu Renjia's hand over his chest. Suddenly, Lu Renjia noticed something odd. He leapt back as long and slender arms spurted out of Uncle Lai's chest. Lu Renjia regrouped with Sinan and Xiao Lin and asked them what on earth that thing was that attacked him. Sinan told him that Uncle Lin was not wearing his armor and had used the Jiangwa village serum to merge himself with the armor. While he was explaining, Sinan went out of his way to notice Lu Renjia's looks. Multiple horns of different sizes were poking out of his head, and his face had strange marks. He asked Lu Renjia what kind of out-of-style trend he was going for. Lu Renjia touched his horns and explained to Sinan that it was not a style. They were the blood that spurts out whenever he moves slightly, so he decided to solidify them. Upon hearing his explanation, Sinan was surprised that Lu Renjia's look was not intentional. Meanwhile, Uncle Lin groaned in pain as he stood up. While his system kept on notifying him about sustaining moderate damage, Uncle Lin told Lu Renjia that he knew he couldn't be Sinan's psychic, but he did not expect him to be that strong. He even left claw marks on his armor and commended Lu Renjia for that. While Lu Renjia recognized the artificial implanting of body parts as an ancient technology from the pre-apocalypse Eagle City, he cursed in his mind for not being able to use his strength and not leaving a deep enough scratch on Uncle Lin's armor. Uncle Lin's face started to look exhausted and unwell. His eyes were turning red as he commended Lu Renjia for recognizing the armor, and then he bragged that Lu Renjia must also know that the armor would soon repair itself from the damage. Seeing her father's face, Xiao Lin looked disturbed and asked him what had happened to him, pleading for him to act a bit more normally. Meanwhile, as Lu Renjia saw Uncle Lin's face, he immediately knew that things were not looking good. He remembered Wang Zai's tests on samples of the brain stems of those kinds of test subjects. Wang Zai had explained that the temporal lobes of the test subjects' brains would gradually sink, causing increased aggression, a large change in personality, and problems in cognitive processing. Lu Renjia told them that part of the ability gene inserted would amplify their instincts without stopping, causing the other parts of the brain to be determined as useless organs. He said that the organization knowingly kept those side effects a secret and distributed their serums across the world because they just wanted to get more cheap and useful biological weapons and soldiers, not for some world-saving scientific ideal. Upon hearing what Lu Renjia said, Xiao Lin realized what was happening to her father. She grabbed Sinan's arm and pleaded for them to save him. Uncle Lin asked him what they were all muttering amongst themselves. He was now unrecognizable, his eyes were wide open and bloodshot, his face was hollow, and his limbs were disproportional. He called Sinan and Xiao Lin and told them to come over to him. As sharp objects started to protrude from his chest, he told them that they should make progress on the project together and become a happy family again. The protruding objects from Uncle Lin's chest grew longer, and they were coming at Lu Renjia. He told Xiao Lin that if Wang Xi was with them, she may have a way to save her father. While sensing the attack, Lu Renjia told them that they could only restrain him for the moment. Then he inhaled sharply and released his horns to release some of his blood, whirling it around to cut the tentacle-like objects that came out of Uncle Lin's chest. Upon seeing Lu Renjia's attack, Sinan looked disgusted with the blood tornado and said it was such a sloppy fighting style. While Lu Renjia was mid-air, Uncle Lin smiled maniacally as he lunged his weapon at Lu Renjia, and proudly said that Lu Renjia couldn't dodge his attack because he was up in the air. Lu Renjia was surprised by how fast Uncle Lin was, but as he grabbed and held onto the weapon that was piercing his body, he realized that the armor had a jet-powered speed boost and called it fun. Instead of looking hopeless or in pain, Lu Renjia smiled at Uncle Lin like he was expecting things to turn out that way. Uncle Lin's eyes were wide open in surprise as Lu Renjia tilted his head back with all his might. As Lu Renjia asked Uncle Lin who told him that he wanted to dodge, he swiftly moved his head forward and delivered a headbutt that made Uncle Lin's face contort in pain. Lu Renjia commanded him to lie down as Uncle Lin fell to the ground due to the impact. The headbutt's impact was so strong that Uncle Lin's head created a hole in the floor. Uncle Lin lay on the ground with his mouth wide open. 
and he seemed unconscious. As Lu Renjia stretched his shoulders and told them that they had to think of a way to bring him back, Sinan called out to him and came running towards him. Sinan looked worried as he asked Lu Renjia if Wang Zai would really have a way because he thought he had said earlier that Uncle Lin's condition was irreversible. Lu Renjia looked sad as he sighed and told Sinan that he had to have a little hope because delaying or stopping the condition would be good enough. As the two of them were talking, someone called out to them, and it made them turn towards the direction where the voice was coming from. It was Yang Dai, and she had her sharp nails pointed at Sio Lin's throat while asking Sinan and Lu Renjia if they weren't forgetting something. Yang Dai was across from Sinan and Lu Renjia. She held Zio Lin hostage and asked them if they had seen enough. Then she told them to stay still. Both of them stood vigilantly as Lu Renjia commended Yang Dai for her persistence. He acknowledged that she was able to still be up and kicking with only half of her body remaining. Yang Dai looked maniacal with her tongue out as she told them to shut up. Then she told them that she could modify her body however she wished after she left the place. She promised that Zio Lin's head wouldn't be separated from her body if they let her safely enter the elevator. Vein started to pop on Yang Dai's face as she scratched Zio Lin's throat with her nails and warned Lu Renjia to behave. She said that although she didn't know how he escaped from the test subjects down there, from the battle she observed, she knew that he was definitely not to be underestimated. Lu Renjia just glared at her and said nothing. While he was cursing in his head, thinking that the blood loss had caused his focus and attention span to dramatically decrease, he had not even noticed that Yang Dai moved. Lu Renjia took a step forward while thinking that Yang Dai seemed to have some mental issues too. He had to get rid of her quickly to prevent her from stirring up more trouble in the future. But to his surprise, his body seemed like it was no longer cooperating, and he coughed up blood. This made Sinan look at him with worry. While Sinan held him up to prevent him from falling down, Lu Renjia cursed and told Sinan that he was okay. But in his mind, he was thinking that he really wanted to eat something sweet. As Sinan held Lu Renjia, who was having trouble standing up, Yang Dai told them not to waste their energy. She guaranteed that no matter what they planned to do, she could slit Zio Lin's throat before that. She then commanded them to turn left and press a button. She promised to return Zio Lin to them once she reached the surface. While Yang Dai was telling them that all of them, along with the small declining village, would die once she left the place and that the result of the project would improve her status and reputation within the organization. Uncle Lin, who was lying on the ground behind Lu Renjia, suddenly disappeared. A huge hand suddenly grabbed Yang Dai's head and told her that she was not allowed while making funny sounds. It was Uncle Lin who could no longer speak properly. He just yelled the word daughter and started screaming as he pulled Yang Dai's head out of her torso. Both Lu Renjia and Sinan were surprised and could not believe the scene that was unfolding in front of them. With only her head remaining, Yang Dai was still able to talk. She angrily asked Uncle Lin if he was betraying the organization. But Uncle Lin only laughed maniacally and made funny sounds as a response. Yang Dai was annoyed and thought that Uncle Lin had already gone mad. Seeing the situation she was in, Yang Dai got pissed and yelled that all of them should go die while making her torso move to attack Zio Lin. A huge hand suddenly pushed Zio Lin away. It was Uncle Lin who was now pierced by Yang Dai's arms and was screaming hysterically. Both Sinan and Sio Lin worried about Uncle Lin while Lu Renji's attention was elsewhere. He was hearing a beeping sound and asked them if they could also hear it. But before anyone could answer him, explosives located in the ceilings detonated, which startled Lu Renjia. Yang Dai was laughing hysterically. With the veins around her eyes popping out, she told them that she had planted bombs at the weight-bearing points of the building structure beforehand. She said that it was originally going to destroy the data after she escaped. Yang Dai was still about to say something, but Lu Renjia stepped on her face to shut her up. Lu Renjia was sweating and looked agitated as he told his companions that they had to get out of there quickly. Meanwhile, Sinan and Zio Lin were trying to get Uncle Lin to get up and bring him with them, but the armor's system had been giving out notifications that the damage level was fatal. Uncle Lin seemed to notice something as the system notified him that it was unable to repair damages and that death was impending. A pillar was about to crush Sinan and Zio Lin, but Uncle Lin used the remaining energy he had and shielded them from it. Both of them called out to Uncle Lin with their voices full of worry as he got crushed by the pillar. Coughing up blood and still looking like a maniac, Uncle Lin yelled at both Sinan and Zio Lin and told them to escape quickly. Sinan looked at Uncle Lin with a conflicted expression. Then he decided to grab Zio Lin and run away from the collapsing building while Zio Lin was crying in his arms, reaching out and calling out to her father. As they departed, Uncle Lin told them that he would now leave the family in their hands, his children. Sinan continued to run away without looking back, while Zio Lin was sobbing 
sobbing as she saw her father being buried under the huge rocks and pillars. Uncle Lin grabbed the mechanical Auntie Lin and Sayok Shuen in his arms and embraced them as he breathed his last breath. At the village cemetery, Uncle Lin's headstone was created and marked with his picture. As someone placed a bouquet of flowers on his grave, they said they didn't know that the deaths of Auntie Lin and Sayok Shuen had such a great impact, leading Uncle Lin to do such a thing. Besides Zio Lin, who was wearing burial clothes, the village chief sighed and expressed sadness and pity for Uncle Lin, who had been tempted by Yang Dai. Regret filled the village chief's face as he looked over Uncle Lin's grave and expressed the sentiment that things might have turned out better if they had given him more guidance. Zio Lin tried to comfort her third uncle, and she started to apologize for her father's actions. However, the village chief stopped her and told her not to blame herself because what happened was not her fault. He then told her that the family depends on her now, so she has to be strong. Zio Lin looked downcast, but she still gave her third uncle an affirmative response. The village chief then turned to talk to the two escorts, Lu Rengia and Sinan, and told them that none of the villagers were willing to send Uncle Lin off, so he did not expect them to be willing to come. He also thanked them for their help in bringing peace back to the village, to which Sinan awkwardly responded that it was what they should do. The village chief then handed them the receipt for the union he had signed. It was about the special mission of building an escort agency. Lu Rengia glanced over his shoulders to check on Sinan as the village chief congratulated the two of them. Sinan looked awkward as he thanked the village chief, whom he almost addressed as third uncle, and told him that if there was any trouble in the village in the future, he requested that they contact him and gave his word that he would be there at any time. Nostalgia filled the village chief's eyes as he looked up at Sinan and told him that he reminded him of a certain boy. He turned his back on them as he told Sinan that he resembled Uncle Lin of the past, having achieved so much at such a young age. Then he waved them goodbye, telling them to take care. Sinan longingly looked at his third uncle as the village chief told them that he had plenty of things to do to keep himself busy, from the villagers' food supply to the rebuilding of the warehouse. He said it was time for him to leave and advised them to rest as well. A realization suddenly hit Sinan. He immediately turned to the still downcast Lin Lan and told her that he would definitely avenge Uncle Lin. He warned her that it would be hard to predict what the organization would do, and since there wasn't much reason for her to stay in the village, he proposed that she come with him to Tianfu base. Lin Lan didn't say anything, and she was shrouded in an ominous aura as she kept her head down. Sinan continued to convince her and told her that they were going to build an escort agency so they would be able to protect her better there. However, without turning back to look at him, Lin Lan cut him off and told him that there was no need. Sinan looked worried when Lin Lan told him to go do what he wanted to do without looking at him, but he didn't have the courage to protest. Finally, Lin Lan turned to look at him with a wistful smile and told him that someone has to live in the house to make it a home, so she would stay in the village and help everyone rebuild it in the hopes that it would help atone for her father's crimes, even if only by a little bit. Then, in the midst of the conversation, she remembered something and told them to come with her. They went back to her house, and a sparkling motorcycle greeted them, radiating a golden light. While Lin Lan told Sinan that her father was certain that he would come back one day, so he prepared those escort equipment for him while incorporating some suggestions from Feng the Sixth. Lu Rengia looked pleased as he looked at the motorcycle, while Sinan could not believe what he was seeing. Lin Lan also handed a notebook to him. It was a research on the application and uses of the nervous enhancement ability written by his uncle, Lin Hongnian, and it was written in the year 133, post-catastrophe leap month, which was a date Sinan recognized. Lu Rengia noticed Sinan's reaction and asked him if there was a problem with the date. Sinan, who looked crestfallen, told him that it was the year when he tried to become an escort but was mocked and laughed at by the union trainers and was kicked out. Sinan looked down at the ground as he remembered that it was the time when Uncle Lin became more invested in his work. Lin Lan looked worried as Sinan's shoulders slumped when he realized that the reason why Uncle Lin took a lot of his blood, which made him realize that he was an accomplice, was because he was constantly trying to think of a way to help him. To comfort him, she reached out and touched Sinan's face and told him that the reason she was so mad at him in the past was not because of what he thought, that he killed Zio Xuan. She removed Sinan's mask and told him that it was because he never treated them as family and thought that they would definitely be angry at him, so he left without saying goodbye. Lin Lan smiled warmly at him as she held his mask and told him that the place was his home and they were family. Tears started to trickle down Sinan's face. He could no longer hold back his tears as Lin Lan welcomed him back home, and he sobbed as he responded that he was back. As Sinan and Lu Rengia traveled back to Tianfu base with their new motorcycle, Lu Rengia suddenly asked Sinan if he was really okay with leaving a young lady alone in a village. Sinan told him that there shouldn't be any problems when she was under their third uncle's care, and with Yang Dai dead, the organization shouldn't be able to do anything to them. 
They were sitting back to back, and Lu Renjia glanced over his shoulder to ask Sinan if the organization was the reason why he hid his identity from the villagers. While looking straight ahead, Sinan told him that it was the conclusion he reached and added that once Lin Lan set her mind to it, he couldn't do anything to change her mind. Lu Renji sighed as he confirmed that what Sinan said made sense and that it was not currently safe at Tianfu base anyway. Sinan called out to Lu Renji, and this time Lu Renji turned to look at him, his eyes filled with worry as he asked if what Lin Lan had told them yesterday could be true. Lin Lan had told them that she didn't know much, but she knew that the person her father was constantly in contact with seemed to hold a high status in the Tianfu base, like an executive director. Sinan looked concerned, as there were so many executive directors that he didn't know where they should start looking. Lu Renjia responded that they had narrowed things down to the problem with resources, so they should start looking there. The motorcycle suddenly stopped. Sinan looked concerned as he gazed ahead, while Lu Renjia turned to face Sinan and asked why he had stopped and what the smell was. But before Sinan could respond to his questions, they were already answered when he saw the heavily burned forest in front of them. Sinan surveyed the scene and wondered if what had happened was a forest fire. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia poked the ashes on the ground. He examined it and discovered that it was the corpse of a demonic beast. Sinan wasn't surprised by this information as he knew that there were a couple of demonic beast bosses in the area. If he hadn't been traveling with Lu Rengia, he wouldn't have chosen that route. Lu Rengia sniffed the ashes on his fingers and was surprised to find that they were completely charred. This made Sinan wonder if a forest fire could burn demonic beasts to such a degree. While Lu Rengia looked at the burned forest, he crossed his arms and mentioned that things felt familiar for some reason. Sinan considered it a good thing that the demonic beasts were all burned away and suggested that they report back to let the other escorts know that the route was now available. Sinan hurriedly pushed Lu Rengia, who was dragging his feet, and told him to pick up his pace. He mentioned that there would be a reward for being the first to report important information about routes and paths. Meanwhile, at the Water Bear's headquarters, someone was creating an ice figure of Lu Rengia's fully transformed form. It was the Ice King they had encountered before, and he had a crazy look in his eyes as he chomped off the limbs of the figure he had just created. Sitting on a bench inside a cell, he was munching on the ice figure in his hand when Lin Hansu approached his cell to check on him. The Ice King looked annoyed as Lin Hansu asked him how it felt to be beaten up by the Crimson Shura and locked away in solitary confinement afterward, taunting him. He then smiled smugly and asked Lin Hansu if he had managed to find the Crimson Shura, stating that their boss toy should have injured him quite a bit. Lin Hansu replied that their insider only mentioned going on another secret escort mission somewhere, but someone intentionally removed the location of the mission. The Ice King, nonchalantly leaning on the wall, told him it must have been Supervisor Zhang. While reminding Lin Hansu that they weren't close enough for small talk, he questioned why he had come to find him if the Crimson Shira hadn't been found yet. Lin Hansu told him that it was because of a separate mission, that the experiment had a new breakthrough, and the situation was quite complicated on both sides. Their boss thought there may be something they had overlooked. The Ice King had a delighted smile on his face and found it interesting when he realized that the plan to turn Tianfu base into the next San base had started. Back at the Tianfu base, Sinan's face was greasy, and as he wiped his face with a wrench in hand, he huffed in relief, seeing that what he was working on was done. He had attached his newly acquired motorcycle to a sidecar, and was invigorated by the fact that his Rolls Royce, the third, had been fully revived, allowing him to make money from delivery escort missions. Suddenly, someone commented on his happiness with just doing delivery missions and told him to be more ambitious. It was the silver-haired lady, Wang Zai's bodyguard, and she criticized Sinan for fussing over delivery services when he was about to become a gold-level escort. But Sinan refuted her and said that all their daily expenses and spending were paid using his money, to which the silver-haired lady shyly responded that it couldn't be helped. She told him that Wang Zai seemed to be angry about being stuck at the base, so he shouldn't think about the money at the base. As she handed Wang Zai's list of materials to Sinan, he scratched the back of his neck and complained. Shivering, he looked at Wang Zai's list of materials and remembered to ask the silver-haired lady if she had seen Zhang Qi. She responded with a question about Zhang Qi, saying that she was coming to deal with the checks and examinations for the escort agency. Sinan stared into space, not knowing the answer to her question. As he thought about it longer, he realized that Lu Rengia had also disappeared. Meanwhile, Ms. Zhang Qi stood at the edge of a glass roof, observing the staff that were in a hurry, carrying boxes. She thought about how correct Sinan and Lu Rengia were. As the staff continued to scurry, Ms. Zhang Qi didn't expect that there would be so much hidden behind such a small mission. The problematic escort resource packages all seemed to point to a couple of warehouses near the place where she was. She continued to look down and observe that the place she was currently at had the strictest security. There was no time between the guards swapping shifts, and she could not find another door leading inside. 
Her face lit up when she had the idea to tell Lu Renjia to cause some trouble, and maybe then some flaws or weak points could be exposed. Ms. Zhang Qi was startled when someone wearing a staff uniform suddenly appeared behind her, asking her why she was smiling so eerily and if she was plotting against someone again. She quickly took a step forward and twisted her body. She attacked the staff with a turning side kick, but they managed to catch her attack, and she was only able to kick their hat off the person's head. The person wearing the staff uniform was Lu Renjia, and he effortlessly caught Ms. Zhang Qi's leg with one hand and caught his hat that was thrown away with the other. He told her that she scared him quite a bit when she kicked at him all of a sudden. Immediately retracting her leg, Ms. Zhang Qi complained to Lu Renjia that she was the one who was scared as he appeared behind her so suddenly. But Lu Renjia reasoned out that he just saw her acting all sneaky and suspicious, so he just came to say hello. While both of them were looking down from the glass roof, observing the staff below, Ms. Zhang Qi asked Lu Renjia what he was doing there. He told her that it was the only place he could go for a problem with resources. He then asked her what she had seen so far as she had been there for a while, and she told him that the security was overly strict for a warehouse, so she had yet to think of a good way to get inside. They both squatted down, and while Lu Renjia had a mischievous smile as he put on his cap, Ms. Zhang Qi glanced at him with a teasing smile and asked him if he had an idea, as his attire didn't have much use because the inner parts of the warehouse required ID verification. Lu Renjia looked like he was deep in thought as he told Ms. Zhang Qi to wait for a moment. Two guards were talking about the incident in the Erkao district, where quite a few people died during escort missions. One of them told the other to let the people in higher positions worry about the incident, as all they needed to do was to watch the warehouse closely. They were busy talking and did not hear a beeping sound, signaling the detonation of an explosive. A huge explosion occurred, and the adjacent warehouse was on fire, which startled the staff. As the fire approached them, one of the guards panicked, not knowing what to do. But the other guard quickly told him to go and put out the fire because they couldn't let it reach their location. As the guards hurried towards the adjacent warehouse, Lu Renjia informed Ms. Zhang Qi that all the guards were gone. So they decided to go in, and it was then that Ms. Zhang Qi realized that Lu Renjia was behind the explosion. Lu Renjia held out a thumbs up and feigned innocence, saying that it wasn't him but a new porter who was clumsy and had placed some flammable items in the front for some reason. In response, Ms. Zhang Qi nervously replied that her concern at that moment was whether she would be accidentally burned to death by him. The fire was now burning intensely and the staff could no longer contain it. They decided to call for reinforcements, but one of them realized that they couldn't ask for reinforcements, so they had to rally more people from the farm to come and help. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia was sitting inside an office, asking Ms. Zhang Qi, who was standing in front of a bookshelf, if she was finished yet, as the fire was slowly spreading and getting closer. While she continued to flip through the pages, Lu Renjia asked her what she was trying to find in those files. Ms. Zhang Qi told him that she originally wanted to find out who the supplier was, but she had made some unexpected discoveries. Without turning to look at Lu Renjia, her face turned grim as she told him that the problematic warehouses were all owned by the same official, one of the Tianfu bases executives, Vice Director Ma, and he was in charge of all the processes from imports to exports. She believed that if they started with him, they should be able to uncover many things. Lu Renjia solemnly looked at her and told her that she should have told him sooner so he could have gone to find him directly. With a serious look on her face, Ms. Zhang Qi turned to Lu Renjia and informed him that Vice Director Ma had gone missing. Lu Renjia was stunned into silence by what he had just heard. When he composed his thoughts, he asked Ms. Zhang Qi if it was casual news that one of the executives from the bases was missing. Ms. Zhang Qi informed him that Tianfu had announced Vice Director Ma taking three days off due to sickness. However, her sources revealed that he had not been seen in public for five days, leaving her clueless about his whereabouts. Lu Renjia inquired if the union wouldn't raise concerns about the situation. Ms. Zhang Qi replied that she was still trying to investigate the details. While discussing the matter, Ms. Zhang Qi seemed concerned as she mentioned that escort missions from Erdea Kiao had been recalled. She found it suspicious that Tianfu completely ignored the demonic beasts that had cut off the main transport path. Furthermore, all the recall signatures matched those of the missing vice director Ma. She then pointed to a page of the document she was holding and asked Lu Renjia to look at it, the supervisor's inspection records from two days ago. As she held out the document, Ms. Zhang Qi informed Lu Renjia that Vice Director Ma had actually come to check the delivery of goods. However, she hadn't seen such records in the official schedule, which added to Lu Renjia's confusion about the matter. He was no longer certain if Vice Director Ma was missing or not. 
Just as a woman began ascending the stairs, Lu Renjia heard her footsteps and immediately alerted Ms. Zhang Qi that someone was approaching. The woman arrived at the office and promptly opened the door. Surprised to find no one there, despite having heard noise a moment ago, she decided not to dwell on it and proceeded to light up a torch. She threw the torch at the documents, knowing that it would be troublesome if Tianfu investigated the list of resources and goods due to the incident. Thus, she chose to burn the files. Additionally, she suspected something suspicious about the fire and believed someone was investigating, so she felt compelled to warn the executive to be more cautious. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia's face was pressed between Ms. Zhang Qi's bosoms as he questioned whether they were simply allowing the woman to destroy the evidence like that. They were hanging from the ceiling. Lu Renjia was gripping the ceiling with his hands while carrying Ms. Zhang Qi, who was seated on his torso, and Ms. Zhang Qi assured him that it was fine since they had already seen what they needed to see. After the woman left the office, she made the decision to let the warehouse burn, as they needed to act quickly regarding matters in the Erkao district. With the woman gone, Ms. Zhang Qi noticed something. She suddenly realized where Lu Renjia's face was and became upset. Lu Renjia tried to calm her down, instructing her not to move, but it was too late. They fell heavily to the floor. Lu Renjia landed flat on his back while Ms. Zhang Qi ended up on his chest with her backside facing his face. As he complained about her unexpectedly heavy body, she blushed in embarrassment and told him not to say that she was heavy. Her expression swiftly changed to a satisfied one when she realized that Lu Renjia's antics had actually paid off. Due to the incident, Vice Director Ma, who had gone missing, was likely to pay the place a visit in person. Upon hearing her words, Lu Renji's face turned serious, and he suggested that tailing the woman might also lead to some results. However, Ms. Zhang Qi confidently rejected his suggestion, stating that she would handle things from Tianfu's side. She advised him to go directly to the Erkuao district, as the matters there seemed more suspicious. Proudly crossing her arms, Ms. Zhang Qi informed Lu Renjia that since Tianfu had no commissions, they would need to come up with another cover story for him. Meanwhile, Lu Renjia extended his hands shakily, as if seeking help, and asked her if they could discuss the plan once she got up first. In a market within the base, a blonde, muscular man forcefully pushed away an old man, causing him to fall to the ground. He informed the old man that Tianfu had declared they were unable to go to the Erkao district, so he couldn't assist him. Distressed by the news, the old man mentioned that the blonde man had already accepted his deposit the day before. With a threatening demeanor, the blonde man informed the old man that according to the union's rules, if an escort mission was cancelled due to unavoidable circumstances, the deposit would not be refunded, so he should leave. The old man complained and accused the blonde man of bullying him. Suddenly, someone interjected in their conversation, citing the escort regulations, Section 2, Article 6. The blonde man immediately looked terrified when he looked behind him, and saw that it was Ms. Zhang Qi who told him that escorts cannot accept a commissioner's deposit when they clearly know that the mission can't be accepted, citing that the notice was released the morning of the day before yesterday, and he accepted the deposit just yesterday. Ms. Zhang Qi glared at him menacingly and asked him if he didn't want his license anymore. Though he was still scared, the blonde man acted tough and clicked his tongue, claiming that he just forgot about it as he could not memorize all of them. He tossed the money on the ground in front of the kneeling old man as he walked out and complained about how unlucky he was. Ms. Zhang Qi checked on the old man, asking if he was alright, and the old man thanked her. Lu Renjia was with Ms. Zhang Qi. Both of them looked at the blonde man walking out, and while Lu Renjia thought about how quickly the man ran away, Ms. Zhang Qi told him about how the commission board's atmosphere was really fragile at the moment as the escort under the Wu family had scattered everywhere after their collapse. Ms. Zhang Qi knelt down to help the old man pick up the money the blonde man had just tossed. She told him that she overheard that he wished to go to the Erkiao district, and the old man confirmed that his house was in that area. He had been molding concrete for construction in Tianfu, so he didn't know what had happened. With Lu Renjia now standing beside Ms. Zhang Qi, the old man told her that he just knew that he suddenly couldn't go back and that he couldn't get in touch with his family, so he didn't know what to do. Ms. Zhang Qi quickly stood up and proudly introduced Lu Renjia beside her as a black iron escort who was quite reliable in his work, with justified prices and a naive and innocent nature, to which both Lu Renjia and the old man were startled. A few moments later, pebbles were hitting a golden Rolls Royce logo. Sinan was vibrating, and he looked both confused and upset. He was now traveling with Lu Renjia and the old man in his Rolls Royce, and he couldn't understand how he ended up that way when he was just waiting at home for Ms. Zhang Qi to come and give him the new contract for the escort agency. The old man looked nervous, gripping the railings with both hands as he thanked Sinan for being willing to escort him. 
However, he complained that his iron donkey was a bit too fast and requested to slow down a bit. Sinan told him to hold on tight, as the nearby area had been marked by Tianfu as not recommended for travel, so it would be better if they passed through quickly. With his thermos in his hands, Lu Renjia suddenly asked the old man why he was insistent on going back. The old man told him that he had a son in the village. While rummaging through his bag, the old man explained that although his son's personality was lacking and his work was nothing to brag about, he was still a filial son who would contact him every week at a set time via letters. Holding out a letter, the old man explained that the last letter his son sent him said that the demonic beasts near their house were starting to become a bit abnormal, and he has yet to hear from him since then, so it really worries him. What the old man said piqued Lu Renji's interest, and he asked if the nearby demonic beasts were the ones with a large mouth. Sinan chimed in, asking if he was referring to mountain toads, and the old man confirmed that they were indeed mountain toads. He added that they were nocturnal creatures who didn't like to move around much during the day. They would pretend to be rocks and lie beneath the ground to suddenly ambush prey that passed by. Lu Rengia looked worried when he heard about the ambush. They were now traveling along a path surrounded by rocks, and while still driving, Sinan had a bad feeling. He looked over at Lu Rengia, who was sitting behind him, and asked why he had suddenly asked such a question. Just as Lu Renjia was about to answer his question, the rock beside them suddenly opened its eyes. Sinan was surprised when a huge mouth suddenly appeared above them, just as Lu Renjia answered his question, that he had just seen one right beneath them. The mountain toad croaked as it closed its mouth, trapping the Rolls Royce and its passengers inside. Suddenly, a glare of light appeared on the toad's belly. The toad exploded, and while Lu Rengia seemed to be calmly sitting behind Sinan, Sinan and the old man looked extremely terrified. They safely landed on the ground, and upon seeing the terrified face of the old man, Lu Rengia laughed. But then he quickly reassured the old man that things were fine, while Sinan interjected and complained that he was the one who was really surprised. He cursed and complained about how the mountain toad was lying in the middle of the path during the day. Sinan looked so angry as he questioned what the path clearers were doing and how the union had the audacity to make him pay a path maintenance fee. When Lu Rengia told him that the place they were on didn't commission path clearers, Sinan also got annoyed with him for not alerting him when he saw the mountain toad. Lu Rengia smirked as he told Sinan that there was no use in alerting him because he couldn't avoid them if he were to continue going that way. The mountain toad's carcass was lying in front of them when they suddenly heard another croak. Sinan looked puzzled as he tried to decipher what Lu Rengia meant when he said that he couldn't avoid them. Suddenly, an endless croaking sound could be heard, and the mountain toads that had buried themselves in the ground started to emerge. Sinan's eyes widened as he realized what Lu Rengia was trying to say, that the entire path was filled with mountain toads. They were now surrounded by a lot of mountain toads, and Lu Rengia hopped off Sinan's vehicle. Meanwhile, someone using binoculars called for his leader's attention. The leader quickly asked him what he was seeing and why the stone toads were so agitated. The man told him that a team of escorts had broken in. The leader called them unlucky because they had even disrupted his plans, and he told his team that they should go down once the stone toads settled down. The man with the binoculars was observing Sinan's group. He quickly reported to his leader that the escorts seemed to be riding an iron donkey, so there must be at least one escort above white silver level. Upon hearing this, the leader was amused and claimed that when the team was all dead, the iron donkey would be his. The leader was certain that the team would all be dead, considering how many toads there were. Even three white silver escorts would be useless against them. Excitedly, he asked for the binoculars to see what his future vehicle looked like. He was already looking forward to a future where he wouldn't have to worry so much when he picked up his father from Tianfu. He hoped that the vehicle wouldn't be swallowed by the mountain toads. As he looked through the binoculars, he was surprised. He saw the old man and immediately recognized that it was his father, whom he had instructed not to come back for a while. Quickly, he dropped the binoculars, and tears ran down his face. He yelled at his men that he was about to be fatherless, and he rallied them to accompany him as he charged down. His men cried a battle cry as they charged down with him, while he called out to his father and declared that he was going to save him. One of his men stopped him in his tracks and told him to wait. But the leader, who was crying, continued to call for his father and asked him what he would be waiting for. The group saw Lu Rengia, who was on top of one of the mountain toads, and they saw that all the mountain toads were already dead. The leader quickly stopped crying as he was baffled by what was going on. Lu Rengia stood up and noticed the men surrounding him. He smirked as he recognized that they were mountain bandits. Then suddenly, his expression changed into a comically confused one as he asked the leader why he was calling him father. The leader frantically tried to explain that it was not the case. The bandits started wrapping the mountain toads in ropes. One of them gave instructions to the other men to keep their eyes wide open so they wouldn't leave anything behind that was worth money. He reminded them that their people in the stockaded village were waiting to eat, so they should thoroughly check if there were any of the needed demonic beasts. On the other hand, the leader reprimanded his 
stabbed for coming back when he told him not to. He emphasized how dangerous the area was, with even the nearby escorts coming in. The leader's nerves popped out of his face as he pointed his fingers at Sinan and Lu Rengia, causing Sinan's nerves to pop out as well. He asked them if all they could see was money and whether the base even offered any commissions for their place now. He threatened them that if anything were to happen to his father, he would most certainly shred them into a million pieces. Sinan and the leader clashed, their faces twisted with anger as they drew their weapons and pointed them at each other while bumping their heads together. Sinan was furious at the disrespectful attitude of a petty mountain bandit, and threatened to capture the leader and bring him back to claim the bounty. Meanwhile, the leader claimed that he had been commissioned by the base and dared Sinan to report him, asserting that he was not afraid of two rule-breaking escorts. Suddenly, someone pulled out a paper fan and called someone else a spoiled brat. It was the old man, who began hitting the leader on the top of his head. While the leader pleaded for gentleness, the old man stated that it was the leader who insisted on returning and should watch his words when referring to their two saviors. The old man instructed the leader to apologize. Lu Rengia was curious about what the leader had said, as he assumed they were there to ambush escorts. He asked about the commission they had received from the base. The old man shielded the leader once more and commanded him to thoroughly answer the question calling him an embarrassing brat. The leader scratched the top of his head while explaining to Lu Rengia that they were no longer mountain bandits, as they had already turned over a new leaf. He clarified that the people from the Tianfu base came when the movement of nearby demonic beasts affected the main transport path. According to the leader, the people from Tianfu base said they were there to seek their cooperation, and assign them path-clearing commissions, making them professional path-clearers now. Sinan did not believe the leader's claim that a path-clearing commission was entrusted to mountain bandits instead of escorts. He told him to stop lying, but the leader insisted that people from the city would not understand. The leader told him that he had heard that those demonic beasts came from the base. Therefore, they wouldn't ask for escorts in the city to do such dirty work when a bald guy, one of his men, called out for him. The bald guy whispered to him that they had checked all of the beasts, but there were no marked ones. The leader whispered back, wondering how there could be none when there were so many and thinking that their operation was a waste of time. Meanwhile, Sinan looked perplexed as he could not believe that it was possible for demonic beasts to come from the base. However, Lu Rengia didn't look as surprised as he was and added that they were all bad ideas that create trouble. Lu Rengia suddenly approached the leader and asked him what demonic beasts they were looking for. He told the leader that he might have seen one during the fight, and the leader was surprised that he was paying attention to the demonic beasts. The leader scratched the back of his head and held out a piece of paper with the logo of the Water Bear organization in front of Lu Rengia, saying that they were looking for demonic beasts with that symbol on them. Lu Rengia's face turned serious as he told the leader that the strength of those kinds of demonic beasts wasn't something their group of people could deal with, and he asked who commissioned them. Still holding out the paper, the leader told them that they were not sure who specifically commissioned them and admitted that they don't normally mess with those kinds of demonic beasts. However, the commissioner gave them something that they claimed to be new experimental equipment, which piqued Lu Rengia's interest. The bald guy held out a weird incense stick and pointed it out, saying that it was the new experimental equipment. He squatted in front of the group and placed the incense on the ground while explaining that after it was lit, demonic beasts would gather around to smell it, and all they needed to do was hide and wait for a while as the demonic beasts would fall into a weird trance. This way, they could kill them with little difficulty. As the bald man lit up the incense, Lu Rengia leaned over, and his face was full of doubt as he asked the bald man if the incense actually works. The bald man replied that they have already successfully caught many demonic beasts, and even the large group of stone toads earlier was also attracted to the place in the same way. While tapping his father's shoulders, the leader instructed his group that they had lit up more incense sticks, so they should retreat back onto the mountains. His group responded with a chant, confirming that they understood the instructions. Lu Rengia was surprised when he felt the ground suddenly shake. The rest of the group also felt it, and they thought it was an earthquake. They could not figure out what was going on, which made the leader worry about his dad and warn him to be careful. The ground started to split in two. It was coming in their direction at a very high speed, and the group suspected that those were demonic beasts coming their way. But they could not believe that as the incense should only work after a short period of time. Lu Rengia looked apprehensively at the ground and told the group that the event had nothing to do with the incense stick. A huge mouth, so huge that it made the previous mountain toads look like normal-sized ones, came out of the ground as Lu Rengia explained that the demonic beast had been beneath them the entire time. The group was blown away by the force of the demonic beast's mouth surfacing from the ground. Sinan was now riding his Rolls Royce with the old man and he instructed him to hold on tight as he maneuvered his way out of the falling rocks. One of the group members immediately recognized the mark of the water bear organization near the demonic beast's mouth, 
and told everyone that it was the beast they were trying to find, the marked mountain toad. One of the group members almost got eaten by the demonic beast, luckily they were able to dodge it. Their leader immediately checked up on him to see if he was fine, and he confirmed that he was, but he was worried about the other members. The other members were screaming as the demonic beast ate them, and the leader charged towards the beast, instructing his group to get further away. The leader took out another incense stick and hoped that it still worked. He waved the incense in the air, taunted the toad to look his way, and instructed it to quickly go to sleep. The demonic beast looked like it was in a trance as its eyes started to droop. It started to wobble, struggling to keep its balance. And finally, it fell to the ground in front of the leader with such a huge impact that the leader had to brace himself against the gust of wind from the impact to avoid being blown away. The demonic beast lay on the ground snoring, and the leader, though still apprehensive, rejoiced that the incense he used had worked. Sinan looked at the scene with disbelief, even though he saw the incense working with his own eyes. But then something caught his attention. Sinan's expression was filled with concern, and he immediately yelled for the leader to watch out, which confused the old man beside him. As the body of the mountain toad started to bulge, Sinan yelled, explaining that something was moving inside its body. The leader turned to look at them with a puzzled expression on his face, as he did not understand what they meant. Something had now started to grow out of the demonic beast's teeth. Sinan clicked his tongue in annoyance as he drew out his weapon, while the old man warned Titan, the leader, to be careful and watch behind him. A humanoid-looking beast emerged from the mountain toad's skin, and its eyes gleamed as it attacked Titan, who had his back to it, scratching his head and still confused about the situation. The humanoid-looking beast was already a few inches away from attacking his face when he noticed it appear behind him, and he could not react fast enough to avoid it. Suddenly, a huge golden fist appeared and punched the beast so hard that its body was torn into pieces. It was Lu Rengia, and he explained to Titan that what Sinan meant was that they were not out of danger yet. He was hunched over as his four arms grew on his back, and while the remains of the beast splattered around him, he told Titan that he had heard about a type of tongue lice that likes to hide in the mouths of toads, but he did not think he would encounter one there. Suddenly, something caught Lu Rengia's attention. It was the mountain bandit's petrified expression while looking at him, and while his members struggled to find the right words to say and stuttered, Titan immediately told Lu Rengia that he was also someone they needed to find. Everyone immediately knelt on the ground and bowed to Lu Rengia, while Titan cried his heart out, commanding his men to come over quickly and thanking Lu Rengia, their deity, who had come to save them again, which left Lu Rengia speechless and uncomfortable. At Spirit Wind Mountain Village, someone was explaining that ever since they separated, they had been trying to look for any signs of the Great One. They didn't think their brothers would be safe by the Great One again. Titan was now with the doctor, who saw the circumstances they were in as fate. They were talking to Lu Rengia and Sinan, who recognized them as the people from Spirit Wind Mountain Village. They remembered that the nearby area was indeed where the force of the village originally resided. Lu Rengia looked disappointed as he told the doctor that he didn't want to talk about fate at that moment. He then hysterically asked about the statue placed in the middle of the village. It was a six-armed statue with a mask and spiky hair. When the doctor told him that the statue was supposed to be him, he complained hysterically that it didn't even resemble him. But the doctor paid no mind to his complaints and continued to explain that their brothers were extremely grateful for his benevolence, and that they had made a statue in his image. The doctor looked happy as he placed his palms together and told Lu Rengia that the statue made it easier for them to burn incense, and pray for good fortune for him. Ever since then, the mountain village no longer relied on robbing and stealing from escorts to make a living. As the gigantic mountain toad lay on the village, Lu Rengia realized that it was the reason why they accepted the road clearing commission. The doctor's expression immediately changed, and he looked deep in thought as he admitted that he knew those union guys wouldn't have had any good intentions when it came to people like them. So he checked the details of the commission thoroughly and saw that the conditions were all official and legal, and it was even under the name of an executive. A realization suddenly hit the doctor, and he asked Lu Rengia if what he meant was that there was something wrong with the commission. Lu Rengia looked at the doctor solemnly and told him that he was not sure, but he planned to wait in the village for the person who receives the product of the commission. The doctor was glad that Lu Rengia would accompany them to oversee the situation when the time came, so he immediately went to prepare the best room for the two of them to rest in, and one of the villagers ushered them in. As soon as Lu Rengia and Sinan left the room, the doctor called Titan's attention and told him that he couldn't help but feel that something was wrong. 
as he observed from Lu Rengia's attitude that he seemed to care a lot about the matter. Titan agreed with him and told him that it was such a crazy coincidence for them to accept his father's commission. Titan suddenly remembered something and asked the doctor if they were really letting Lu Rengia stay in the village, as he observed that he seemed to be sensitive to the symbol he showed him earlier. Titan sweated profusely as he thought about the situation they were in, that if Lu Rengia kills the Union envoy in the mountain village, then they can't escape the blame. The doctor remained calm as he told Titan that someone with Lu Rengia's level of strength could easily save their village if they wanted to, but they could also easily destroy it if they wanted to, so the choice was not in their hands. Meanwhile, Sinan and Lu Lu Rengia were standing in front of the statue that Lu Rengia had been concerned about earlier. Sinan teased Lu Rengia, saying that he thought the statue resembled him a bit. Lu Rengia asked if he was serious. On the other hand, someone was holding the decapitated head of a brown-haired man with a monocle. It was Lin Hansu, and as he fiddled with and stared at the decapitated head, he expressed his disappointment because, upon reflection, the executive's identity, Vice Director Ma, was truly quite useful. The Ice King sat behind him and told Lin Hansu that his dark humor was not something he could compliment, as he had the executive come find him so happily, only for him to be killed. Lin Hansu refuted, stating that making him happy for a moment was the only value the executive had left, so he was just using things for their intended purpose. Lin Hansu tossed the decapitated head, turned toward the Ice King and told him that he too had his intended purpose. He had gone out of his way to dig him out of their boss's hands, so he better guard the place well because if the thing beneath them wakes up, neither of them would be able to handle the consequences. The Ice King looked apprehensive and asked Lin Hansu if he was joking, even adding that the old man had recently run away. While they were talking, someone with silver hair came from behind them and called them out. As Lin Hansu glanced at the man, he told the Ice King that he was afraid he would get bored of guarding the thing beneath them, so he might as well alleviate some of his boredom at that moment. The Ice King looked nervous as he turned to look behind him and saw the old man he was talking about standing there. He accused Lin Hansu of wanting the old man to get rid of him. The old man stood there with a double-bladed spear in his hands, his face expressing darkness, as he asked them why he sensed some of his power within the two of them. Somewhere, a huge circular metal door started to freeze. Ice shards burst out from it, and they started growing everywhere while an eternal winter tower stood tall amongst them. The noise caught Lu Rengia's attention, causing him to look in the direction of the tower. Sinan stood beside Lu Rengia and marveled at the same scenery. Fog spread everywhere as two more towers rose from the ground. Sinan wondered if the Ice King was inside and why there were three towers erected in the distance. Lu Rengia looked serious as he pointed out that one of the towers was slightly different. Meanwhile, a battle was ensuing between the old man and the Ice King at the tower. As the Ice King blocked the old man's spear with his arms, he called him a crazy old man and challenged him to see how much power he still had left. This made the old man realize that they had ambushed the sand base and tricked him into being caught, all to steal the power residing within him. The Ice King pushed the old man's spear away and reached out to attack him, mocking him for having so many questions when they would all be useless if he died. The old man effortlessly swung his spear, hitting the Ice King's hands and stopping his attack. It made the Ice King flinch as he called him ridiculous. Revealing his icy wings, the old man told the Ice King that a mere copy was nothing more than a flickering flame from a firefly, yet it dared to engage in a battle of brightness with the sun and moon. He glared at the Ice King and told him that an ability forcefully taken was nothing but an illusion, and in the end, it would reflect back and destroy its wielder's body. As the Ice King held his injured hand, the old man told him that he should take better care of himself and kindly asked him to stop resisting. However, suddenly someone jumped from the ground and laughed sinisterly. It was Lin Hansu, and as he hovered behind the old man, he told him that a stubborn person like him wouldn't understand what the future holds and would be even farther from understanding the revolutionary achievements of their work. But then Lin Hansu said that it did not matter. He then lunged for an attack with his left arm, which he had transformed into an ice blade, as he told the old man that he was still good material to feed to the demonic beasts. The old man was surprised by the ambush, but he still managed to block the attack behind him with his spear. Lin Hansu stepped on the spear, but the old man slashed it in his direction which pushed him backwards while belittling him for using such underhanded tricks. Lin Hansu and the Ice King were now flying side by side, with both of their icy wings revealed. Lin Hansu laughed and told the old man that he had sustained such a severe injury before, so he wondered how many floors worth of power he could have at the moment. The old man recognized Lin Hansu's voice and realized that they were the guys who tricked him at the sand base. Suddenly, the floor beneath the old man opened, and as Lin Hansu told him that he was afraid that today he would be tricked again, a huge laser cannon fired at him without any warning. Lin Hansu told the old man that even if he were someone at the peak of platinum in terms of strength, he couldn't fight the two of them alone. However, the old man managed to block the cannon's attack with his ice shield, and while he recognized that it was the nuclear power laser from Eagle City, 
He also commended them for using it as a good tactic. Suddenly, a vehicle was traveling on the ground, and the old man confidently asked Lin Hansu, and the Ice King who had claimed to be alone. Someone jumped from the vehicle while cursing the old man. It was Lu Rengia, and he told the old man that he trusted he had been well since they last met. The nuclear power laser continued to fire, and this time it was Lu Rengia who blocked the attack with his hands. Sinan, who was left on the ground with his Rolls Royce, grew worried and told Lu Rengia to be careful. Lu Rengia reassured him that he was fine and instructed him to keep his distance. Although still confused, Sinan couldn't help but be in awe of the person who was able to withstand the attacks from Lin Hansu and the Ice King. He wondered who that person was. While the old man blocked Lin Hansu's blade arms with his spear, he noticed Sinan and wondered why there was a young white silver there. He asked Lu Rengia if he was with that crazy kid. While showing off his power by pushing Lin Hansu back with his spear, the old man introduced himself as an escort of the San Escort Agency, Mo Beiki. He turned to look in Sinan's direction as he told him that it was not a place for someone of his level to be and instructed him to leave immediately. Sinan didn't oppose Mo Beiki and immediately turned back to leave. In his thoughts, he was surprised that the wise king of ice and snow was still alive. Mo Beiki was startled when the ice king suddenly appeared behind him, asking him where he was looking and how he could have time to spare for small fries. As the ice king lunged towards Mo Beiki for an attack, he reminded him of how they dealt with him last time and told him to feel the strength of his claws. Just as the Ice King's attack was about to hit Mo Beiki, a huge chunk of metal blocked the rays of the sun. It was the laser cannon that Lu Rengia had picked up, and as he swung it towards the Ice King, who took a direct hit from the attack, he told him that he was criticizing other people for not paying attention but he himself wasn't paying attention either. The Ice King groaned in pain as he coughed up blood due to the impact. He smirked as he told Lu Rengia that they had met again and asked if he had completely recovered from his wounds, but he referred to him as Sinan Pei. Meanwhile, Sinan, who was driving away from the scene, sneezed at that moment. Lu Rengia laughed and taunted the Ice King to come find out for himself. Lu Rengia attacked the Ice King with a punch that sent the Ice King flying, and Lu Rengia named the move the Sinan Pei Punch. Mo Beiki was confused as to why Lu Rengia was called Sinan Pei and asked him if it was his alias in Tianfu. This made Lu Rengia pause for a moment, but then he told Mo Beiki that it was hard to explain. The Ice King collided with one of the towers and passed through to the other side. Landing on the ground beside Lin Hansu, the Ice King dug his claws into the ground to prevent himself from being pushed back further. He cursed when he realized that Lu Rengia had become stronger and questioned if there was a limit to his strength. At the same time, Lin Hansu glared at Lu Rengia and asked him why he was there. This question made Lu Rengia pause for a moment again but then he decided to tell them that it was also a bit difficult to explain. While Lin Hansu and the Ice King were still on the ground, Mo Beiki and Lu Rengia stood over them, and Lu Rengia suggested that they surrender, while Mo Beiki added that he had enough authority to spare their lives. Lin Hansu was aware that they were dealing with the two trickiest Platinums, so he decided it was time for Plan B, but the Ice King was surprised as he was not aware that they had another plan. Lin Hansu reminded him about the thing that was sleeping below them, which immediately panicked the Ice King. He told Lin Hansu to wait a minute and asked him if he was tired of living. However, Lin Hansu did not hesitate. As he pushed a red button, he told the Ice King that taking everyone down with them was still better than giving up and waiting for Mo Beiki and Lu Rengia to kill them. The ground shook as Lin Hansu tossed the remote on the ground, spread his arms, and told Mo Beiki and Lu Rengia that he would give the two of them a little surprise. Mo Beiki was apprehensive as he looked at the ground and recognized the aura that he sensed. The ice on the ground broke as a gigantic paw emerged to the surface, it was a god-level demonic beast. The gigantic paw of the god-level beast touched down on the ground with its tremendous weight. Followed by its head emerging from the ground, its eyes gleamed. Its entire body had fully emerged onto the surface, it looked like a gigantic panda, and the surrounding area shook as it roared. The Ice King felt the pressure from the god-level demonic beast, and his legs went numb. However, Lin Hansu seemed calm about the situation and told him to stop thinking about it as they had to leave immediately while they still had the chance. But before they could escape, a huge wall of ice blocked their path. Mo Beiki and Lu Rengia continued to tower over them. Mo Beiki asked them how they got their hands on the god-level beast when most of them reside in places lacking human presence, while Lu Rengia knew that the Pixiu beast likes quiet and often slumbers for decades. He figured out that they probably found the location where it was sleeping and just built a base on top of it. The Ice King praised Lu Rengia for knowing quite a bit and asked him if he also knew where the Pixiu beast likes to go after it wakes up. 
Lin Hansu was the one who answered that before it sleeps again, it will ceaselessly try to find lively and crowded places, which in their case was the Tianfu base. While they were talking, the Pixiu was already running in the direction of Tianfu base, looking extremely feral. Lu Renjia started to panic when he remembered that Wang Zai was still at Tianfu base, so he realized that he had to stop the Pixiu. Even if it would just play around, he was afraid that Tianfu would still be completely destroyed. Mo Beiki recognized the girl whom Lu Renjia was talking about. But as Lu Renjia's words started to sink in, he asked him how he was planning to stop the Pixiu. Lin Hansu and the Ice King were silent for a moment, seemingly contemplating something. Then suddenly, they simultaneously launched an attack as both of them thought of the same thing. They found an opening and a good opportunity to attack. Lu Renjia was surprised by the ice shards that were coming in his direction, and he did not have time to react. The ice shards pierced his entire body, and Mo Beiki called out to him with concern. Lu Renjia was already in pain and coughing up blood but he was still thinking of Wang Zai. With his remaining energy, he told her to run. Meanwhile, at the base, people were running in all directions in a panic as the ground shook. Wang Zai was longingly looking at the monitor while her bodyguard had already brought her helmet and told her that the Urkiao district had sounded the alarm for the godly beast, Pixiu. They had to evacuate immediately. Wang Zai furrowed her eyebrows, worried about Lu Renjia. On the other hand, Mo Beiki was calling out to Lu Renjia, telling him that it was not the time to sleep. However, Lu Renjia remained unconscious and suspended mid-air, still pierced by the ice shards. His transformation had come undone. Mo Beiki tried to wake Lu Renjia up and get himself together by reminding him that he wanted to both stop the Pixu and save Sin and Pei while he was fighting against the now-transformed Ice King. The Ice King now resembled a beast, and Mo Beiki, who was now struggling to block his attack, cursed at him as he realized that the Ice King had already lost his human appearance. Suddenly, someone entered the fight, charging their gun and wanting to clarify something. It was Sin and Pei, and he fired his powerful gun between their fight, making the Ice King step away from Mo Beiki. Both of them were startled. While the Ice King recognized that it was primitive technology, Mo Beiki was concerned that Sinan was back again. Instead of answering Mo Beiki's question, Sinan continued to clarify to the Ice King that he was the actual Sinan Pei, the White Silver Escort, and he better remember that. Sinan looked worried as he told Mo Beiki that he would try to delay the enemies and requested that he take Lu Renjia away should the opportunity present itself. But to Sinan's horror, Lin Hansu quickly appeared behind him, asking him who he would be delaying and telling him that he was overestimating his strength. Lin Hansu leaned behind him and told him that they met again, addressing him as the escort who destroyed his lab in Jangwa village. Even though Sinan was still horrified, he was also annoyed by the accusation and clarified that it wasn't him either, and then blood splattered and was shed. There was suddenly a whirlwind of fire and someone was screaming. Sinan, who had closed his eyes and was prepared to receive Lin Hansu's attack, was confused that he did not feel any pain. He was then surprised to see Lin Hansu being grabbed by a golden fist formed by the whirlwind of fire. Lin Hansu felt that something was not right and looked extremely terrified as he gazed ahead and asked what kind of monster he was facing. He was looking at Lu Renjia, who emitted multiple whirlwinds of fire with different colors, which made Sinan worry. Lu Renjia's eyes were open, gleaming red, but he seemed to be unconscious and did not respond to Sinan. Suddenly, someone grabbed Sinan by the collar and told him to stop calling for Lu Renjia and run. It was Mo Beiki, who carried Sinan in his arms as they flew away from the scene. Mo Beiki informed Sinan that Lu Renjia's realm was about to be unleashed, and if they didn't run immediately, it would be too late. This confused Sinan because he had heard that Lu Renjia didn't have a realm. Mo Beiki was surprised by Sinan's reaction and anxiously explained that Lu Renjia didn't need a realm because he himself was one, and he was sealing his own strength. As Mo Beiki continued to explain that Lu Renjia's realm would now be uncontrollably released since he had lost consciousness, the Pixiu noticed Lu Renjia's arms reaching out to it. Mo Beiki further explained that Lu Renjia's realm would completely destroy everything within a few hundred miles, including himself, making it inaccessible for years to come. Right on cue, Lu Renjia's face started to twist, resembling a demon. Lu Renjia grew in size, towering over the Pixiu, which was surprised by his appearance. He was now in his true form, the real Shira. Meanwhile, Lin Hansu and the Ice King were trapped in Lu Renjia's flames, both groaning in pain. On the other hand, the Pixiu howled and was ready to fight Lu Renjia. But to its surprise, Lu Renjia effortlessly grabbed it by the back of its neck, like a puppy. The Pixiu did not dare to put up a fight against Lu Renjia and just sat on the ground, whimpering as it was dragged in the opposite direction of where it had intended to go earlier. Sinan could not believe what he was seeing and asked Mo Beiki if it was normal for Lu Renjia to resemble a demonic beast. 
Mo Bakey glanced at Sinan as he explained that demonic beasts were the result of animals mutating due to radiation before the catastrophe. The records of the aboriginals indicated that humans were also a type of animal, similar to monkeys and apes. Still carrying Sinan in his arms and witnessing the unbelievable event unfolding before them, Mo Bakey concluded that once Lu Rengia was consumed by his own power, he would become a demonic beast driven by instincts. Mo Bakey hoped that Lu Rengia would be like the Pixu, sleeping in places devoid of human presence. Then Mo Bakey remembered that he would have to report a new god-level beast's den to the Union. Sinan appeared transfixed as he stared at the scene in front of him. The giant figure, standing tall between heaven and earth, slowly dragged another godly beast, and ventured deeper into the wilderness. Sinan didn't know whether to laugh or cry at the terrifying and cunning appearance of Lu Rengia, knowing it might be the last time he saw him. Somewhere in the base, someone called out to their escort agency leader, while another person sighed and placed a lewd image of a woman on their desk. They called out to their escort agency leader again, this time emphasizing and adding Sinan's first name. Sinan, the man depicted in the lewd picture on the desk, was startled and quickly acknowledged the other person in the room, prompting a sigh from the man. The man informed Sinan that the escort agency's recruitment interview preparations outside were finished. He reminded Sinan to pull himself together, which made Sinan, now greatly aged, laugh. He apologized to the man, explaining that he was just reminiscing about the past. Then he suggested they proceed. As they walked through the hallway, the man remembered to report something about Wang Zai, but Sinan interrupted him and told him to provide whatever she needed without asking him. Sinan suddenly realized that Wang Zai must have ventured into another area with a godly beast and become trapped. He asked the man, but the man informed him that it was not the case, Wang Zai had a message for him. Sinan was surprised upon hearing that Wang Zai had a message for him. But before he could ask about it, he heard someone asking the crowd outside what they were all gathered for, and Sinan recognized the voice. One of the applicants told him that it was the Kayan Kayan Escort Agency's recruitment interview gathering. When the person asked if the gathering had to have so many people, the applicant told him that it was normal because after the fall of the Wu family, it was the only escort agency in the base that had a gold escort watching over it. The applicants gathered around the person, asking if he was also there to attend the interview. Upon seeing the person's familiar figure, Sinan quickly ran towards him, which worried his companion a bit. The person gave the applicants a thumbs up and told them that they might even become colleagues in the future. However, one of the applicants told him that it might be a bit difficult for him to enter the agency as their requirements were quite high. Sinan could not believe his eyes and thought about the countless times he had imagined what seeing Lu Rengia again would be like. As Lu Rengia was being surrounded by the applicants, smiling and proudly telling them that he was the strongest black iron, rendering most of the applicants speechless. While one of them wished he had his confidence, Sinan couldn't help but think that Lu Rengia had not changed. He was still someone who left people absolutely speechless. 